I think I have volume here. Okay, good. Okay, well, I want to welcome everyone to what is actually our seventh ENC meeting, uh, Ivan pre-ENC meeting, which I think is incredible. Um, and I want to uh, give an apology for John Webb, uh, who felt like this morning he was under the weather and uh, couldn't make it over here for the morning. Uh, but he thinks he'll probably be here for noon for the uh, Founders Award uh, presentation. Uh, so I hope he's feeling better. The, um, so welcome every, so I am going to uh, talk a little bit about what John would have said um, as well. So the first thing I wanted, well, I want to welcome everyone. We're live from Asilomar now for the second time. And uh, the first time, of course, uh, we walked around and, and took nice pictures and didn't have a, and that was the meeting we all missed at Selimar for the ENC. Um, before starting, I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, everyone knows you, you probably, but I want to introduce just, uh, we, we are, I am Dave Rice, if I haven't said my name before, and um, Dan Iverson and um, Krish Krishnamurthy, and along with John Webb, um, we got together in 2016 uh, to um, make a reality out of John's wish to have a, um, to, to found a meeting group. And- You got something. Uh, you okay? Oh, okay. And, um, and so we got started. we actually John came out to the West Coast and he invited us all to the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose in order to uh, plan things. Um, is there some okay, so the um, so anyway, um, the uh, so also I'd like to thank um, Eric, uh, who is um, who is doing all of our running our technical support, and Jake Hammond, who is helping him, and they have an incredible set. If you're online, they have an incredible setup back there to to both uh, broadcast uh, meetings, broadcast speakers from in here and from online, and uh, Shelley Hammond, who is outside right now, and. Uh, um, and for she planned all the logistics for this meeting, and so I, we really thank her for all that hard work. The um, and of course, most of all, uh, to all of you online and who have come for this meeting this morning here, uh, thank you for, because for making Ivan a a uh, successful group and with a lot of successful meetings. So. Eric, if you want to show John's slides, I will I will go through them quickly and and so if anyone doesn't know, um, John Webb um, is the founder and CEO of MR Resources, which I would describe as the premier third-party source for um, NMR parts and service and full NMR systems. Um, and the, um, whoops, I'll go back. Uh, oh yeah, right, go ahead, yes. I haven't read the slides, so. Uh, so anyway, these are some of the things that MR Resources does. Uh, they sell spectrometers, use spectrometers, uh, and lease them. Uh, they sell magnets, install magnets, and take care of magnets for people. Uh, and of course, they uh, install consoles and offer service contracts, consoles, probes, they offer service contracts, and um, I guess quenched magnet recovery. And, uh, and of course, uh, if you need to move your magnet, um, they offer uh, magnet relocation services, so. And the other venture that, um, that John is in is um, he is the uh, MR Resources or his organization is the uh, distributor for the our new NMR company Q1, which has arisen in the last few years, 
And um, Q1, of course, offers new systems and all the all the sales and support that a uh, that that the other two vendors offer um, as well. So Don Bouchard, who is here, will talk about Q1 later in the meeting. Okay, so I guess that's the slides that I'm to talk about. And so uh, some other things I'll mention, uh, come to the suite uh, here um, in the evenings um, and um, we will be having the Ivan Hours and we have a set of three speakers, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, who will be talking about different subjects. Uh, Ron Crouch, who I saw here, is, um, will talk about the stars uh, on Monday night, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and I, I'll, I'll let you look at the brochures for the rest of them. The, um, so I'll also I mentioned, uh, look forward to our uh, announcement of the winner of this year's Founders Award, and I'll keep it a secret until um, noontime for John to make the announcement. And uh, be sure to stay here for lunch. And during lunch, we will also play a video from a, uh, an individual, uh, what's his first name? I forgot his first name, but Cornbluth, uh, um, who is a world's uh, heli helium, he is a heli world international helium consultant and who finds helium for people in the, in the midst of the crisis. And so he's going to talk a bit about about the helium situation. That will be a video playing during lunchtime while we have lunch in here. And um, so, and also, um, John would have said, it will have said, and I will too, that we're always looking for new people to take up a role in Ivan and to give uh, roundtable workshops and to plan academic events that they think that people should see. And Ivan is willing to, uh, you know, to get in there and make those things happen. So, uh, and from my point of view, uh, I'd like to, I, I'd make invitations for people that are in the bio world um, and in the, uh, also in the solids world, which is becoming overlapped with the bio world, uh, to, uh, to uh, help suggest to me uh, um, possible roundtable workshops. So with, uh, so with that, uh, let's get started. And okay, Am, are we good for? Okay. So, well, I, I have to make sure that the, the slides are queued. Oh, okay, right. Okay, so may, would you like to come up here? Yes. Okay, and so, okay, great. And so once this goes, there will be, you'll just see your talk. And, and you, what? I know I will in a moment. And you, you can use a pointer there. Okay, great. Okay, so I'd like to introduce, um, turn this over so I can read his talk title. Alexander Pul, I'm sorry, Pulhazen. Yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm, and uh, he's from Stanford University recently, but from the University of Montreal, Quebec before, and, um, and uh, he is going to talk about um, bio and solids, and his talk type is in situ solid state NMR approaches to characterize algal polysaccharides. So uh, why don't you get started? Working? Okay. 
thank you for the introduction and sorry for the technical problem. So today, yes, I will talk about what I did during my PhD in Montreal, so at the University of Quebec in Montreal, under the supervision of Isabel Marcotte and Dror Rachevsky. So first, why study microalgae? Then, because they are found everywhere, they are found in fresh water, in oceans, and they have many potential aid values that we know now. But we, it's coming? Okay. You, you, yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, so, and now we also know it has many potential added values. First, you can think about nutrition, also biofuels, even now therapeutics, and they are also good candidates for bioremediation since they are able to bioaccumulate heavy metal, for example. Then for research, algae are also interesting because they are a good model for photosynthesis, for also glycoproteins, heterologous production, and also uh, they are a good model for to simulate the glycans from higher plants. Also, we have already available an important bank of mutants for algae with cell wall starch mutant I will talk about today. And for NMR, which, are, which is what I will talk about today, it's also interesting because you can label them, isotopically label them, for not that very expensive, because you don't need glucose, you need instead a sodium bicarbonate to carbon-13 label those cells. Then we study glycans of those organisms. First, because glycans are found in almost all types of organisms. They are associated with a tremendous variety of biological function. For example, you can find just pure polysaccharide, and they are usually associated with energy storage and cell architecture. You can think about starch or cellulose in plants, for example. But it can also be found decorating many other biomolecules. For example, it can be decorating lipids, giving in algae the galactolipids, or it can also be decorating proteins, giving the glycoproteins. And actually, glycosylation of protein, as you might know, is the main translational um, uh, modification happening on proteins. So it's interesting to know how glycosylation are happening on proteins, that we already know it's happening view, uh, through the O-glycosylation and N-glycosylation patterns. So to come back to how I produce my samples and how we produce label samples, in our case, it's quite simple. You just have agar plates where you have your cells. You resuspend them in a carbon-13, nitrogen-15 labeled media with sodium bicarbonate and ammonium chloride. Then you leave your cell grow for about six days, and then you reach the exponential phase. You can spin down your cells, and this is how you get your crude whole cell spin down in your tube. Then from this sample, oh, and it disappeared, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> Sorry, maybe the uh, animation did something. So from these cells, we can we can uh, just study, uh, I will talk about two different ty type of algae. First, Chlamydomonas lunati, that we can extract the starch, that will be the first part of my talk. Then I will talk about another algae that we can just study as it is, just whole cell, and I will talk about assignment and quantification of whole cell glycans. Then I will switch back to uh, an extract from Chlamydomonas renati algae, talking about the glycoproteins architecture into the cell wall of this algae. This overall to uh, hopefully um, show you that solid state NMR is a powerful tool to have more insight and very like atomic scale details of even complex biological systems. So as you know, NMR gives atomic scale information. Unfortunately, just using 1D NMR, which is possible for even unlabeled samples, doesn't give high, very high resolution and can be limited even more for solid state NMR. So we need 2D uh, experiments. So therefore, you usually need carbon-13 label, yes, but you will gain a lot in terms of resolution because you have a new axis to disperse your pick. And the experiment we use is called the inadequate experiment that you might know. And it actually allows not only to have a single quantum, single quantum coherence, but instead we have a double quantum here on the y-axis. And instead of having the, chemical sh the usual chemical shift, we have the sum of the two a correlate of the chemical shift of the two correlated carbons in this case. So it allows us for glycans to go through the what we call the spin system there of a glycan. And here you can see the numbering I use through all the presentation. So from just starting from the carbon one, we can go through all the glycan ring up to the carbon six, because there are all those carbons are all linked chemically. So this experiment is very interesting because of this chemical dispersion along the y-axis, and we get rid of the diagonal that might be uh, annoying when you are very close to chemical shifts. 
Then you can also combine that with different magnetization at the beginning, direct pulse, cross polarization, showing different types of dynamics and objects in your sample. But don't forget that, unfortunately, so far, you still need carbon-13 labeled or at least MAS-DNP that might improve a lot of sensitivity. So first, as I said, I will talk about the starch of clamidomal vascularity, which is just a way to, for me to show you how I use the inadequate experiment and this chemical shift dispersion. First, you know starch is a main energy storage for plants. It's made of glucose units. They can li be linked through two different kinds of chemical links, the alpha-1,4, that will create the long linear amylose, but you can also have a more branched structure called the amylopectin with amylo 1,6, with alpha, sorry, 1,6 uh, linkages there. From these two different components, amylose and amylopectin, you can also have a diversity of structure that can be detected directly using electron microscopy, but you will, in those cases, you will always have an interplay of amorphous and crystalline regions. And talking about those crystalline regions, there are double-stranded helices like that, and the way they will be all together will define two types of starch, called the A-type and B-type starch. And as you can see, there are just very small differences between those. We, we can expect very small differences in terms of chemical shift between those two types of starch. And indeed, we just have one difference is on the carbon-1 chemical shift, where we'll have three peaks for A-type starch and only two peaks for B-type starch as you will see just here. So in Chlamydomonas renarty, we have A-type starch. What we can do is that we can um, boil it and make it amorphous, and the way it will uh, recrystallize as it, uh, by itself will make a B-type starch called a retrograded B-type starch. And as you can see again, three peaks for carbon-1 and uh, only two peaks for, uh, for A-type and only two peaks for B-type starch. But again, 1D is insufficient in terms of resolution to assign all the peaks. So we went to the 2D inadequate experiment, and uh, the, the paper we published in 2018 uh, were the first one to report all the chemical shifts for both types of uh, starch. We also noticed the same differences as the 1D, 3 peaks for A-type starch while 2 peaks for B-type starch, but the 2D also allowed us to see another difference, this time on the carbon-5, where we just have 2 peaks for, for B-type starch and only 1 peak for A-type starch. But I don't know if you noticed there, the flashing part in green is something you know, that we're not assigned before because it's lower and it's overlapping with the carbon since carbon-5 of usual starch. But inadequate experiment allowed us to see that, okay, definitely we have a spin system there that is not assigned. And comparing it with the literature, we found out it was in non-reducing end group of the starch. As a polymer, you have an end of it, so the more ends you have, the more intense this spin system will be. So it means having an idea of this intensity will give us an idea of the chain length of the starch. So with that, we proved that, indeed, we can do that, comparing the aminopectin that is known to have short, uh, short chains but very branch, com that have th therefore a much higher signal there, comparing it to the linear amylose that is a long linear polymer but with fewer like, non-reducing end groups. And it worked with the inadequate layer. Few conclusion on the starch. Again, we assign all the carbons of both types of starch and identify the non-reducing end group. Uh, again, for we need this inadequate experiment, so usually carbon-13 labeling. And we also did some in-cell measurements, allowing us to have an idea of quantities directly in the cell of the starch and also following the type of starch directly in the cell without any modification of the sample. But as you might think, like starch is a big one, is a big carbohydrate, easy to identify and easy to see. But we have many other one glycans in the cell, because starch is just one spin system in a whole cell sample, as you can see here. So we have many other peaks. So we wanted to develop a method to have not only starch, but all the glycans directly from the cell assigned and quantified using solid state NMR and whole cell. So that's why I switched back to another algae, Paracloella bergerinki, um, that has a different cell wall, different composition, and can be known as But here is just a zoom in on the glycan region of this whole cell spectra. Using a high magnetic field, 800 megahertz, and a high efficiency probe at the National Mag Lab in Florida, we managed to assign quite a lot of different spin system in this sample using database that are already available, such as the CCMRD database and we assign 
uh, the different uh, glycans coming mostly from the cell wall, but also from uh, galactolipids coming from algae membranes. We also compared those results with uh, mass spectrometry that is able to also, again, just identify the units, but not the polysaccharide, and also quantify them. And our method has been proved to have a good match between soy state NMR and mass spectrometry, proving that, indeed, soy state NMR, if you have resol good resolution and you take care of the, your pulse sequence and relaxation, then you might have something quantitative. Um, so just a quick, so that was the methodology we proposed in our paper. And we uh, also, overall, more than a method, we, it was the first time we had a full assignment of most of the glycan of a single, of a single a unicellular cell. But something you have to uh, remind, I have to remind you, is that uh, you have to take care and to take into account the T1 relaxation that will, of course, kill your signal, but not the same way for all the glycans. So you have to take that into account using usually 1D um, experiments. Then we also, in this paper, uh, notice not only assign the glycans, but we manage with other experiments to detect the contacts between different glycans in the cell from the cell wall with the xylan, but also within the starch units, which has different spin system in it. We'll, uh, from for so this methodology, what, which is kind of long to uh, apply because you have many peaks and you have to consider many different chemical shifts, we wanted to apply to, let's say, what most people would think an easier sample, but it still reveals some complexity. So that's why we'll switch back to uh, an extract from Chlamydomonas renati, but this time the cell wall of this algae. So the cell wall of Chlamydomonas renati is, very n is already quite well known and has uh, already reported many different layers, about six layers that are can of, uh, have also that kind of vesicle granule things in it. But uh, already reported protocols managed to have uh, part of the cell wall extracted using uh, KUTROP agent. In our case, it's sodium perchlorate. And we can simply reconstitute this cell wall using dialysis, leaving the cell not destroyed, but intact with just few layers of the cell wall left, which are known to be the non KUTROP agent soluble. But using solid state NMR, what you can do is you can actually study both of all the, of those samples and make the same of the part and just study one of them. But today I would just focus on the cell wall of cell wall extract of, of this uh, algae, which is known to be made of glycoproteins. The cell wall of Chlamydomonas renati is really acting like a shell when we do whole cell experiments. Indeed, the cell can survive more than 24 hours in our solid state NMR rotors spinning at 15 kilohertz without much of temperature control. So those are really survivors compared to like mammalian cells and that kind of thing because of their cell wall. So it has some mechanical properties interesting to understand and to study. This cell wall is a non-cellulosic cell wall compared to higher plants. Instead, it's made of glycoproteins. The main components that are reported are called the hydroxyproline rich glycoproteins that are very large proteins. And they've been reported to be rich in arabinose and galactose units in terms of glycan de decoration. So that's what we have in our when we did our sample extraction compared to like previous literature. But we also found out that in our extract, because we did less, let's say, purification of just the big proteins, we also found out we had much uh, a lot of smaller proteins. You have even other ones, uh, smaller molecular weight there. And those were actually rich in mannose units, which were unexpected and re unreported before. But still, we went uh, further and study them against using the same methodology, the inadequate experiment, allowing assignment and quantification of not only glycan but also amino acids. I will also show to you other methods we use uh, based on dipolar contacts between carbons and uh, what is called the PDSD, as, as you might know, experiment, where you, you see the contacts between carbons, but we'll more focus on the transfer efficiency and decay of this type of experiment. Then I will also show you difference of hydration that can be probed using solid set NMR experiment. And finally, I will take uh, advantages of the MASDNP I sensitivity to detect the contact between amino acids and glycans. And this, at the end, of this part will lead to a model of the cell wall of this algae. So first, as before, inadequate experiment, a zoom in on the glycan region. We can assign quite a lot of different glycans, having good, good agreement between the mass spectrometry and soy set NMR quantification. 
But as you might know, since I said it was glycoproteins, we don't have only glycans, we have also amino acids. So we apply exactly the same kind of approach on this in same inadequate experiment, assigning quite a lot of different amino acids. Sorry, it's a bit small, but the idea is that we have many peaks. It takes months. I, I had months during my PhD. So I, I did that, assign, quantify, and again, good agreement between soy state uh, NMR and mass spectrometry. And what uh, soy state NMR can bring is that we are, we are in native samples, so we can even have an idea of the secondary structure of our proteins, for example. So overall, it's about more than 500 peaks, uh, unique peaks assigned for about 30 different glycans and 80 uh, amino acids, different like conformation of amino acid units. So this is the first update of our model. Before we knew the HRGPs, but now in our current model, we know there are also lower molecular weight proteins rich in mannose. New update in terms of dynamic for this model is that first we measure the usual T1 relaxation of carbon-13, showing something very homogeneous. So that what we can say is overall our cell wall is quite dynamic at the nanosecond time scale. But we also use another experiment called the, the well-known cross-polarization that can probe different types of relaxation and build up. And comparing the carbohydrates with the amino acid signal, we proved that carbohydrates have a faster transfer efficiency, but more importantly, have a slower decay. Proving that compared to amino acids, glycans are more rigid, but on the millisecond time scale. So this is a new update showing that in our model, in our system, we have rigid glycans to compare to more dynamic amino acids. Then something else we can probe using soy state and MR. And something that is maybe a bit more unusual is to probe the hydration levels in our sample. Indeed, when we study the cell wall, we don't just put the powder, we hydrate this powder before putting it in our rotor. And we can use first the usual DAR experiment where you see dipolar connection between different carbons as a single quantum, single quantum coherence here. But what we can do before that, we can add a block to filter to T2 fill using the T2 relaxation of protons we can just have the proton from water being excited. So therefore, we will just have water exciting the carbons surrounding, uh, surrounding it before detecting it. And this is the resulting spectra we get here. And as you can see, most of the glycan, they survived this kind of filter, but all of the amino acid, they kind of disappeared, showing that indeed we have different discrepancies between amino acid and uh, glycans in terms of hydration. But more than the spectra, we can have some quantification using them and having this kind of bar diagram showing that indeed amino acids are less hydrated than glycans. But we also prove that here, for example, you can see here, it's the hydroxyproline peaks and proving that glycosylated amino acids have an intermediate behavior between the two, which is a new update again of our model, having the more hydrated glycans compared to the less hydrated amino acids and the glycosylated amino acids having an intermediate behavior in terms of hydration. Then we wanted to detect. Uh, first, I wanted, uh, we noticed that using the inadequate experiment where the hydroxyproline were expected, we didn't detect much of them. Even if you we were at low abundance, we are surprising by the low abundance like on, on the actual spectra. And we noticed that it might be some dynamics issue so that's why we used we, we take the uh, advantages of the low temperature of MASDNP without the sensitivity enhancement. So uh, with the microwave turned off, we so just low temperature, 100 Kelvin. We notice that indeed we lose in terms of resolution. Yes, but hydroxyproline are back. Just a quick note to show that uh, inadequate some dynamics can be. Um, a problem for, uh, for inadequate experiment and hydroxyproline seems to be in the range of those dynamics that are hard to detect for inadequate experiment. But what was the main idea here is to use MASDNP, which is a way to improve a lot our signal. In, and just very briefly how it works is that you have in your sample radicals, which mean unpaired electron that you can excite using not radio frequencies but microwave. And then you can transfer this, this huge magnetization from proton then to carbon. Overall, in our case and in most sample, you can have a signal enhancement of more than about like 50 times signal enhancements, meaning that even unlabeled samples can be pro with this kind of approach, even if you lose in terms of, um, of resolution because of the low temperatures. But 
Still, we managed to detect, finally detect, contacts between amino acid and glycans, and specific contacts between amino acid and glycans, showing that hydroxyproline were more prone to have contacts with, uh, oh, actually it should be written, arabinose and galactose, and even mannose, because there are so much of them. But we also proved some contacts between uh, different glycans, too, in our model. Uh, so this was again a new update on of, of our model with different contacts between amino acid and glycans. Some conclusion on this model is that overall the cell wall, uh, so we managed to have an assignment and quantification of both amino acid and glycans. We proved that overall the cell wall is quite dynamic and hydrated. We also detected uh, the uh, HR, the HRGP that were already reported, but we also detected other small proteins that are much more abundant in this sample and that are rich in mannose components. Even if it's overall very dynamic and hydrated, we still managed to see some differences between the two species, proving that glycans were much more mobile compared to amino acid parts. And we also proved that the glycan region were much more hydrated compared to the amino acids. We also detected using the eye sensitivity MASDNP experiment glycan-glycan contacts, but more importantly, some glycan amino acid um, contacts that are from intramolecular but also intermolecular contacts. Overall conclusion of this uh, presentation is that I hope I, I, I showed to you that bio solid state NMR is something that is possible. You need for like, let's say, fancy experiment, you need a uh, carbon-13 label, but even non-label samples can be studied. F using whole cell, we can already have some information, so no need to any extraction, it's a native cells. You can just run and have an idea of the bigger object in your sample. Then we also, I also proved that some extracts are interesting to study and possible to study using solid state NMR. And I talked just to this morning about uh, starch and cell wall. And overall, it just led to a better understanding of the composition of, of ar an architecture of mycology components. Just a few ideas for the perspective of our current work. We would like, we are currently studying and have better idea of other parts of the cell. For example, lipid droplets that can be studied by NMR, yes, but usually also more by confocal imaging. We have also the idea to use those organisms to probe the bioremediation uh, capacities of those organisms by following where, for example, heavy metals are going to the cell, and we might use the paramagnetic effect um, uh, or properties of those elements because it would just turn off some signal from the cell. So now we've assigned quite a lot of molecules. We can uh, compare different samples and have an idea of what signal decrease and then come back to what was actually affected and where the heavy metals bioaccumulate. Overall, we can have an idea of all the stresses. Now we have assigned quite a lot of different molecules in the cell. So for example, again, heavy metals, but also temperature, pH, that are important parameters to take into account now for ocean and global warming conditions. And we also can uh, probe and easy uh, and, and follow what are the effects of bioengineering. For instance, you can design cells to make more lipids for biofuels. So we can just spin down the cells and follow the lipids contents directly and just live kind of thing. So as I said, other parts are also explored with the lipids or for instance the flagella that are interesting for other karyotic cell uh, systems. So with that I would like to thank my, uh, my uh, the people from the UQAM University, like Professor Isabel Marcotte and Ron Warszawski, my co-supervisor, but also Alexander Arnold, our NMR manager that they, all, all three of them, they did a lot to help me during my PhD and all the work I just presented today. And I also did a six months internship with uh, Professor Tuo Wang that is now not anymore in, at the LSU, but now in Michigan State University, where I did and I, I've been in collaboration also with the National Mag Lab. So with, that's where I did the wholesale experiment kind of thing and the assignment. So I also thank people at, at the National Mag Lab, Ivan Hung, for the, for the high Highfield and Frederick uh, Mentik Vigier for the MMAS DNP. And I also thank now Professor uh, Segelski, where I'm doing my postdoc just now. I just arrived a few months ago. But hopefully, next year I will present stuff from Stanford. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. <laughs> and if you have questions. 
So thank you uh, for a great talk. Are there uh, questions? Ron? Great. Listen, the uh, inadequates were very, very interesting. I was curious if you see strong coupling effects in the in the inadequate in the solid state from two close carbons. If mm -hmm. you should, have you observed that? Well, so when oh my my presentation disappeared. Uh, if it's possible to switch back to my slide, <laughs> <laughs> I let you uh, lose control of the computer. So uh, actually, what we noticed it's a very interesting question. So we we noticed that. Um, I don't touch anything. Um, so we noticed that indeed using high resolution, we noticed a splitting of, on the carbon because of the surrounding carbons. And we were not sure, thank you. And so we were not sure actually where it came from. Our hypothesis is that it was J coupling coming, the splitting was coming from the J coupling. So it's from the whole cell experiment. So we need high resolution to see this coupling. You see yeah. on the start resolution is not sufficient. It was a 400 megahertz. Or even maybe 600, this one. But here, using the high efficiency probe, we notice that yeah, here, you see almost all the peaks are kind of split it. And our hypothesis, the, so yes, to answer your question, yes, we saw that. And our hypothesis was that it's coming from the J coupling, but it was much higher compared to what is observed in solution in MR. Mm -hmm. But J coupling should be the same between two linked carbons. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was surprised. So we were, instead of having 40 hertz, we are up to like 60, 70 hertz splitting, mm -hmm. which was quite surprising. But that's what we did in, that's what we said in our papers that it's probably coming from the J coupling that can be detected. Yeah, in the inadequate, uh, at Bax published back in, good heavens, maybe 1981, um, there was a suggestion that you could use 3 over 4J optimization instead of 1 over 4J optimization, and the strong coupling stuff becomes much more intense. Ah, okay, we did that. Was that was it, it. Very, very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Another question? Oh, go ahead. Very nice talk. Thank you. Um, when you were measuring chain lengths of your oligosaccharides, where, did you do that from your 1D or from your 2D? 2D cross peak intensities. You, you can actually, we did both and it gives a similar results. So we can use, since we have, but it's just using 1D, it's just a very small shoulder on, on this part of the spectra. So you will need like high resolution to be, to know exactly what you have. But using this inadequate experiment, we can, we didn't have any standard to have an idea of how precise we were, but we can just have, maybe just take this peak that is very alone and integrate it and compare it with this one, which is also very separated from the other one. And using this 2D, that's how we had an idea of how many times longer this chain was compared to the other one. But we didn't say it was like 50 units because we had no standard. Yep. But they are probably available. But for those kind of long objects, we can expect that this process quantification might not work perfectly, but it gives you an idea of, of this length of, of your polymer. Great. Thank you. More questions? So I have a question. Could you, uh, the DNP setup that you used, uh, could you describe that in more detail? Yeah, sure. So that's the uh, setup they have at the MagLab okay. uh, lab. And so it's, I, I didn't want to go into much detail to like uh, make it not too long because it's a, like it's a, it's a, it's a morning, yeah. a morning, so uh, yeah. just after that. Okay. So just briefly that it's, um, you, you will need a gyrotron to add to right. your usual NMR to like right. mm -hmm. um, be able to like create or to, um, yeah, to make your, like your microwave. You yeah. Then on their set setup, they have a semi-optic uh, uh, semi bench. Okay. So they, they can kind of filter the, what the, the microwave gyrotron is making. Then you have a waveguide. So then you can just irradiate your sample with those microwave mm -hmm. and in your sample which is in a sapphire rotor to be microwave transparent you can also use diamond if you're like very fancy but sapphire is already expensive and works yeah. and even the zir zirconia works 
if seen work. So anyway, so you have your radical in your sample mixed with your molecules. You have some cryoprotectant because MASDNP needs very low temperature, 100 mm -hmm. Kelvin, so everything is frozen. But you, we don't want ice crystals, so we put glycerol, glycerol. You can even do wholesale, and they might survive to it because you have cryoprotectant. So you have your radicals, so microwave, you will just have your, um, you will just excite your electron, your unpaired electron from this radical, and then you can transfer it to proton. Like that's mm -hmm. a huge magnetization, then you transfer yes. it. And you have different, I know this here, uh, I, I have rough idea of the theory of it, but I know it's very complex. Yeah. And you have different effects that can transfer it. Right. And I know in our case, the, ma the main effect is the cross effect that mm -hmm. can transfer this magnetization from the radical to the, to the proton. And then is the usual experiment you can have, like proton to carbon and then coherence between different carbons. Okay. And, and you get 50 times? Yeah. That's yeah, that's, that's for real. Quite so amazing. You yeah, so you yeah, can for just these have kinds of experiments. Yeah, yes. and even with n in theory, you can go up to like what's the theory of it? It's like is it 200 or even more than that? But mm -hmm. in like with actual sample, it's never like that. But with new design of radicals that Frederic Mantic Vigier is also working on, we had even like 60 times enhancement on wholesale and extracted sample. So it's uh, uh, okay life changing for people that can't label their their sample. Right. Okay. So any more questions? If, if not, uh, l let's move on to our next segment here. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you. So uh, shall I go right on? OK, so there are so we're, uh, so we're now going to be giving out our first prize of the morning. And that will be done through a lottery in which uh, everyone here and online is, is represented in the pool. And Dan is going, as last year, Dan is going to choose the, uh, the, the, the winner with, with a fancy program run from VNMRJ. And so uh, the pri I didn't mention the prize is a $50 uh, gift card. So Dan, take it away. Here we go. Uh, and the winner has to be present, but there it is. Oh, here. There we go. <laughs> yeah, da 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 da. Mm -hmm. Yeah. William Hiscox, are you out there? To speak up from Zoom if you're out there. Okay. Uh oh, uh oh, going to get coffee. <laughs> He'll miss the prize. <laughs> okay, how are we doing there for time? He's over. Okay. Try again. Try again. Dada. Hey. <laughs> Congratulations, George. <laughs> Do you have the camera on him? Or uh, yeah, that's all right. That's too complicated. <laughs> so, Shelly, our prize giver, is uh, is okay. Great. So while that's going on, I'll move on to the next speaker. And our next speaker comes from online and is a good friend of mine at UC Merced, um, Andy Lee Wang. And I uh, let's see. And so I'd like to introduce him, and uh, he, uh, his, I actually take care of his 600 as part of our NMR facility. The, um, okay, so his talk is using protein NMR to study a circadian clock. And, Hello. And yeah, hi, my name is Andy Lee Wong. Thank you for inviting me, Dave, and thank to you, thanks to Eric as well. Um, 
It's great to be here. Uh, I'm a, a biochemist at the University of California, Merced, and Dave and I have been working together for many years, um, and, and it's great to have him as a colleague. Um, should I put up my talk, share screen? Okay. Um, and then, here we go. Can everyone see this? Yes. Great. Okay. So this is an aerial photo of UC Merced, um, and we're close to Yosemite National Park. So we're up against the uh, Sierra Nevada foothills. So, so if you love to hike and camp, um, this is a great place. And we're about two hours away from Asilomar. I wish I could be there in person, but yesterday I just flew in from another conference. Um, so it's been a little hectic. Um, so thank you for letting me present remotely. The, the last talk was really, really cool. Um, okay, so we use um, NMR to study a circadian clock, and um, like, why would we want to do that? Well, it turns out that circadian clocks uh, drive um, metabolic rhythms in anticipation of uh, day and night. So that's really the importance of the circadian clock is that, um, you know, uh, most life forms have evolved under the rising and setting of the sun, and so that due to the dramatic differences between day and night, um, it's not surprising that organisms have adapted to that by evolving these clocks in anticipation of sunrise and sunset. And you find circadian clocks in mammals, plants, fungi, insects, in, and bacteria. Just so it's a, it's a fundamental biological system. In fact, in 2017, uh, the Nobel Prize was, was awarded to these uh, scientists for their pioneering work on the genetics of the circadian clock of the fruit fly. Even, even Charles Darwin um, was fascinated by the circadian uh, movements of the leaves and plants. And so you can download his book online. It's, I think it's free. And uh, he has numerous drawings in there of plants during the daytime when the leaves are up and out trying to collect all the photons from the sun and then at night when they droop. Um, now, my lab, in trying to understand the mechanism of circadian clocks, really uh, decided to choose the clock of cyanobacteria because they have the simplest known clock. Um, and uh, just to show you a little video of the circadian rhythms in cyanobacteria, and this video is taken by my collaborator, Susan Golden at UC San Diego, um, she streaked out cyanobacteria in a moon shape on a plate and then also in a, in a sun shape. And then she synchronized them uh, 12 hours apart. And these bacteria have been genetically altered so that one of the clock control gene promoters, one of the clock control promoters drives expression of luciferase. And so you will, so, so you can um, record the bioluminescence from these cells. So let's just watch. And so um, these little guys have a circadian clock and as you know, bacterial uh, systems are usually much um, uh, simpler than um, eukaryotic systems. That's why our standard undergraduate biochemistry textbooks, a lot of the information in there um, were derived from studies on bacteria. In uh, 1998, um, the, the, these three scientists um, discovered the three core clock genes of cyanobacteria, and they're called Chi A, Chi B, and Chi C. So this was a big breakthrough because um, now that the genes were discovered, people could clone the, these genes and then express them recombinantly in E. coli and then study the biochemistry of these uh, proteins. And this is approximately when I joined the field as an assistant professor. Then in 2005, um, Taco Kondo's lab made an even, well, it also made a huge breakthrough, which is that um, 
they discovered that if you mix recombinant forms of Chi-A, Chi-B, and Chi-C together in a test tube with some ATP, that just these three proteins will set up an autonomous um, macroscopic um, rhythm of Chi-C phosphorylation and dephosphorylation as seen as this gel. Um, and uh, and this, this, this phosphorylation pattern of Chi-C um, is, recapitulates the phosphorylation rhythm of Chi-C found in live cyanobacteria. So then what, what this showed was that now we could study this clock in vitro using biochemical techniques, biophysical techniques under highly defined conditions. And as you know, you know, trying to study the mechanism of anything, any protein or protein system in live cells uh, presents several daunting challenges. So this breakthrough was, was, was big for biochemists. Now, in, around the same time as Kondo's um, discovery, uh, the, the clock proteins were all crystallized. So Chi-A crystallizes as a domain-swapped homodimer, Chi-B crystallizes as a homotetramer, and Chi-C crystallizes as a homohexamer. Um, and this here, the C1 and C2 here, that's one uh, subunit of Chi-C. The C1 is the N-terminal uh, domain, the C2 is the C-terminal domain, and you can see they're connected by this green linker. And the C2 domain self-associate to form a ring, the C1 domain self-associate to form a ring, and um, you can see these ATP molecules colored in red bound at the interfaces between the subunits. And Chi-C autophosphorylates and autodephosphorylates at these two residues colored in cyan, and one of them is a serine residue, and one of them is a threonine residue, and we'll talk more about them uh, uh, coming up. And these purple things that are tucked into this pore on the top of the C2 ring, these are called A-loops. Um, and, and then there's a C-terminal extensions that come off of the, these A-loops, but you can't see them. They're not resolved in the crystal structure. Um, a former student of mine um, uh, found a convenient way to watch the clock function. And what Joel Heisler did, my former student, is he, he tagged Chi B with a fluorophore. And instead of taking time points by hand and then running them on a gel like Taco Kondo did, which is extremely laborious, especially, you know, you have to stay up like three or four nights straight to take those time points. Now with the fluorescent um, probe, uh, we could just watch the uh, oscillation in, a, in real time in a plate reader. And you can see this thing just keeps running and running. Um, and at some point, we just stop the measurements. But I, I, I still kind of regret we didn't let it keep running because I would like to see how long this thing would go. Um, and remember, this is, this is, this is just uh, three proteins in a, in a, in a you know, aqueous uh, solution with some ATP. Okay, so um, in the early days, uh, we really want to know, you know, since there's these three proteins, Chi A, Chi B, and Chi C, this is um, in the early days. We want to know, like, what does Chi A do in terms of um, uh, Chi C autophosphorylation and autodephosphorylation, and what does Chi B do? So, Young and Kim, a former student of mine, what he did was he looked at Chi C phosphorylation, shown here on the y-axis, uh, uh, over time, and if he looked at Chi C by itself or with just Chi B. He found that Chi-C, you know, just kind of um, stays at this hypo uh, phosphorylation level. So not, not, not very much phosphorylated. But if he mixes Chi-A with Chi-C, what he found is that Chi-C starts to autophosphorylate and, and then it reaches this hyper level of phosphorylation. This gel is just from Taco Kondo's paper showing you that Chi-C autophosphorylates and autodephosphorylates with a circadian rhythm when all three proteins are together. Okay, now when young Ick um, then mixed um, Chi-B in with the Chi-A, Chi-C mixture, initially he sees that, as shown in these pink squares, he sees that the trajectory of Chi-C phosphorylation um, matches that trajectory when it's just Chi-C and Chi-A. But then at some point around midday, um, the trajectories diverge, and the and the sample with Chi B in it, uh, you can see that Chi C starts to auto dephosphorylate, and um, so so this shows that Chi B inhibits Chi A 
its ability to stimulate Chi-C. But of course, at this point in time, we didn't know how. So we really want to know how does Chi-A stimulate autophosphorylation of Chi-C? How does Chi-B block Chi-A? And why does Chi-B wait until, you know, around midday here? Um, so uh, young Ick, uh, first wanted to know how does Chi A stimulate Chi C autophosphorylation, and so we solved a, an NMR structure of Chi A bound to a peptide that represented the A loops of Chi C and the C terminal extension shown here in gold that's not resolved in the crystal structure. And when he compared the NMR structure here with the position of the A loops here, he realized that the A loops would have to come out of this pore, have to come out in order for Chi to bind uh, the A loops. And so what he did was he did a series of biochemical experiments um, where he destabilized the A loops um, so that in, the, in, this, in, in this position so that they would have to come out or want to come out. And he noticed that those mutants of Chi C autophosphorylated even in the absence of Chi A. And then when he deleted the A loops, when he just deleted them completely to mimic their exposed state, he found that Chi C was hyperphosphorylated even in the absence of Chi A. So then what he realized is that the, when the A loops are exposed, Chi C autophosphorylates. When these A loops are buried, like shown in the crystal structure, Chi C auto dephosphorylates. So these A loops are really a switch that turn Chi C on and off between uh, autophosphorylation and auto dephosphorylation. So Chi A works by stabilizing the exposed position of these A loops. And because this is an NMR talk, and I haven't mentioned NMR yet, um, th uh, uh, this structure here was uh, solved by NMR. All right, so um, around 2011, this model of the clock came out. And um, so here is a cartoon of Chi C. Here's the C2 ring up here. Here's the C1 ring down here. The A loops are shown as these little strands. And this is in the morning. And in the morning, Chi C is not phosphorylated. And the two residues I showed you earlier that get phosphorylated and dephosphorylated that reside in these subunits of the C2 ring, um, the serine and threonine shown here, uh, they're not phosphorylated. But Chi A, as you now know, binds to those A loops in the C terminal extensions and stabilizes those. Oh, oh. Okay. I hear an echo. Okay, all fixed. All right. So, um, so this is in the morning, the unphosphorylated Chi, chi C state. Um, and in the presence of Chi A, Chi binds to those A loops and C terminal extensions, stabilizing them in an exposed state. So then Chi C starts to autophosphorylate. And um, other labs found out that the first residues to autophosphorylate are the threonine residues in the C2 ring. The, so each of, the, each of these subunits, each of these domains in the C2, the C2 domains has a threonine residue that autophosphorylates. And here you see Chi B, and it's drawn as a homo uh, a tetramer, and it's just sitting out you know, in solution, not doing anything. And this happens right now is about midday. And then under continued stimulation of Chi A, binding to those A loops, then the second residue to autophosphorylate is the serine. Once the serine residue autophosphorylates, people discovered that that's when Chi B binds to Chi C. And here it's showing that Chi B is binding um, to the C2 ring near the sites of phosphorylation, and that somehow inhibits Chi A. This happens in the evening. So now the sun is setting, uh, and now we're gonna about now we're gonna enter nighttime. So now with Chi B inhibiting Chi A, Chi C starts to auto dephosphorylate, and it, and this auto dephosphorylates first on the threonine residue. And you can see that Chi B is drawn here, somehow inhibiting Chi A. And so with Chi A unable to stimulate Chi C autophosphorylation, Chi C continues to auto dephosphorylate throughout the night until it completely auto dephosphorylates by morning. And once the serine, once the serine auto dephosphorylates, Chi B can no longer bind. So Chi B falls off and it releases Chi A. 
so that Chi A can start a brand new cycle of Chi C autophosphorylation. So this this was the understanding in 2011, and people thought pretty much that the circadian clock of cyanobacteria was figured out. Um, but some questions still remained was, um, for example, what regulates the Chi BC interaction? You know, why does Chi B interact with Chi C only when the serine is phosphorylated? That was unknown. And then what is the role of the C1 ring? And you can see the C1 ring is sitting in each of these little panels and it's not doing anything apparently. All the action is happening on the C2 ring. Chi B binds to the C2 ring and then Chi A is inhibited by Chi B on the C2 ring. Um, so we want to look into that a little more. So there's, there's NMR coming up. Uh, don't, don't get too worried. Uh, this is important though for laying the groundwork. So, uh, so, so Yong Gong Chang, um, former postdoc in my lab, wanted to understand, you know, what does phosphorylation really do to chi -C? So he looked at isolated C2 domains of chi -C and just ran it on a size exclusion column. And he found that it mostly, and this is fully dephosphorylated C2, and he found that um, it mostly comes off the column as a monomer, but it's a little bit comes off as a hexamer. This is the morning state of chi -C. Then he wanted to use NMR to look at the full chi -C, which is 360 kilodaltons. Um, so you know, he methylated everything. Um, it's quite expensive. You have to feed your E. coli deuterated glucose, grow them in D2O, and then feed it back um, uh, precursors of the uh, amino acids uh, with methyl groups. In this case, uh, we're, we're labeling one of the methyl groups, the physelucine, and he's, look, he, he's looking at signals coming exclusively from the C2 ring. And here you see very weak signals coming from the C2 ring. And, you know, that's kind of suggests that, well, maybe, maybe the C2 ring, it has these uh, uh, intermediate timescale motions that might uh, reflect the breathing of the C2 ring. And that, that sort of makes sense because you can see that isolated C2 domains do not form stable hexamers. So this suggests that the C2 ring isn't really very stable as a hexamer, perhaps even in the context of full length chi C. Then he looked at the midday state of chi C. So um, the midday state of chi C is when the threonine is phosphorylated. Now, to mimic threonine phosphorylation, he used a glutamate substitution. And here he sees that um, by size exclusion chromatography, isolated C2 domains run exclusively as monomers. So it seems like phosphorylation of the threonine destabilizes the, the, the C2 ring. And by NMR of full length chi C, you can see the signals coming from the C2 ring are, are also just like before, very weak. And then he started to look, he wanted to look at the evening state of chi -C. This is when the three, uh, sorry, this is when the serine gets phosphorylated. And remember, when the serine gets phosphorylated, chi B will bind to chi C. So when he looked at um, the doubly phosphorylated state, and he used a double glutamate substitution to mimic phosphorylation of the serine in the three, he now saw that isolated C2 domains now runs significantly more you know, as before, relative to the previous phosphorylation states, more as a hexamer. And then uh, looking at the NMR signals from the C2 ring of chi C, he sees now nice tight signals coming off the C2 ring. And that suggested that, you know, the C2 ring is tight or tighter than before. And then he looked at the late night state of chi -C. the late night state is when it's just a serine is phosphorylated because the threonine has dephosphorylated already. And so if he looks at where just a serine is phosphorylated, so this is deep, deep into the night, you can see that now the C2 ring is tight. It's running mostly as a hexamer, very little as a monomer. And then um, in the context of full length chi -C, you can see that the C2 ring has these night tight signals. And um, when the C2 ring is tight like this, if you look at the A loops, the A loops are forming these um, hydrogen bond electrostatic network, which helps stabilize them inside the ring. And this makes it harder for Chi A to grab to those A loops because those A loops have to come out for Chi A to grab them. And so when the ring is tight, um, Chi A really 
can't stimulate casein autophosphorylate as well as when the ring is loose, which is when the threonine is phosphorylated. So you can see that the threonine, when it's phosphorylated, provides positive feedback to the phosphorylation of CHI-C by CHI-A. And then when the serine is phosphorylated, it provides negative feedback um, to the clock mechanism. So I, I, because this is an NMR talk, this act, I'll just say that this explains why the this uh, phosphorylation order is in this direction and not in the opposite direction. So this is the clockwise phosphorylation direction. The anti-clockwise or counterclockwise direction would be having the serine phosphorylate first and the threonine phosphorylate second. And if you think about it, you can actually, just from this data, you can sort of explain why the clock phosphorylates this way instead of the opposite way. All right. Um, now let's move on to trying to understand how does chi B inhibit um, chi A. So remember, chi B inhibits chi A around midday. And so Yong Gang looked back at the literature, and he's there's this low res electron mic microscopy experiment where people looked at the um, chi C by itself and then with chi B. When they added chi B, they saw some extra density up here. And they said, oh, okay, so this must be where uh, Kai B binds on the C2 ring. Well, Yong Gang was looking at this data. He didn't quite believe that the authors understood um, uh, unambiguously which ring was which. So he sliced Kai C in half and then looked to see um, which of those rings Kai B bound to. So he added Kai B to just a C2 ring and he added Kai B to just a C1 ring. And what he found was that Kai B binds only to the C1 domains or ring and not the C2. So here you see um, just a simple HSQC of N15 labeled Kai B plus minus the C1 um, domains of Kai C. And you, he saw this massive change in the uh, HSQC, which is not what you normally see when you add a binding partner. Um, you usually just see a handful of peaks move, and those are usually near the binding interface. But here, ev almost every peak has shifted. Um, we didn't understand the significance of this until a little bit later. But when he repeated this with adding C2, he didn't see any change in the C2. Uh, I, I mean, he didn't see any change in the Chi B spectrum. So what this showed, which is in contrast to what people thought, is that Chi B actually binds to C1. It does not bind to C2 as shown in the um, review article. And so this was quite controversial, which made life in the lab quite exciting. Um, and then what Yong Gang discovered is that the crystal structure of Kai B, it's, this is not the structure that binds to the C1 domain. Um, so instead, he found that Kai B actually has to do something quite rare. It has to switch folds. And you can see that if you just, this is, this is color coded. So you can see like, for instance, these two helices become these two beta strands and this red beta strand becomes this red helix. So you're talking a massive change in folds and it's this fold that binds to C1. This fold, however, is very unstable. And if you try to crystallize Chi B, it always crystallizes in this fold, not this fold. And this is why this being published in 2004, 2005, uh, and this we published in uh, 2015. Um, and it's because of this difference in stability that is why Chi B binds so slowly to Chi C. So Gary Chow, uh, former uh, graduate student in a collaborating lab, um, here he's doing a gel mobility shift assay where you can see that Chi C uh, in the presence of Chi B slowly forms a Chi B C complex on the time scale of hours, and it's because you know it, the the this this state of Chi B, um, this homotetramer state. Um, which does not bind chi C is so much more stable than the state of chi C that does bind. Um, now, now the next question was, well, because chi B binds to the C1 ring, so chi B binds to the C1 ring of chi C, okay? Um, but remember, it's the phosphorylation of the serine residue up here in the C2 ring that allows Chi B to bind. So somehow there has to be a communication from all the way up here when the serine phosphorylates to all the way down here that allows Chi B to bind. So that's um, the question that Yong Gang wanted to ask next. And so, um, so 
he 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 again back to NMR. He looks at the um, NMR signals coming from the C1 ring, isolated C1 ring, and you know he. he so we're just going to follow these two um, peaks. The dashed lines are just for visual um, convenience. And so what he did next was he then looked at these two phosphostates of the full KIC, one where uh, KIC is fully dephosphorylated, one where the threonine is just phosphorylated. Of course, this is just a glutamate substitution. And he noticed that the signals coming from the C1 ring here match pretty much the signals from the isolated C1 ring. And so this, is, this, this state of KIC here is the morning state, this is the midday state, and now let's look at the evening and, and, and nighttime states where the serine is phosphorylated. Okay, so in both these states, the serine is phosphorylated, and you can see that now these peaks that we've, we've been keeping an eye on have jumped across those dashed lines. And so if you compare all of this, it suggests that when the serine is not phosphorylated, the two rings are not really communicating because the C1 ring signals look pretty much as they do when there is no C2 ring. But when the serine is phosphorylated, it seems like the rings are communicating. And so we say that we said, okay, well, well, let's call this state where the serine is not phosphorylated, the unstacked rings state. And when the serine is phosphorylated, this is the stacked state. And we can actually detect by gel filtration chromatography and interaction between these two rings when the serine is phosphorylated versus when it's not phosphorylated. And so basically the stacking interaction happens when the C2 ring is tight, because remember when the serine is phosphorylated, the C2 ring gets tight and it's a, that when it tightens that these two rings can interact. And so it's this, so this interaction, the next question is, is this interaction responsible for Chi B to bind? So here, Yong Gang is looking at, now he's looking at signals coming from Chi B, NMR signals, and here's Chi B by itself. If he adds just the isolated C2 ring, this is a tight C2 ring, so the serine is phosphorylated or substituted with a glutamate residue. You see that the spectrum of Chi B looks the same. We already know that Chi B doesn't bind to C2. If he adds just the C1 ring, he sees a little change, okay? But when he adds, the isolated C2 ring that is tight with an isolated C1 ring, you can see now the spectrum changes dramatically, which indicates that Chi B is indeed binding. Um, and we already know that Chi B binds to C1. And then uh, when he uses full length Chi C with this tight C2 ring, he sees that, that, that the spectrum of Chi B pretty much looks like this one where he added the two rings in trans. So yes, Yes, this ring stacking interaction is indeed what allows Chi B to bind because this stacking interaction somehow changes Chi, the C1 ring that allows Chi B to bind. And so um, we want to see if we could, uh, uh, you, you know, mix. Did you try again? We want to see if we could mix um, Chi A, Chi B, and Chi C together and then watch by NMR the clock oscillate. And so here, you're looking at uh, the functioning clock in an NMR tube, 600 megahertz here at UC Merced. Um, and yeah, we can watch this clock oscillate. And, and um, in fact, you can even use two-dimensional NMR um, and watch Chi B. This is labeled Chi B, and you're watching Chi B um, over several days, uh, basically binding un and unbinding Chi C. Uh, so when you see the signals from Chi B, uh, it's free Chi B. When you see the signals disappear, that's when Chi B is binding to Chi C. All right. And so um, we want to look at the, the rate of ATP consumption by, uh, Sorry, let me take sure off my watch here. Um, okay, so we want to kind of get an idea about the rate of ATP consumption by the Chi ABC clock using NMR. So here, you're looking at the ATP signal, um, and this is a mixture of Chi A, Chi B, and Chi C. So the clock is oscillating in the NMR tube. And you can see over time, the ATP signal goes down, the ADP signal goes up. So this is zero hours, 57 hours, 115 hours. And if you now map out the um, ATP, okay, amount of ATP, over time, you can see it de decreases and the amount of ADP increases, but you can also see that like there's an oscillation of the ATP signal and an oscillation of the ADP signal. And so we can actually get at the um, rate of ATP consumption over time. And you can see that there's this oscillation. 
And so the rate of ATP consumption is most um, active in the day and it's least active at night. And over a 24 hour period using NMR, um, each Chi-C molecule consumes about 15 ATPs um, per day. And this matches estimates from non-NMR studies. Um, and we, uh, using crystallography and NMR, we now have this model of the nighttime state of the clock, where in green is Chi-C, this is the C2 ring up here, the C1 ring down here, Chi-B binds to C1, it forms, in fact, Chi-B binds, uh, there's six Chi-Bs down here, Chi-B recruits Chi-A to the bottom of the C2 ring, and so this is why Chi-A can no longer stimulate Chi-C, because Chi-A, in order to stimulate Chi-C, has to bind up here, the A loops are up here, and it also Chi-B binds to this, this signaling protein, kick a and we solved the Chi-B, kick a uh, heterodimer by NMR. All right, so to finish up my talk, let's just go through a few, just a few slides, uh, asking how does Chi-B switch folds? Because remember, in the daytime, Chi-B forms this, this, this state we call now the ground state of Chi-B. It's the inactive state. It does not bind Chi-C, and it forms a homotetramer, but I'm only showing one subunit. At night, um, Chi-B adopts this fold, which does bind Chi-C, and um, we want to know how this happens. Now, there's three proline residues that are all trans in the ground state of Chi-B, and there's, they become cis in the, the, what we call the fold switch state of Chi-B. This is the active state, the fold switch state. And what we found is that if you ice the sample, okay, basically, and take an NMR spectrum, Basically, you can see that all the peaks are in the fold switch state. So this is just an N15 HSQC, and in blue are peaks that represent the fold switch state of Chi-B. And um, but if you drop the the sample into the spectrometer that is set at 35 degrees, so that your your NMR sample was initially at four degrees, and you drop it in at 35 degrees, what you'll see is that you see these red peaks start to show up. These red peaks represent the ground state of Chi-B. Okay. And um, over time, you can see that the you can see that the ground state become the ground state peaks become more strong, and the full switch peaks become weaker. See that? And so you can actually watch Chi B switch from one state to the next simply by doing it this temperature jump. And what we found is that uh, so here's a temperature jump. Okay, so here. Uh, this is now these dots here are averaging all the signable residues in the spectrum. Um, and so here, initially, when the sample was at four degrees, you can see that most of the signals in the HSQ spectrum belong to the full switch state of chi -B. So the full switch state of chi -B is more stable in the cold. But once you drop it in at, to the spectrometer at 35 degrees, you can see that over time, the full switch peaks get weaker and the ground state peaks get stronger. And if we add in a, a peptidyl proline isomerase, which catalyzes the isomerization of proline residues, you can see the more of this um, isomerase we add, the faster the fold switching. Um, and so what we found is that the rate determining step in fold switching is proline isomerization. Um, and this fold switching is actually temperature compensated. So if you look at um, the Q10, okay, this is a histogram of Q10 values um, for, for, for residues in Chi-B. And what is Q10? Q10 is the ratio of rates uh, where in the numerator is the rate at a temperature that's 10 degrees above the rate in the numerator so the rate in the new, I mean, so in the denominator, the rate in the denominator um, is carried out at some temperature T, and in the numerator is the rate um, at uh, the temperature T, 10 degrees above the, the, the temperature T. And so what you see here is that the Q10 values uh, for switching from the ground state to the full switch state, remember the full switch state is a state that binds Chi-C, that it has a Q10 that's much lower than the Q10 from moving from the Fulcher state to the ground state. And so remember, clocks have to tell time. So that means that they cannot speed up or slow down with temperature. And so one question of circadian clocks is 
how do they not speed up or slow down as the temperature goes up and down? And so here we have evidence that chi B participates in temperature compensation in the cyanobacterial circadian clock by having the change from the inactive ground state to the active Folsom state. You can see that this changes much more slowly with temperature than going from the active Folsom state to the inactive ground state. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge, of course, David Rice. Um, he's a wonderful colleague. And um, he, 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 you know, we have wonderful discussions. We help each other, and uh, he keeps the NMR facility running super smoothly. And uh, and I thank him for inviting me to give this talk. And my former group members up here on the top, and my two collaborators, Susan Gold and Carrie Parch, down here. I acknowledge the NIH for their support in this project, and thank you. Switch me on. Are there questions? Do we have any questions from the audience on Zoom? Yep. If not, I have one. Sure. Okay. So when you talk about the loose state and the tight state of the C1 and C2 rings, about what does that mean? Are they, are they still bound together? Yes. The, 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 when the C2 ring is loose, it's held together by the C1 ring of Chi-C. So oh. the C1 ring is tight. And so even though the C2 rings, when the C2 ring is loose and, the, and by themselves in the loose state, they don't form hexamers, they don't fly away from each other because they're held there by the tight C1 ring. Oh, okay. And remember, each, each subunit of Chi-C is composed of a C1 domain and a C2 domain. So, and they're linked Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Krish. Uh, hi, Andy. This is Krish. Uh, so one quick question is, when you do the NMR experiment, do you do them in presence of light or like in dark cycle or just all of them are in just in room, temperature, room light? What is the experiment? That's a good question, Krish. Um, so, yeah, cyanobacteria use light to reset their clock, but... Um, our system, the chi proteins don't detect light. So, so um, once you add ATP, it starts going and, and the whole sample synchronizes. So what's really interesting is you have a sample composed of microscopic clock proteins and they can generate a macroscopic rhythm that you can see with your eye, which is also a very interesting question on how they don't they don't deface. And, and as NMR people, you know that you can think of the circadian clock of cyanobacteria. When you mix chi A, chi B, and chi C together, it has a very long T2. It has a very long transverse relaxation time. You can think of it like that, right? It stays phase coherent for, for, for weeks. How come it doesn't okay. lose phase coherence is, a, is an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Okay, so we'll get on to our next prize, which is a $100 uh, Visa gift card. And so, Dan, take it away. John Kin. Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. So uh, the send in your email or whatever, and Shelley will make sure that you get the uh, the, the one hundred dollar gift card. Okay. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so um, I guess uh, with that, uh, we'll begin our break. There are still lots of snacks and coffee. What? I, 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 I didn't check. Are we 20 minutes 
10 minutes late, so we'll begin again at, uh, at the uh, scheduled time, which I just wanted to... 10.15. Uh, yes. And those online be back at um, 10.15. We're sorry that we cannot provide food for those online. <laughs> Okay.
Okay. Oh, I'm on again. Okay. So welcome back, everyone. And as we all sit down here from our break, and hopefully everyone's back online. And so I'll give it a, people a moment here to grab their coffees. Okay, so let's get started then with the second half of the morning. And our next speaker is Jared Wood, who comes from the University of North Carolina and also from Merck. And his talk will be chloride, uh, quantitative NMR of chloride by an accurate internal standard approach. And you have, are we ready? Okay. Okay, why don't you, if you want to get started then, and we'll bring your slides up in just a second. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yep. Oop. Okay. Um, I think there was a slight miscommunication or something. Uh, I'm specifically from University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Uh, there's multiple universities in North Carolina. Um, all right, so I'm Jared Wood, and also you may notice the uh, title of this talk is slightly different from what was on the list. That's because I'm not going to just be talking about, uh, well, you can't. Okay. Uh, hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm from University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I've been doing, uh, doing a co-op at Merck and also an internship that I did this past summer. So this is going to be on not only uh, chloride NMR, but also fluorine. Um, so I'm going to get into the chloride part first. So first to talk about chloride QNMR, I'm going to introduce the concept of counter ions. So counter ions are commonly used in active pharmaceutical ingredients to, ingredients to uh, improve upon their solubility as well as their bioavailability and stability. I have a really common example here just to show you. Um, this is this compound at the top is pseudoephedrine. I'm going to get a pointer here. Here we go. So this is pseudoephedrine up at the top. It's not quite soluble in water, not nearly as much as the hydrochloride salt version of this drug, which is pseudoephed, and that dissolves much better in water. So chloride specifically is a very popular counter ion. It accounts for being used in approximately 15% of approved small molecule drug substances and many, many more that are not approved. Um, and there are many different methods that are used for QNMR, specifically um, well, for analysis of chloride, not QNMR. And these are some of those methods that are currently used that are totally inferior, and you know that because we're at an NMR conference. So, a few are including HPLC and other forms of chromatography, and it is widely known that with chromatography comes method development for each and every individual compound that you're working on, and also you need much more uh, reference standards specifically to use the same one that you're trying to quantify. And also there are some other methods like titration and ICP, which are known to have some specificity issues. In particular, ICP is known to be nice for quantitation uh, of chloride, but is not able to distinguish between chloride on different molecules. And that's something that QNMR is totally capable of. And we're going to talk about that here in a bit. But again, I'm preaching to the choir here. I've been doing NMR since late 2020, 
um, and I can see why you all like it so much. Uh, QNMR is great because with our methodology, you know, it's robust, sensitive, accurate, and precise, and it's used for all sorts of things like assaying concentrations of heteronuclei, assessing purity, and monitoring reactions. Specifically with NMR, it's really nice because it is often used as a qualitative technique, of course, and you can find impurities, find out exactly what they are, and with QNMR, you can find out exactly how much of those impurities are that you have performed structure elucidation on. Pretty simple method. Um, you just need to know the purities and molecular weights of your compounds and do some simple integration to find out how much you have. In QNMR, chlorine is a particularly special nucleus to work with. Um, in comparison to something like proton or carbon, which have a spin of one half and much better frequency ratios or gyromagnetic, they have quadrupolar moments of zero, where chloride has particularly significant quadrupolar moments, which is referencing the asymmetry of the nucleus. It's lower on the periodic table, and this nucleus, uh, nucleus uh, asymmetry causes an issue with fast relaxation, which then broadens out your lines to the point where you can't really integrate them and perform an accurate quantitation. However, this is something that's not really reported on that much and is very interesting, but when you have an ion or molecule that is symmetrical, like these three shown at the top, uh, chloride, carbon tetrachloride, and perchlorate, they are fully symmetrical in 360 degrees, and this alleviates the asymmetric stress on the nucleus, which sharpens up those peaks and makes them totally viable for QNMR analysis. Uh, these three at the bottom, they are symmetrical in some degrees, but not fully in 360 degrees, and they look terrible. Cannot do it, cannot work with it. There's been some prior work done on chloride QNMR specifically. There was an external standard method that was reported in 2006, which um, it reported some good linearity data, but not any accuracy or precision data. Um, and then there's been application of Polcon as well. Uh, there's actually a fairly recent paper in 2022. They didn't report any precision, but they still had some relatively nice accuracy. It was around the 3% error amount. And this is totally fine if you want to do something like assign a mono versus a bis salt. It's totally accurate enough to do that, but it's not particularly great for uh, quality control purposes and things of the like. Our method, far more accurate. And we wanted to assay these hydrochloride salts here so that we could validate that. Um, these are all nice salts to work with, little to no hydroscopicity, except for this one compound here, polyethylenamine hydrochloride, which is pretty hydroscopic, but we wanted to use that as a test molecule because it is pretty popular and is used for transfection, and we thought it'd be a nice thing to try quantitation on. So our internal standard method is pretty simple. You just need your hydrochloride salt. This is particularly for uh, quantitation of hydrochlorides and also pretty much anything that has a individual chloride ion. And our internal standard choice is potassium perchlorate. We dissolve that in one-to-one -one deuterated acetonitrile in D2O, and we're able to do an accurate quantitation. Now, why did we choose potassium perchlorate? Uh, it meets a lot of our criteria for what a really nice internal standard is. There's a lot of reported criteria that people talk about, like one, it doesn't overlap with the resonance of your analyte, two, non-hydroscopic, three, uh, soluble in whatever solvent system you're working with, has similar relaxation properties to your analyte, and so on and so forth. It's very nice, particularly because potassium perchlorate, unlike other perchlorates, is non-hydroscopic. So only work with this one, no other ones. Sodium is very hydroscopic in this case. So we put together this solubility matrix 
so that we could see what the best solvent mixture is for dissolving your hydrochloride salt and your internal standard. Um, that's with potassium perchlorate. And we wanted to verify not only the solubility in these solvents for just the drug substance alone, but also with the internal standard. Okay, so something that is also not reported on too much in the field of QNMR um, is verification of the co-dissolution of both your analyte and standard in whatever solvent system you're working with, because it is very important to do that. Uh, as you can see here, I have these boxes indicated with these colors to show just how soluble these things are. And when adding the standard to the mix, the solubility overall does decrease. So it's important to note what does and does not dissolve with your internal standard. We found that the best mix overall is a one-to-one -one ratio of D2O and deuterated acetonitrile. It is the same in both cases here. We have black boxes just for undissolved to 17 milligrams per mil, gold boxes for higher than that, but not as high as twice as much. Thank and then cyan Thank boxes for the best overall. Next, uh, solubility effects. Um, we wanted to see how these solvents looked just for peak shape purposes and signal to noise ratios. So with perchlorate, the best results overall did come from the one-to-one -one mixture of deuterated acetonitrile and D2O. And for chloride, it seemed to get only better as we moved D2O up to 100%. Um, but as you saw on the last slide, the solubility in 100% is not as good. So 50-50 is still the best here. And this peak shape seen here with chloride at 50%, that is still totally sufficient for quantitation and is still giving us very good results. We also looked at temperature effects. Um, specifically, uh, temperature at 65 degrees Celsius over three days was tested, and that did end up showing some pretty stable results. But we do want to point out that it is still easier to use room temperature with a given method. And you also want to do that to avoid any potential degradation of whatever pharmaceutical substances you're working with or whatever it is you're working with. And we still do get the best peak shape with 25 degrees Celsius for perchlorate. And it's still also totally sufficient for chloride. So that's what we went with, room temperature. So optimiz optimization of the uh, acquisition rate. Um, looking at the T1s here for both chloride and perchlorate, you can see they're really uh, small in comparison to what's typical for something like a proton T1. Um, and with that, we're actually able to bring the acquisition time and the relaxation delay down a lot. We wanted to start out with two seconds and one second, respectively, for those two, and look at the area to area ratio for the chloride and perchlorate peaks. We were starting out at an experimental time of 103 minutes, and we were just doing some initial optimizations. We were able to bring that down to about 21.5 minutes for an experiment. Very nice because, again, chloride is not a particularly sensitive nucleus. So these are our overall method parameters generalized for users of different instruments and software. Um, I've gone through these already. We used a standard 90 degree pulse sequence for 35 CL, that isotope that is more abundant, has a better frequency ratio. And we have this relaxation delay of 0.1 seconds, acquisition time of 0.5 seconds. The transmitter offset needs to go directly in between uh, the uh, two peaks, right at the halfway point. This is a very large spectral range that we're working with here as you can see at the bottom. So chloride is showing up at zero ppm, and perchlorate is all the way at 1,000. 
you may have concerns about the 90 degree pulse over that really large bandwidth, but I'll get into that later. Um, so our spectral width, 1200, number of scans, 2048. And for data processing, we used a 20 hertz line broadening and a Whitaker baseline correction. So for those of you familiar with baseline corrections, specifically Whitaker is infamous for being terrible. It's overly aggressive. And in our case, it's actually really nice. Um, we don't recommend it for anything else unless you have completely verified that it works the best. And that it does here. Um, this is how the spectrum looks and it is uh, very accurate. And here we have the results to prove that. So here I'm showing absolute error for all the different compounds that we worked with. We did a three runs of each and an average showing precision data and accuracy data. And our accuracies never got any worse than 0.55% absolute error. And I've also included these external standard measurements from this 2022 paper that was applying Polcon. Those are roughly around 2.5% absolute error. And I'm not cherry picking here to make our data look better. This is totally representative of what an external standard method will get you. We've also tested this across multiple instruments and at different concentrations just for robustness purposes, and it is still very nice. So further on robustness of the method, um, we had initially optimized the pulse width to 21.5 microseconds, giving us this 0.5 area to area ratio. And also, we wanted to see how shifting the transmitter offset from the midpoint of the two peaks affected the uh, area to area ratio. And just moving it by 0.5% gives us 1% added error into our measurement. And going all the way down to 10%, that gives us 27% error. So definitely keep it in the center. And if you haven't heard of this uh, applet up here at the top right, it's pretty neat. You can write that down or take a picture of it if you want. But if you enter in a uh, pulse width and spectral range, it is going to give you an excitation profile for you that looks just like this. And it's very useful. It's showing us that if we put it in the center and we go to say where the perchlorate peak is or where the chloride peak is, we're getting about a 45% um, of that 90 degree. And if we were to bring that pulse width down to 15 microseconds, that brings it all the way up to 70%, which is much, much better. Looking at these results here, um, it significantly improves upon the signal to noise that we were getting with the method and also decreases the effect of shifting the transmitter offset. Still, you certainly do want to put it in the middle, but in the end, this is the best for the method that we had worked on. So 15 microseconds pulse width. And lastly, we did also try to utilize the uh, chorus pulse sequence, um, but in the end, it did not end up being useful because both chloride and perchlorate do have a large T2 relaxation difference, and that did hurt our signal-to-noise ratios. Um, but still a notably nice method, just not for this. So that's it for the chloride work. And next, I'm going to get into some further work that I've been doing at my current uh, Merck co-op position. We're trying to do fluorine QNMR. Uh, much nicer than uh, chloride. It is much more sensitive, has 100% abundance, one half spin, no uh, significant quadrupolar moment. It's zero, very nice. Um, we wanted to, of course, pick an internal standard that meets all of the criteria you want, again, for uh, different types of analyses. We found this compound, 5-fluorouracil, um, is commonly used as an oncology medication and it has a really nice fluorine chemical shift, great for quantitation, 
it has a proton chemical shift as well, which is in a spot that does experience a lot of resonance overlap. It's about, I think, 7.2 something around there. Uh, but it is still, it has a very nice shape and is great for integration if it is isolated. Um, the compound itself is unreactive, incredibly soluble in DMSO, sparingly soluble in water. And this is an interesting point because when we were working things out to find this compound, we wanted to take a look at a list of internal standards that already exist. So Sigma Aldrich has a list of uh, certified reference standards for QNMR called the trace certs. And they don't have anything for fluorine, interestingly enough, that dissolves in water very well. So we thought it might be a good idea to find something that does dissolve in water and uh, tell them to start developing it. It's a nice T1 as well. We did some initial work with this compound already uh, for quantitation of fluconazole. And with the proton peak here, we were actually able to nicely get an accuracy value of 99.8% when performing quantitation. Great results already. Um, with fluorine, not as nice. Putting a transmitter offset right here in the center between the fluconazole peaks and fluorine peak for 5-fluorouracil, uh, our accuracy results just for that with a 90-degree pulse were 101.7% accuracy. Um, certainly could be improved upon. And we did improve upon it later. Um, Whitaker Smoother actually works nicely as a baseline correction here as well. Um, because we have this rolling baseline that we get when acquiring the spectrum. Of course, this could also be solved by removing the first few points of the FID and doing some prediction to fix that, but we didn't do it. Haven't tried it yet. Lastly, we also tried a short flip angle when putting the transmitter offset on the 5-fluorouracil peak. And that gave us a really nice accuracy of 99.2%. So that is within plus or minus 1% and is very nice for fluorine quantitation, but we can certainly do better. And that's it for 5-fluorouracil. So now that we've been inspired by not seeing a fluorine standard that dissolves in water for QNMR, I wanted to go through as many possible structures as I can to see if, there anything, if there's anything out there that does exist that will work really nicely. Uh, so what I did is I searched through thousands of structures in PubChem, and I'm still doing it now. And what I would do is take these structures, if they looked interesting, I would do some instant predictions of data in ACD Labs software, specifically for proton chemical shift, fluorine chemical shift, and also water solubility, which is something that it can predict. It is useful, and we have a few structures already, and I wanted to present some of the data on that. Um, so here is a solubility chart, again, for some of the compounds that we have trying out. And this is in a pretty wide polar range of solvents. As you can see, we have chloroform spanning all the way to D2O. And a couple of these compounds do have nice solubility in all of them. Uh, that would be trifluoroethanol and also hexafluoroisopropanol. So we're going to do more to try to find out a better standard because those two are actually liquids. Hopefully we can find a solid that dissolves in all of these solvents because now I'm starting to think it's possible that we can find something that works for everything. I'm hopeful. And we wanted to also present these ACD predictions and also actual experimental values for chemical shifts. And I have these green areas here, specifically from 9 to 10 ppm and also from 5.5 .5 to 6.5 ppm. Apologies to any folks who are colorblind. I wanted to point out those regions. I consider these nice regions that do not experience a lot of spectral overlap between multiple resonances. And these are optimal places for proton chemical shifts to be. 
And the nicest chemical shifts come from 5 trifluoromethyl pyrimidine and uh, this 3 5 dinitrobenzo trifluoride compound. So I'm going to keep optimizing based on these criteria, and I'm going to keep searching for unique structures that could potentially be used for a dual quantitation through both proton and fluorine QNMR analysis. It'd be really cool to have something that is, well, can be orthogonally used to do that, that dissolves in a wide array of solvents, right? So that's pretty much it. So in conclusion, we have a robust, accurate, and precise QNMR method to assay levels of chloride. And I have this linearity chart here at the bottom just to so show some uh, linearity data. And as for the fluorine QNMR stuff, we're still working on it. And we're incredibly hopeful that we're going to find something amazing. I am especially. And that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Good point. Awesome presentation. But you got to hold it close. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm curious about the potential, ignoring the simplicity of, of using a 90 degree pulse. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering about the utility of putting a shape pulse in. You mentioned that you tried chorus and weren't seeing a big improvement. I'm wondering for, for both the both the chloride and the fluorine, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you'd get actually better results with the shaped pulse. It's totally possible for fluorine, I think. Um, but chlorine specifically is interesting because, of course, the differences in um, T2 relaxation between all sorts of things because this was very specifically developed for analysis of anything that just has a, a free chloride ion. So anything like that should have a particularly different value from perchlorate, which is our internal standard. But that's what it was developed for. But it's a very nice point to bring up and we'll probably look into it. Krish? Simple but excellent, excellent talk. Two Thank questions you. I have is for your uh, uh, chloride detection, the charge state of the chlorine is important. Did you try as a function of pH, the function of with D2O, how the peak changes? That is a good question. Uh, we didn't do that at all. Because, um, you know, it, in water it does uh, form the ions, so that could be an interesting factor to look at. Right. And the, the second on the fluorine data is, Trichlorofluoromethane is a known standard for fluorine at zero degree, zero ppm. Did you try whether, how does that compare with your current internal standard? Uh, we did not try that one, actually. Um, we didn't actually consider anything that was coming from any trace cert lists or anything that anyone has already reported as a proton standard that has fluorine on it, either. Um, we did try just like TFE and um, hexafluoroisopropanol exclusively because they were reported. Um, but I also will add the point that those, while they do have protons on them, those are protons in awful regions of the proton spectrum and should not be used for quantitation. But no, I did not try that compound. But it's a good point to bring up, yeah. Hello, I love the chloride work. I'm questioning about the application of it to mm -hmm. the, um, the API. Mm -hmm. So you can accurately determine the amount of chloride, but is there any concern for how that relates to the API itself? Perhaps if you have multiple uh, salts that co-precipitate, or if you have a contaminant like water or something else that that test will be blind to. Hmm. Wondering if you could comment on that. So, I, are you are you possibly getting at? It's a good question. Are you are you getting at 
something that could be answered by the fact that only symmetrical molecules will work. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand. Uh, let me rephrase. So if I understood correctly, the chloride ion is being mm -hmm. used as a stand-in for quantifying the cation component of it. Yes. So what about uh, situations where you have multiple cations that will precipitate as a hydrochloride salt? Mm -hmm. The chloride test will tell you how much chloride is there, but how do you assess the accuracy of that for the API, whether you have a contaminant that came in that's blind to chloride as a nuclei, or if you have some side reaction that's also producing a salt mm -hmm. that might still have a chloride and contribute to your test, but if your result is being used to say about the quantity of the API itself, how do you assess that your accuracy carries through from chloride all the way through to the organic molecule? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, yeah, that is uh, an excellent concern. Um, the hope is that generally you wouldn't be using mixtures of things to begin with, but it would be readily apparent when calculating just how much chloride you have and then therefore how much cation you have when your molecular weight is not representative of, at all of the values that you're calculating just based on integration. So it would be best to definitely separate everything you can individually when doing this QNMR analysis because, yeah, NMR is not going to distinguish between chlorides belonging to different hydrochloride salts. Um, we have uh, Daniela Robilar, if she'd like to go ahead and unmute herself and ask her question. Hi, thank you for your talk. I have a quick question for the chlorine NMR. Uh, the hypochlorite was terribly bad. I, you just mentioned that as it wasn't, uh, well, it's linear, it's a linear compound, so the peak would be not that sharp, but it's really really bad for discarding it as an internal standard? Internal calibrant, sorry. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, my question is if the hypochlorite, did you test the hypochlorite as internal calibrant? Because you just mentioned that the um, symmetry wasn't good, so that would give a bad peak, but I just want to know if you try it and the results that came from that try. Um, so hydrochloride is, it, it does have nice uh, chloride line shape in QNMR. Um, hypo, oh, hypo. Hypo, hypochloride. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear that. The echoes in the room. Um, no, no, we, uh, we did not actually uh, try that, but we, I know that my, uh, the people I've worked with historically have seen that in the past. Um, I have not experienced that for myself. Okay, thank you. But generally things like that do have, um, because of their asymmetry, pretty bad line shape. Okay, thank you. Nice talk. Um, Couple of things that I wanted to ask about. Uh, sure. In your observation with the offset, mm -hmm. where the position of the transmitter frequency is, and then you, as you moved, your error was higher. That's uh, expected, and it can be calculated because you you actually showed a picture of the applet mm -hmm. result of. It's primarily for a rectangular. It's just based only upon the pulse width, right? You can, we can back calculate. So having the offset exactly at the center doesn't give you anything more than having it 1,000 hertz and calculate what happens when you push it by 1,000 hertz. It's a block equation. Mm -hmm. So uh, have you tried that to make sure that that error you are seeing is really the offset 
excitation profile error rather than something else beyond that. That's number question number one. So because that may not be an issue, uh, having the offset exactly at the center may not be an issue uh, because it is an equation, nothing more. Um, the second point that I just wanted to bring up is more, more like a comment which came up with the re last question as well. You know, when we talk about asymmetric chlorides having a line shape, and we are really talking about broad, line, broad lines, line width, our decay rates, and so on and so forth. Line widths, in my opinion, I maybe I'm a minority here, should have nothing to do with quantification. So with that, I'll close. Right. Uh, yeah, those are both good questions. Um, so for the second one, um, the primary concern for quantitation is being able to, if, so let's say hypothetically that it's so broad that you don't even know where the baseline is relative to where the actual top of the peak is because it, if, if it is broad enough, it might actually be difficult to find where it actually is touching the baseline. So you might not know exactly where to integrate it. Perhaps you could argue that, oh, maybe if I just are, um, integrate over a wide enough area anyway, then I should capture all of what's underneath that peak. Um, but this is mostly for the concern of being able to find out exactly where it hits the baseline. So it's really a methodology, methodology that you are using integral as a surrogate mm -hmm. to quantify. Yes. So, that, so it's not about the, about the quantification aspect itself. It's the methodology that you are using to quantify is dictates that you can't use white lines. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it's also crucial to our signal to noise to have something that we can easily see because that does have a significant effect on the integration that we get. Now, I'm really sorry. I think I might have forgotten what the first question was about. The first question was about the offset. Uh, yeah. ha having the offset off simply means you just need to add one more equation yeah. to your quantization. That's pretty much it. So, Particularly if you are using simple rectangular pulse, which is easy to calculate mm -hmm. the offset effect, offset to excitation profile. Pretty. You, had a, you had an applet. Mm -hmm. It's known for years, right? So. Yeah, right. So we did experimentally verify the the effect of moving the offset around, but we did not perform any calculations specifically to see how that did affect it. Thank you. Garrett. Okay, so let's get on to our next prize. And uh, with the third prize, we have a wonderful Ivan cutting board, which everyone wants to have. I have one. I just couldn't uh, bear to actually use it for a cutting board. <laughs> See, it's, it, but you can use it the underside, but I, I, I prefer to display mine. But um, so uh, let's get started with the uh, see who gets the cutting board. Luke Tremblay. In this room? Oh, bad. 
Okay, well, let's try again. Oh, okay. Uh, Anna Drumek. Uh, yes, I'm here. Hooray. Hello. Congratulations. Thank okay, you very well, much. I don't know if you. Well, I, I, so anyway, uh, get in touch with uh, with us and with Shelley, and uh, she will um, get get your address and send it off. Thank you very much. Okay. Good. <laughs> Okay, well, let's get on to our our next talk. Our next speaker is is he here? What? Mark. Oh, is yes, on, oh, I'm online. Here. Right. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So um, let so I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, excuse me. Here I'm. I get confused. Mark Fairman. Yep. I'd like to, yeah, ma introduce Mark Taraban, who is online, and uh, he's going to speak about water, proton, NMR, for analysis of pharmaceutical products. Okay, can you hear me? And I hope you will see me right oh, yes. now. Okay. And thanks a lot for inviting me to present at Ivan Conference. It's a great honor for me. And I'm here representing the University of Maryland and also the Institute uh, for Bioscience and Biotechnology Research, which is the joint venture of the National Institute of Standards and Technologies and University of Maryland. The building you can see behind my uh, back as the background. So let me share my screen. And I hope you can see it. Okay, and uh, so my uh, my today's presentation will uh, will be just a short review of the work uh, our group has done on the application of the time domain uh, NMR for analysis of the biopharmaceutical products in their original containers without taking them out or sampling out. We call this uh, technology water proton NMR. Uh, this term has been coined by Bruce Yu back in 2017 in our analytical chemistry paper. And uh, we call it WNMR. And uh, this technology that we are developing have some similarity with MRI. The signal source is also water molecule, which is the major solvent for biopharmaceutical materials, uh, biopharmaceuticals. And um, uh, water NMR allows to collect data on a drug product non-invasively or directly in a process flow. And um, it's a contact-free uh, and it gives you the possibility to do the process flow monitoring, and it can allow you to inspect drug product, which remains intact for further use. After the inspection, you can give it back to patient. And um, the uh, water NMR uses compact, uh, inexpensive white bore benchtop NMR instrument, demonstrated the sensitivity to API concentration, aggregation, particle clustering effects, and as I mentioned, could be used in aesthetic and a dynamic flow mode, which is useful for the continuous biomanufacturing too. Here you can see the benchtop NMR family that our group is using. We have a, a benchtop instruments, which allows you to do the uh, measurements under control temperature with the variable temperature from minus 80 to plus 80 centigrade. And we also have a flow in NMR system which allows you to mimic uh, biomanufacturing, continuous biomanufacturing settings. We have a standard NMR spectrometers with the 
uh, no temperature control where we try to keep the magnet temperature close to the room temperature. So these instruments are standard at 18 centigrade uh, controlled uh, cold room to have a temperature of the environment at least five to seven degrees lower than the temperature of the magnet for the stabilization purposes. In all instruments, we have a capability to put the whole vial or the whole whole pan, a whole drug product container inside the instrument to do the measurements without opening because of the wide bore of those instruments varies from uh, about uh, 18 millimeters to 50 uh, millimeters. And uh, what exactly is measured by water in MRI is just a standard uh, time domain CPMG pulse sequence and most often use the fixed uh, tau interpulse delay. Uh, variable phases of the pulses sometimes uh, are employed by different software of the different instruments. And we also have a capability to do the automatic variation of the tau uh, interpulse delay for some multivariate experiments that I will be talking later. In general, the result is just a simple single exponential echo, spin echo decay, which is used to extract relaxation rate of water. And this is our identification parameter, which is used for our analysis. Uh, why the, the reasons, just let me briefly mention the reasons of water sensitivity to uh, concentration to different clustering effects and different mechanisms that are um, controlling the sensitivity of water. Might, might, one might just select three different mechanisms. For example, in case of the protein aggregation uh, here, it, it results in the large assemblies with faster relaxing protons and um, you know, water molecules involved in the proton exchange with these protein molecules will also have faster relaxation rate compared to the bulk water molecules which are not involved in this exchange. Another is mechanism is magnetic susceptibility contrast, which allows to creation of the magnetic field gradient and the solute uh, and water molecule interface, where the water molecules will also will relax faster. And the third mechanism uh, generally seen in the clustering of nanoparticles is the formation of the cavities inside the clusters with the diffusion exchange of water molecules coming of those clusters also having much faster relaxation rate compared to the other water molecules not, uh, not being in these cavities. All of these three mechanisms uh, contribute to the different point of applications of water NMR a different lifetime of any drug product, starting the from, from formulation where you can study drug stability, drug product stability, and to the manufacturing step for the inline measurements of the concentration and formation of aggregates, and up to the quality control at the very end life of the product, uh, even at the point of care during the release of the product or at the very point of care uh, for the injection to the patient. Uh, so here, for example, is an example of the proton exchange uh, sensitivity uh, used to explore the stability of the drug product uh, therapeutic antibody, monoclonal antibody formulation. Here, the response, we can see the linear response of the relaxation rate to the different levels of soluble aggregates formed at uh, um, at different stresses during the freeze-thaw stress, heating stress, and agita agitation stress of the um, therapeutic antibody formulation. And relaxation rate on the right panel is also shown the sensitivity towards the formation of the uh, aggregates of this uh, therapeutic antibody under over the wide range of stress levels and responded differently to different stresses. You can see here that for heating stress, we have a much stronger slope compared to the freeze uh, thaw stress. And for agitation, we have a nonlinear behavior because depending on stress level, the aggregates might dissociate. So we also have demonstrated the capability of water and MA for sensitivity uh, sensitivity towards the, uh, the concentration 
and the aggregation in the process flow, we have developed the benchtop flow in MR instrument where we have mimicked uh, the continuous bi biomanufacturing conditions and we observe the sensitivity of, uh, of our instrument to the flow rate depending on the uh, depending on the uh, on the flow cell configuration for the linear flow cell and for the coiled flow cell you have a different slopes of the dependence of uh, water relaxation and the pure water sample depending on flow rates this uh, will allow the user for example to detect the abrupt flow rate changes or jumps during the uh, in, the, in the conditions of continuous biomanufacturing to see the changes in the flow rates and monitor them using the uh, flow NMR. We also have demonstrated the sensitivity of the flow NMR uh, to the concentration changes for two different proteins at different flow rates. You can see here in these three-dimensional plots that you have uh, essentially planar or linear flat plane that allows you to monitor the concentration changes under the continuous biomanufacturing settings. We also have shown that the uh, flow in MR is not only dependent on the concentration, but it also shows the dependence of relaxation rate of water on a percent of the soluble aggregates um, detected from the SEC and put in the, inside the instrument just for detection of the dependence of R2 versus the flow rate and aggregation concentrations. Uh, all of these measurements are done non-invasively, and uh, all of these measurements uh, are in line, real-time, and contact-free. That allows to use this instrumentation, use this approach for the under the biomanufacturing conditions to monitor flow rate changes, monitor concentration changes, and monitor the aggregation of the uh, API in the process flow. For the quality control at the point of care, for example, uh, this technology might be used also to understand the uniformity of the different drug products. For here in this experiment, we have done the analysis of the four different insulin products for the patient's self-injection presented as a pre-filled insulin pens. And um, here uh, we have analyzed two pairs of the innovator of and the follow-on product like Lantus and Basaglar and Humalac and Admilog are the corresponding uh, pairs of innovator and follow-on products respectively. And we analyze this all analysis can be done at four centigrades in the temperature controlled NMR. And of course, without taking anything out of the pen, right inside the pen. And these results show that for all four insulin products, and for all 10 pens of each product measured, we have pretty much good uh, uniformity with the very small variation of different pens from each other. And uh, note that there is a difference between the follow-on and the innovator products in these two pairs, the relaxation rates are different. So our relaxation rate of water is also capable to distinguish between uh, innovator and follow on products, which supposedly should have identical chemical composition. Uh, also important implication uh, of the, for example, one of the mechanisms of magnetic susceptibility contrast, uh, we have used this to uh, understand the potential of the using for the drug product stability for aluminum adjuvanted vaccine. Aluminum adjuv adjuvanted particles have significantly larger magnetic susceptibility contrast in addition to the OH groups on the surface. So the uh, sensitivity of the uh, aluminum adjuvanted <laughs> suspensions to uh, changes and uh, uh, to different changes in stability and sedimentation protocols uh, demonstrate ex extreme sensitivity of water relaxation rate. So two parameters of the two important parameters of drug product stability uh, here have been explored is the sedimentation rate, which tells us how uh, strong is usually the um, absorption of the antigen on the surface of the adjuvant. And also sedimentation volume ratio is the 
ratio between the sediment and the whole suspension that tells you about how compacted is the sediment in aluminum uh, adjuvanted vaccine uh, and tells about the possibility of uh, pure and full resuspension of this drug before the injection. So all of these measurements are done non-invasively and in the original closed container without taking it out. And it gives the idea, the possibility of measurement of, of the sedimentation rate, monitoring the changes of relaxation rate on time, and uh, understanding of the difference between the contributions of two uh, parts of this uh, product, both, uh, fully supernatant and the, and, and the sediment, to the relaxation, uh, to the decay of the echo signal, which is in that case will be bi-exponential and will allow you to get the contributions of two different uh, parts of your sample. Another very important program, a problem of the modern uh, pharmaceutical biomanufacturing is uh, the understanding of the ratio between a full and empty gene therapy products. In this exercise here, in this experiment, what we did, we analyzed uh, the possibility of water relaxation rate to distinguish between empty and full capsids, with the capsids full with DNA or gene material. And from this uh, experiment, you can see that uh, in case you have an identical, a tighter identical viral particles concentration, you can see the significant difference in relaxation rate of the empty capsids and the full capsids. And uh, uh, this allows you to, to get there, if you do the, the titration and see the two, uh, mix two samples of the full and empty capsids in different ratios, you can see there is a significantly, uh, it's not significant, it's a, it's a absolutely ideal linear dependence of the relaxation rate on the uh, percent of the uh, percent of the full or empty capsids um, and uh, uh, it demonstrates the capability to determine this non-invasively without opening the vial which is extremely important because right now the the measurements of the full versus empty capsids is a pretty long procedure requires a lot of efforts and of course all of these measurements are invasive and they are uh, you are losing a very expensive samples in this experiments you are not even opening the, this vial with the capsids and you can give it back to the manufacturer or even to the patient. These drugs are extremely expensive and the one of the market is about $2.5 million per injection. So we also used the, our technology to fingerprinting of the drug product, specifically to fingerprinting of different vaccines. And all this analysis has been also done in a different in the drug uh, product vials and drug product containers without sampling them out. Uh, here we have analyzed different vaccines that contains aluminum adjuvants in the same concentration, similar concentration, which might be some kind of the, uh, very close to each other. These two vaccines, for example, have identical, almost very close values. These two vaccines have identical values of aluminum adjuvant. And we also analyzed two vaccines which are non-adjuvanted. The idea was to probe whether the water NMI is capable to do the fingerprinting because of other components of those vaccines and uh, to understand the sensitivity of water NMR to the unique content of the vaccines. We used to do several different approaches for that. One of them we called univariate, where you essentially analyze relaxation rate of water at the fixed parameters of CPMG, like at the single interpulse delay uh, tau value. And you also might have a dependence of relaxation rate on the interpulse delay. And you can look at the relaxation rate in time to monitor the kinetics, specifically necessary for the sedimentation kinetics of the different vaccines. And you also might use both approaches at the same time. For example, you can monitor um, uh, monitor changes in the vaccine over time, and at the same time, vary the tau value. And in that case, you, you might have a unique fingerprint of this vaccine. Here, for example, in this first example, we use the univariate approach and uh, multivariate approach to analyze two vaccines uh, that, that are non-anjuvanted, and we compare them with physiological saline. 
And uh, you can see here that if you do the measurement on the single tau value at 500 microseconds, you have a pretty close relaxation rates of these two vaccines. They are almost uh, non-distinguishable from each other, and they are pretty close to the saline. But if you do the same measurements with the varied, varied uh, interpulse delay tau, you can see significant difference between these uh, three, between these two vaccines, and uh, also the difference b between these vaccines and the saline. And that allows you to get the fingerprint of these two vaccines to, for their analysis and to find out the counterfeits. For example, if these counterfeits are just a simple physiological saline. Here, this is application of the um, univariate and multivariate to the adjuvanted vaccines presented in the syringes. For example, here in the fully dispersed vaccines, uh, so the suspensions is fully. Uh, uh, fully dispersed, and uh, here you can see there is a, a certain significant difference between these two vaccines, and they're significantly different from physiological saline. But, and even in the sedimented state, uh, the values at the very low, at the very low values here, the very low values of tau, this uh, this um, sedimented vaccines demonstrate a very similar values. But as soon as you will do tau dispersions of them, you can see the difference between these two vaccines. Here, are two vaccines are produced by the same Daptacil and Tenivac, are, are produced by the same uh, manufacturer, and they contain the same uh, identical concentration for aluminum adjuvant. And you can see how close they are, both in the sedimented state and uh, in the uh, dispersed state at the single tau value. And uh, when you vary, when you do tau dispersion, you also can see very close similarity of these two systems, two, two vaccines. However, if you uh, monitor the sedimentation kinetics of these two vaccines, you will see that they are significantly different from each other. The rate of sedimentation of Tenivac is, is much, uh, uh, much larger compared to the rate of the sedimentation of the Daptacil vaccine. And uh, that allows you to distinguish these vaccines from each other. But when you do the application, this, when you do the application of the of, of uh, this uh, multivariate approach, uh, together with the variation of the tau value, you can see that these two vaccines are even more different from each other. Here on this three-dimensional plot, you can see that uh, Tenivac and Daptacel demonstrate totally different dependencies of the. Uh, sedimentation kinetics together with the variation of the tau value here. We also, in our experiments, we can do, uh, in our protocols, we can do the variation of the tau in cycling way. For example, during the sedimentation of the daptacil, for example, we applied this um, procedure in a way that we, grow, uh, we are changing tau in ascending way and then in descending, in descending order. So essentially, you can have this kind of cycling. Uh, note that when the vaccine sediments, our relaxation rate is dropping, but the increase of the tau results in the, in the growth of relaxation rate. So it's essentially somehow slows down this decay compared to the uh, sedimentation uh, under the conditions of the single tau value. But this thing is totally unique fingerprint of the changes of relaxation rate, and it can be used for the uh, for their um, fingerprinting uh, of these vaccines and uh, uh, use them as the um, for the for the detection of the potential counterfeits. Uh, and it's even more visual if you look at this in three dimensional space. It's it's even more visually uh, differentiating the single. Uh, vaccines from others. So with that, I will summarize my talk and um, mentioning the possibility of the use of water NMR for uh, quality and stability monitoring of pharmaceutical products in their original containers, whether it be sealed vials, profiled syringes, or injection pans. And um, flow water NMR would be used for the contact-free real-time inline process analytical technology for continuous biomanufacturing. Um, water NMR would be uniquely used for analyzed gene therapy products and allows to quickly and reliably estimate the ratio between 
uh, viral capsids filled with the gene therapy products and empty ones. And also, in the future, we envision the possibility of the very small compact NMI instruments that will be also could be used in the point of care in the pharmacy on the healthcare facility, and even by the individual patients to ensure the quality of the drug prior to its uh, uh, administration. So with that, I need to acknowledge the help and the and, uh, uh, great uh, collaboration with my friends and colleagues, Dr. Briggs, Professor Yu, uh, our students, uh, Yiling Wan and Pratima Karki, Mike and Jones from Pfizer and Dr. Grunin from Resonance Systems, great help from the, our uh, colleagues from the uh, companies, uh, Oxford Instruments, Resonance Systems and MRR. And also uh, I should acknowledge the help from uh, the uh, funding from NIH, Nimble, Maryland, Searcy, Pfizer and the University of Maryland Strategic Partnership. And since I, since I cannot be here today with you, here is my uh, business card that you can see my, my information, my contact information, and feel free to contact me anytime when you will be interested to collaborate. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm open for the questions. Do we have any questions from the uh, Zoom audience? I think we're good, Dan. Okay, well, thanks very much, Mark. Hey. Okay. So. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I forgot the drawing. Okay, so our next, our next prize is, yeah, a, uh, it's not the, <laughs> um, it's a $50 Visa gift card. And so let's take it away, Dan. Leopold Merloff. Uh oh, okay, he loses. <laughs> Let's make sure that's. Now he loses. <laughs> Claire Dickinson. Uh oh. <laughs> don't count here. You have to be present. <laughs> Three, one, zero. Bing Ran. <laughs> what? Oh. Oh. Friends or husbands? 
Wow, this is getting uh, kind of... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, zero. <laughs> he lost. <laughs> you can get to tell him. <laughs> uh, yeah, but actually, though, t yeah, we, we could. Al if you had made it in time with the text message, maybe. But. <laughs> Okay, now we're going again. Oh, Kun, yeah. yay! Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with our prize given, we're up for our next event, which is the uh, long-awaited um, Ivan Founders Award. And to do that, John will come up and um, give the ord and reveal the winner back in so okay oh, there's, yeah. there's not one up there yeah How does it work? Yes. Can everyone hear me? Yes. You sure it's loud enough? We can I, hear you, John. I, I yep, can talk we can, we can a lot hear louder if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Monterey Peninsula, Pacific Grove, Asilomar, what's not to love, huh? It's too cold here, but uh, I, you know, I was down in Los Angeles a couple of days ago. It was 55 degrees down there, so we're not alone here. But uh, anyways, my apologies for being tardy this morning, but better late than never, as they say, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, really appreciate uh, uh, everyone turning out today, uh, both in person and uh, online. Looks like uh, that our, our technology is working out pretty well today. Uh, no glitches or hiccups, uh, from what I understand. I, I know that there were some uh, introductions a little bit earlier this morning. But I just want to get, uh, go around the room uh, very briefly. Uh, want to uh, uh, give thanks to uh, my fellow uh, Ivan Board of Directors members, uh, Dave, Dan, Krish. There's Dan right there, and uh, of course uh, Eric and Jake back in the far uh, back in the far corner, our uh, production crew, uh, Shelley Hammond, who has uh, basically put together all the logistics of this. Uh, not only meeting today, but uh, all week, and uh, also uh, Sharon. I don't know where. Maybe she's outside somewhere. But anyways, once again, uh, everyone welcome, and uh, I think we have a very exciting mm -hmm. part of the day today. And that would be, of course, the uh, 2023 uh, Ivan Founders Award. And uh, the award is now in its third year and is given annually at the Ivan NMR Users Group pre-ENC meeting. Uh, the purpose of the Ivan Founders Award is to recognize an individual who has demonstrated excellence in support of the magnetic resonance user community with work and service above and beyond the normal scientific con contributions and consistent with the mission of Ivan. The award committee received many worthy nominations this year uh, reflecting the goals and mission of Ivan, but one individual stood out among the rest with their significant service to the global NMR community. Ready? Drum roll. <laughs> Ron Crouch, if you would, front and center. <laughs> Ron. Ron. The Ivan Board of Directors and the Ivan Founders Award Committee would like to recognize you for the significant impact you've had in your career on the global NMR community through your wisdom about NMR methods, your willingness to engage in personal help, collaborations and training in the practice of NMR that go beyond the usual scientific expectation of expectations of your employers and customers. A statement from your nomination is, and I quote, 
Over his long career, Ron has repeatedly demonstrated that his primary strength and contribution to society is not just his innate ability to recognize a methodology and its potential impact, but then to follow up with passion and to bring those tools to novice users through implementation and education. Ron, we're very proud to present you today with the uh, 2023 Ivan Founders Award for your community service. And we have this, uh, well, it's, it's two pieces, so you got to be careful. And I'm just going to slide it over there. It's uh, engraved with the uh, Ivan logo, Ron Crouch, and uh, Ivan 2023 Founders Award. And uh, maybe even better for a rainy day is a uh, check for you for uh, $2,500. Ron, congratulations. Job well done. Be very happy to have you with us here today. And uh, we, we, we hope you'll accept the award. We hope you'll accept the award. <laughs> God. John, we John Webb's in an electric chair and his legs look like. Yes, no. There we go. Congratulations, Ron. Lunch is served. Right outside.
Mine was switched back up, or you had it turned down, but uh, no, yours was on. Oh, it was on the whole time. And, and then you went and you started doing this. And got it down right you okay. Yeah, and then you do like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I should have. I should have. Well, I understand everything is going off without a hitch, so good. Oh, just one, one observation, Eric. Uh, you might want to uh, maybe zoom in on the speaker from time to time. Maybe you're doing that already. But, uh, we, have, we haven't been on the speaker. Yeah. 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 Ye
traded some emails back and forth.
Come in, Rangoon. Come in, Rangoon. Then we go podium. Give me just a minute. That, that would have made the news if, yes. uh, if the news exactly, exactly yeah. sort of thing. So it just never ceases to amaze me. So, you know, when you get into the yeah. they said Mar Magazine, but then you got the coaches. Well, you don't have to stand back there. Well, you don't stand out here. I was, was going to have Don pull up here. Um, just so that I can get some frames where you're looking at him. Got it. Okay. And then he's going to shake your hand, and then you can turn and face the crowd. And talk. Uh, yeah, I, do, I need a few frames to, to begin with to splice it into all the other videos. Okay. Okay. Way cool. Way cool. Yeah. I've spent three and a half months putting all that together. Basically, a, a portable television studio. <laughs> it is. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. So. I love it. Yeah. And God just. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And this is a lot less than we had last year for cables and stuff. And I convinced John yesterday to get me a Brooker AC250 console. We have one that's got a whole bunch of parts missing. I'm going to take the console case and I'm going to make the studio out of that, so we can just roll it in. Oh, that's a great idea. People are going to see it and they're going to. Console, you know, it's going to be, you know, it's, it's NMR related. Sure it is. You know, sure uh, it is. And stuff, and I'll, you know, the, that angled face, I'll have all my, all my gear mounted in that, in that angled face, a couple of screens up above it, and then, you know. That's a great idea. Yeah. Do we think of all the setup, take down, setup, take down. That's that's the big problem. Here we go. Yeah. They got here. That's they the coolest thing. I'd say zoom in tight if you can. I'm pretty, I'm pretty in. I'm, I'm pretty close in. If you can just kind of back up where you were there a little bit. But we need the, uh, we need the trophy and the check again. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was I was talking I was telling actually some friends from Ryan and Stanford. Yes. And I knew I got this thing. Well heard, you know I'm never heard. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, Oh look at this fancy thing I got. He says, Oh I got one of these. He turned his, his zoom he turned his zoom thing around and he had to run just like it. <laughs> just say when Eric. Yeah, we're just going to re So, folks, this is going to be just like Hollywood, ta acceptance speech take two. <laughs> well, yeah, well the, 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 the fact of the matter is, Ron was so, th so thrilled with the award, he wants to give his speech again. <laughs> the, wait, the alternate ending, though, again, this is Hollywood stuff, the alternate ending is we forgot to hand Ron the microphone, so people watching online just saw his mouth move. That was it. <laughs> Quit, <laughs> Chris. He already cashed it. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick it up right from this last paragraph. <laughs> that, 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 this is Hollywood at its best. <laughs> Wait, the, the, the second check is only two dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> Wait, waiting for the high sign from our producer. And Ron, if, if you just turn, rather you would step away a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm in a tight shot, so it's just yep. kind of okay. okay. 
Is say, this on? <laughs> say, say, say when you're good to go, Eric. Ron, we're proud to present you with the 2023 Ivan Founders Award in recognition of your community service. The award consists of a check for $2,500 and the Ivan Spinning Globe Trophy. How about a take three? <laughs> Ron, we are proud to present you with the 2023 Ivan Founders Award in recognition of your community service. The award consists of a check for $2,500 and the Ivan Spinning Globe Trophy. As an Ivan Founders Award winner, we invite you to join the award selection committee and participate in the process for the next four years. We hope you'll accept the award, Ron. Congratulations. That's for you. And Spinning Globe Trophy. Thank you very much. It's, it's a humbling honor to accept this award, really because of who it comes from. Uh, this community is born of a love of NMR and a love of everything about the technology and the people that are in the NMR family and the support of it. And for me, it's a fabulous, fabulous, humbling experience. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. My roots in NMR go back very far all the way back to the 1970s in the pharmaceutical industry. And while there, as a part of that family, I met many wonderful people along the way, remaining today as a very dear friend from my NMR Foundation days is Gary Martin. And we still talk NMR virtually every day. He has a real love and excitement for the technology. And it's just something that is just contagious in the NMR community. And I thank every one of you for what you've done. Then we moved on to the Varian NMR family. And I see some uh, Varian orphans that are here with me today from the past. This award is as much theirs as my own because I learned so much about NMR technology from interacting with Krish, Dimitri, Dan, Lima. I even learned what solids was. <laughs> so I must thank everyone. I humbly accept the award. Thank you. <laughs> Con congratulations, Ron. <laughs> it's all yours. Yeah. It's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>
We good to go? How was lunch for everyone? Good. You're entirely welcome. Looks like all present and accounted for. Um, next, uh, sort of a mini session, but a very, very important uh, mini session. Uh, we all know and love our uh, favorite uh, helium crisis, uh, 4.0 4. as it's being called these days. Uh, got a uh, short video that was uh, produced for us uh, just a week and a half ago by a very, very good friend, a very long-time friend of mine, uh, almost 45 years, I think, uh, Phil Kornbluth. Uh, he had worked for uh, all of the major uh, uh, companies uh, providing helium uh, back in the day. Uh, Airco, you might remember the name, uh, turned into uh, BOC, British, Oxi uh, British Oxygen, uh, worked for Lindy Union Carbide, uh, all in uh, executive management, uh, worked uh, uh, for these outfits all over the world, uh, very, very close to the helium industry, and still is. Uh, he operates on his own these days uh, under the name of uh, Cornbluth Helium Consulting. Uh, we'll uh, start that video in just a minute. I wanted to uh, just maybe take a, a little informal poll uh, first, and... Uh, just uh, you know, show of hands or uh, you know, give give a shout out. Um, I think a lot of us, a lot of us are interested to find out what everyone's paying per liter of, of liquid helium these days. Uh, I've I've personally heard the range of a low of twenty dollars to a high of a uh, hundred dollars per liter. And uh, do anyone in the audience want to share uh, what they're a uh, 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 current typical situation is. I'll hand the microphone. Anyone around would like to uh, comment? Okay. You know, sort of looking uh, at, uh, you know, what, what is your usage on a monthly basis for, or, you know, annual basis, for example? Uh, do you have helium liquefier? Do you rely totally on, on the uh, liquefaction, uh, your, your own liquefaction system, or does it augment, or do you augment it? with uh, external supply, uh, what are you paying for it, all that good stuff. Yeah, so, so I don't have everything at the tip of my fingers, but um, I actually just was going over the, the price analysis recently um, from, from what we, the stuff I get from my stock room. So we're currently paying $30 a liter uh, if, if we're buying liquid helium. Uh, ultra high purity helium gas ends up being equivalent to almost $40 uh, per liter of liquid helium. Um, we luckily do have a helium recovery system we installed about two years ago. Um, I've got five kind of typical superconducting magnets on it, plus one really high use magnet that has to be filled every two weeks. <laughs> so that means with the losses, currently I'm buying 100 liter doer per year, plus a couple of helium cylinders, maybe another four or five cylinders of helium gas that I put into the system per year. Um, so, I, was that all the questions? I, that was most of them. What, 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 what is your total usage per year? Um, let's see. So, yeah, now I've got to try and do some quick math in my head. Uh, so, let's see. So, for the, for the facility I manage, that's three magnets. It's, that would traditionally have been 400 liters a year. And then for... We've got one other magnet that would be like uh, probably three 60 liter doers a year. And then we've got a higher boil off FTICR horizontal bore magnet that was probably um, six 60 liter doers a year. And then we have this quantum design PPMS magnet that had a recirculator like built onto it that instead of refurbishing it, they stuck it on my system. So now it needs to be filled every two weeks with about um, 40 to 50 liters of heliums, that would have been like 25, 60 liter doers a year. I mean, you wouldn't do that in real life. You'd refurbish the cold head, but yeah, it's a lot of, it's <laughs> my, my helium recovery systems running. I mean, I'm, it, it's, it's running solid, like almost a hundred percent of the time generating liquid. Good, good to know. Thank you. Uh, just one follow-up question. Now your, your recapture system, uh, is it strictly for, uh, fill the bags and you send it out to liquefy, or are you liquefying right on site? 
Yeah, I'm I'm liquefying on site. I've got two liquid helium transfer doers, and then yeah, the collection bag, medium pressure storage, and a liquefier. It liquefies about one liter per hour, roughly. Good, good to know. Thank you. And anyone else want to share uh, current uh, experiences? Yeah, Utah. We have a recovery system that's working quite well, and we have. I don't know how many magnets we have, nine, I guess. And we don't recover everything uh, from one of our magnets yet, but it's been working quite well. And I don't know the current price of helium, what we would pay now, because we haven't bought any. So uh, it's, it's been working pretty well, and uh, we're pleased with that, but we're still curious about it. I would not, I did not want to buy this system as an engineer, I said, well, the, the price of helium is going to go back down. I said, and, but don't take any of my stock picks either because uh, I was just dead wrong. I'm very glad we have it installed. Scott and I work together at s s different locations, and uh, it's been good to, uh, there's been a synergy for this recovery system that's worked pretty well. We're smiling about the recovery system. I, I, I would think indeed you are smiling. Um, anyone in the room that is just relying strictly on outside vendors? Dave? Please. So UC Merced, being the smallest university in the UC system, has yet to have a recovery system, and but we're working on it. And the, you know, the NSF has recently put out a... Uh, a proposal call that might actually reach down into so-called low usage uh, that we might have. We use about 700 liters of liquid helium per year uh, for to keep a 600 Brooker 600 going and a Varian Agilent 500 and a 400. And so we pay well with tax my most recent invoice was three thousand dollars for a hundred liters so thirty dollars a liter which seems to fit right in so uh, we're hoping that um, that the university will see the need to to get liquefiers for everyone <laughs> uh, given the high price uh, but we're, we're starting the process this year with the NSF proposal and then we'll We'll keep agitating for the future. Th thank you, Dave. Good information to know. Anyone else in the room strictly at the mercy of uh, outside vendors? <laughs> so I, I share Dave's, because your neighbor's Fresno State, uh, just about an hour from UC Merced. We have three magnets, a Bruker 300, a Varian 400, and a JUO 600, completely different on external vendors. I need to choose a nitrogen cool probe instead of a helium cool probe on our new GAU level, considering that helium cost is going to be for forbidden for us. So we use about the same um, amount of helium, about $30, that's what we pay. So our plan is if things go south further, we might retire one of the magnets to keep the cost down. That's right now we're able to manage it. Good, good to know. Thank you very much. Dave, please go ahead is that um, I've given some thought to how we might get together and for one of us to, uh, to uh, recover and the other liquefy. Yeah, I know. I, we, that's kind of a political decision to figure out how it's done, you know, in a bureaucracy. But uh, anyway, I'll give this back. Uh, th thank you, Dave. Would, is there anyone else who would like to chime in on this uh, rather weighty situation? So, University of Akron, um, I did the math. We do about 2,000 liters of helium a year because we have no recovery and a very hungry 750. Um, but right now we're at 40 a liter and we're quoted 45 for the next uh, fill we do. So we're trying to negotiate with other uh, providers who are not taking on new customers for the last couple of years, but we have one that might be willing, and they quoted, I think, 33, which will help us a lot uh, from the 45, but quite a bit different than the other, <laughs> what other people are paying, it looks like. Th thank you very much. Um, anyone that has had supply limited or shut off altogether? 
Any any particular remarks on it? Yeah. So um, yeah, we're currently under. I'm trying to remember the percentage. I think we're at a 40% allotment. Um, I, I can't remember exactly what the volume is, but in in the previous helium shortage several years ago, was this about four or five years ago, before we got the recovery system, um, our supplier that we've used for, I don't know, 30 years or however long, um, we, they had us cut down to 30 liters a month, and you couldn't save it up between months. So we, we couldn't get liquid helium from them for our our magnet fills so we had to go to a different supplier and we were paying i don't know maybe twice as much and again this was five years ago so it kind of pales in comparison to today's prices but yeah and i, I a lot of people are under allotment like that you're, you're not kidding they are where did you have to shut any machines down yeah we uh luckily at, at that time we were able to get uh, helium from praxair so we didn't have to shut any down um but in today's environment it i yeah, I'm, we probably would have had to shut some down. You're, you're, you're not kidding. Any, anyone in the room who has had to shut down magnets? But, am, am, I, am I missing someone? Oh, sorry. Uh, we, when the current helium shortage started, the university went under allocation. And in fact, we're, we're in the process of moving one of our magnets now. And fortunately, Brooker has good access to so we were able to proceed. Uh, but, um, but when we first started, um, our vendor denied us our, our, our PO, our, denied our PO, and I, we had to go through the university bureaucracy for them to assert that we, we were preferential for a, uh, for, to get helium. So that's the closest we've come. Hopefully, keep fingers crossed. It, it, it's been challenging at best. Um, anyone else? Any other uh, comments or remarks? No? You, you ready to see the video? Hi, uh, my name is Phil Kornbluth. Uh, I am the president of Kornbluth Helium Consulting, LLC, uh, and uh, I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so uh, providing a brief update on the status of helium shortage 4.0. Uh, I presented on this uh, topic to uh, one of the Ivan meetings um, last May, so uh, I'm not going to do a complete rehash of that, but um, I hopefully will provide a decent update. Um, very briefly, um, I want to just uh, introduce uh, my consultancy uh, to you. Uh, it's a, a consultancy that is completely focused on the healing business, and I'm a commercial guy, so uh, Cornbluth Healing Consulting is all uh, about uh, various commercial issues related to the global healing business. I've been in this business uh, for a long time, 40 years plus. Uh, I've had responsibility for running uh, two of the uh, uh, global healing businesses uh, among, you know, for uh, lengthy periods of time. 
I've known Jonathan Webb since um, my days at BOC, in the early days of MRI, when uh, uh, he was a good customer of mine, and we had a very good relationship, and uh, so we've known each other for, uh, you know, probably since the, I don't know if it was the late 1980s or the early 1990s, but it's been a while. So uh, uh, anyway, that's who I, who I am, that's uh, what I do. So uh, I'd like to start out just with a very brief recap of Helium Shortage 4.0. Uh, the shortage uh, commenced in January 2022 when the Bureau of Land Management's Crude Helium Enrichment Unit uh, uh, commenced a six-month uh, uh, outage. Uh, the primary causes of the shortage uh, were delayed production from a huge new uh, helium plant that Gazprom uh, has, uh, has constructed in Siberia called the Amor Project. Uh, the shutdown of the BLM, which took over 10% of supply out of the market. And then throughout last year, there were various uh, planned and unplanned uh, maintenance events. And I, I'm, I'm not going to waste time listing them all because I don't think, you know, the folks on this call really care about, you know, the minutia of the shortage. Uh, f there's uh, four of the five helium majors have declared force majeure and have been uh, allocating supply throughout the shutdown. The only exception to that has been Air Products. Air Products has been uh, uh, very aggressive on price, so they haven't been doing anybody any favors. Uh, contract prices for helium have increased dramatically throughout the shortage, and uh, those uh, price increases have been driven to some extent by very large cost increases uh, that the helium majors received from ExxonMobil beginning of last year and from uh, Qatar uh, mid-year. Mid uh, so, you know, they've, they've created a little extra push behind those, uh, behind the price increase activity. So where are we now? Well, uh, helium shortage 4.0 is still in place, but uh, clearly not as severe as it was uh, during the first half of 2022. Uh, the BLM has operated steadily since last June uh, with the assi assistance from Messer, who took over operation of the crude helium enrichment unit from the BLM. So uh, we ha now have a competent operator uh, running the BLM uh, system. Uh, there haven't been any major outages in recent months. Uh, the uh, electronics industry has uh, uh, is in a bit of a slump, so that's reduced demand a bit. Uh, but four of the five majors are still allocating supply. Uh, although the allocation percentages have increased to as high as 100% in some cases. Just to be clear, 100% allocation is still an allocation because the customer is being held to some measure of historical demand. They're not allowed to increase demand. Uh, there still is no production from gas problems and more project. Uh, it's still very difficult to secure new supply. Contract prices are still increasing uh, quite a bit. And... Um, the uh, force majeure declarations, which remain in place, uh, combined with the allocations, make it very difficult to obtain quotes uh, on new supply. They make it very difficult to fend off uh, open escalation price adjustments. So what's the outlook for the rest of this year? Uh, well, the most likely scenario, unfortunately, is a continuation of the shortage throughout the year. Uh, the uh, the key variable is uh, whether production f uh, starts up from the Amore project and and whether it's able to flow to market uh, and uh, how how quickly production ramps up, all those things. It's all about Amore. Uh, the latest forecast from Gazprom is that Amore could restart in June. Uh, I would just say there's a very low confidence level in that forecast as well as anything else that Gazprom uh, tells you. Uh, there's also a smaller project in Russia by a company called the Irkutsk Oil Company. They refer to themselves as INK. That's close to starting up. Uh, that would add 4% to roughly to global supply. So that's not enough to end the shortage, but it is enough to uh, create, you know, some relief. Um, the severity of the shortage is going to be variable through the remainder of the year, and it will be worse during periods of uh, plant maintenance. So. For instance, the BLM is taking a maintenance uh, uh, shutdown in April for seven to ten days. That might impact the market. But ExxonMobil, who operates uh, 
the uh, largest plant in the world in uh, Wyoming. Uh, they have a 29-day scheduled maintenance uh, period starting July 10th. That will be felt, and the shortage will be worse uh, you know, during that period and after that period while the uh, su uh, supply chain recovers. And, uh, you know, last but not least, contract prices are going to continue to move up as long as the shortage is in place. So the big question on everybody's minds, well, you know, when will Helium Shortage 4.0 finally end? Well, again, uh, there's a very wide range of potential scenarios uh, that could take place and lots of uncertainty. So the takeaway that I would want you to, you know, what I'd want you to take away from my talk is, is that it's all about a more and lots of uncertainty. Uh, really depends on when production from more restarts, whether it is able to uh, flow to market, uh, you know, how quickly does it ramp, etc. cetera. Um, I do believe it's likely that a more will restart during the second half of 2023. I couldn't tell you if it's going to be one of, of the three uh, plants that they plan to operate or two. Uh, two would be nice. Uh, in the most optimistic scenario, uh, with a, a more restarting, a reasonable ramp up of production, and minimal impact from sanctions, a uh, helium shortage 4.0 could be winding down by the end of the year. However, if a more if a Moore's restart is delayed, if the production is unstable or sanctions prevent the helium from getting to the market, the shortage could extend into 2024 and even to 2025 and even all through 2025. Uh, so a wide range of outcomes. Uh, I want to talk about the war in Ukraine and uh, sanction, the impact of sanctions because that's a big part of what's going to happen with, with the Moore. So right now there's no direct sanctions on Russian helium by either the Russian side or the West. Uh, that could change, but for now there aren't any sanctions. The uh, impact of the war and sanctions has definitely delayed the restart of Amor and the startup of INK's project. Reason for that is, uh, you know, the reason Amor is down is they had a, a fire in October 2021 and an explosion in January 2022. Uh, and Gazprom's ability to source uh, replacement parts from Western companies has been, uh, you know, uh, they just haven't been able to do it. Uh, the other thing is that Western experts who would uh, help to uh, repair the plant or commission either one of those plants have been unable to travel to uh, to Russia. So definitely the, those delays have been, can be directly attributed to the war in Ukraine. Uh, there's been reduced helium production from Algeria because natural gas that normally would have been uh, processed uh, into uh, LNG at the uh, 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 Algerian helium plants uh, uh, has been uh, uh, diverted to uh, the undersea pipelines that flow to Europe to replace the flow of gas uh, uh, from Gazprom to Europe. So. Uh, Algerian production is down. Uh, sanctions have increased the difficulty of shipping healing containers to and from Vladivostok and just to and from Russia, but Western carriers are not allowed to call on Vladivostok, so it's tougher to get it. Uh, there's less, fewer sailings. It's tougher to get containers in and out. Um, an emerging issue and a very important issue right now is uh, it appears that U.S. manufactured healing containers, which are probably more than 85% of the global fleet, uh, are going to require an export license to go to Russia to pick up helium. Uh, two early requests for export licenses have been denied, and there's an appeals process going on right now. Uh, if, if, the, uh, if Western companies are not allowed to, uh, to send uh, U.S. manufactured containers to Russia to pick up helium, that will severely throttle the flow of Russian helium into the market and extend the shortage through 2024 and 2025 because the lead times to purchase new containers from non-U.S. manufacturers, and there's only really one, that's Lindy, uh, who manufactures in Germany, are uh, two years plus. So even though, you know, Chinese companies or Indian companies or Korean companies or 
maybe uh, Taiwanese companies could still use U.S. manufactured containers to go to uh, Russia because they won't be uh, directly impacted by the export licensing requirement. Uh, they just simply don't have the containers to uh, buy a lot of Russian helium uh, and the time it would take to uh, uh, obtain uh, new containers would be two years plus. So that's really the, the really bad, bad scenario uh, for uh, the shortage, the helium shortage. And it could extend the shortage for uh, uh, several years, you know, at least two years. The, the next really big source coming into the market after a more is uh, uh, Cutter 4, which is expected to produce 1.5 BCF uh, starting in 2027. Uh, so you know, if, if you wanted to say, well, if Amur is a total disaster and it never happens, how long could this shortage last? Well, that's your, you know, your absolute doomsday scenario would be 2027. I don't think it's going to be that bad. Uh, but uh, uh, again, it, it's all about Amur and uh, this container licensing thing uh, really threatens to uh, extend the, the, uh, the shortage. So that's all I had. Uh, I want to end with a little bit of a, a plug for uh, Gas World is going to have a helium conference uh, from October 30th to November 1st in Houston. Uh, if you're uh, interested in uh, learning more about the helium business, uh, that's going to be an excellent event. All of your suppliers, whoever they are, will be there. It's a great place to network, and and uh, if you don't, if you're not happy with your current supplier, well, maybe you want to meet some of the other ones. But uh, that's all I had. I uh, hope you have a good rest of the day, and I hope this uh, was informative for you. Thank you very much. Turned on? Yeah. Right. Now I am. Okay. Like that? All right. So we all know Dan Iverson. And uh, who has been involved with um, Open VNMRJ, and so we're going to hear a yearly update. An update. Yes. <laughs> no, I think our drawing is after, isn't it? It's after. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, yes, right. $500 gift card. So if there are online people who know someone who's not online, uh, set, start sending text messages. <laughs> Don't you think it should be like a new tradition where the, the previous speaker gets the reward? <laughs> well, uh, since he controls the uh, picking. <laughs> hey, that's right, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah>, right. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I'm Dan Iverson. I used to work at uh, Ferry and okay. as the software engineering manager. I've, I've converted to Ivan here, so I've got my new, brand new Ivan shirt on, and i got my year-old Ivan jacket on, and i got my Ivan knapsack back there. And what I'm thinking, if I had a nice pair of Ivan sweatpants, I'd be a complete Ivan fashion statement. I think that would just... That would work out. Anyway, open VNMRJ. Uh, yeah. You gave me a defective button here, Dave. Slide switch on the left side. Slide switch on the left side. Uh, there we go. Ah, there we go. Um, so I just wanted to sort of remind people of sort of the timeline for open VNMRJ. It was originally released in 2016, and it basically it was VNMRJ 4.2, the Agilent with the 110 patch installed. So that was the, sort of the first, first release in 2016. Shortly after that, Agilent released me, and then I started to do these things. Uh, we put all of the 
software up on GitHub. It's all open source. Anybody can get it. Um, it's free. We did our next release in 2020 um, and then another one in 2021. And I this crossed out one, so it's been downloaded 4,800 times, which is, I think, pretty good. Uh, last year it was 3,600, and the year before that it was 2,400, so about 1,200 per year. That's 100 a month, and I'm a bit surprised, but that's a good thing. Just a little update on the current OS situation. There's been some turmoil. Uh, CentOS 6 isn't supported anymore. CentOS 8 isn't supported anymore. CentOS 7 will be supported until next year, mid to next year. Um, Red Hat has come out with a nice free subscription thing. If you have up to 16 systems, you don't have to pay for the Red Hat support, and you can, and that seems to work okay. Uh, I would say that the preferred um, OSs at this point seem to be Red Hat, uh, something called Alma Un Linux, which is basically uses the same stuff as Red Hat. Uh, it's sort of like the old CentOS, but it's it's now called Alma Unix. And Ubuntu, people seem to like Ubuntu, and that keeps um, coming along. So like I said, it was released, this last one was released about a year and a half ago, and since that time we've been, oh, sorry, I missed a slide. So the current 3.1, this is what is supported with the current 3.1. Um, I would call that sort of an OS release. We added all these different versions that it supports. Um, I just heard recently from someone who installed it on the Mac version on Ventura. I think he was the first person that made it work on Ventura. And it also works on the Mac new silicon chips, the M1 and M2 silicon chips. So that's good news. Um, but since we re did release um, 3.1 a year and a half ago, we've made a, quite a few changes. I think I counted them up. GitHub has a nice little tool that says, you know, every time you make a change, you make a little log file. It's been over 150 changes in the software since uh, 3.1 release. My color coding here, the black ones are sort of bug fixes. I don't expect you to read them all, but if you go back, when we put this up on YouTube, you can scan through them if you want to. It's also on GitHub. It's all in uh, release notes there. Black ones are bug fixes. The green or blue ones are basically new features. Uh, the blue ones I sort of highlighted as, uh, you know, relatively larger updates. So like it says, it supports Ubuntu 22 now. Um, so that was a lot of work that uh, Dave helped with to get that working on Ubuntu. And oops, don't touch it. We added... Um, um, all the imaging protocols for Innova systems that the guy who wasn't here, Luke Tremble, that missed out on his prize, he's, he's in, in Canada somewhere and he and I have been working to get all the imaging stuff working for, uh, on an Innova system. What else I got in there? Uh, some more changes. I should put my glasses on so I can actually read these. Um, Bert Heiss continues to help out. He put in a T1 row experiment, and he also requested that the probe connect mechanism, which people are familiar with if they have a DD2 or DDR system, work on an, on an ANOVA system because it makes things set up of uh, probe files and things a lot easier. So we put in the uh, probe connect business. And a lot of the green ones are basically my work with Chris. He keeps asking. In fact, this is out of date. Even the earlier this year, he found a bug, which we fixed. And he also requested a new feature, which isn't on the list because it's, it was done like Tuesday. And I had to turn this into Rick to, um, to Eric before that. Uh, last page. Uh, again, so this is just more basically bug fixes and things. A lot have re been reported from spin sites. Um, people complaining about various things, which is a good sign. So based on all these changes, I'm, I'm planning to support, uh, to do a new a beta release, um, probably in June. Um, I'm hoping to keep it to just a couple months. Uh, the, the first, the 2.1 beta release went on for like eight months, which is too long. Uh, the 3.1 beta release was much better, so that went on for a couple weeks, uh, sorry, a couple months. I'm hoping this one will be uh, a similar thing. 
I'm not quite ready yet. Like I say, it, it, we, I have it working on Alma, Alma Linux 9, which is their latest thing. Um, but the installation is a little fussy. So one of the things I do is I have to check to see if it's got the right Java version, if it's got Java running. Well, it has Java running, but it's the wrong Java version that they put in by default. It's one that doesn't support graphics. So now I've got to figure out if the right Java is in there as opposed to just any old Java. Details like that that keep me busy occasionally. So what I'll do when I'm ready, some, again, some, probably sometime in June, is I will email the 3.1 people to see if they're still interested in doing 3.2. And if you weren't part of 3.1 and you want to help out with 3.2, you can email me and uh, we'll put you on the team to do that. On time. Good. Um, so there's a couple um, interesting post, noteworthy posts that came out in Spin Sites, which is our user forum. One was from Jesse, who's sitting right over here. Um, it turns out that Windows has Windows 11 has made some nice packages, um, and you can actually run Open VNMRJ on Windows now. So what Jesse has done. And you can, uh, this other thing is, yeah, the graphics and also some printing. Is what he's done is he's made a little installation tool. So you click a couple buttons. You put this on your Windows box. You click a couple buttons. And it will update your Windows so that everything's installed. And it will download OpenVNMRJ and install that. And uh, you're now running on a, on a Windows box, which is pretty cool. I think I might see if I can just put that in the release. But... He's got it on his website. Um, I think, yeah, at the bottom there, if you want to get it for yourself, uh, he's got it on GitHub at, on a website that you can download it and use it. The other um, noteworthy thing from SpinSight was something from Laird. Um, and he found out that if you take a Mac and you install a virtual machine on a virtual box with Linux in it, you can actually run your spectrometer from a Mac or actually from Windows box. Well, he did it from a Mac, but I assume if it works from a Mac, it'll work from a Windows box. Um, you know, you can just run it directly from a virtual machine with other, whatever kind of PC you want to use. Okay, so I'm going to finish here with some things that are, are not open via NMRJ. Um, the first is the Ivan webpage at ivannmr.com. And the second is some things that Chris and I have been working on that I will review a little bit. So the Ivan webpage, this is, um, this is all courtesy of Eric back here. He's sort of our person in charge of everything here. So what you see at the bottom, it says Ivan, Agent Spin Sites is now Ivan Spin Sites. And there's two places that you can click. So what happened is when the original Agilent Spin Sites was on a platform called Jive. And when Agilent decided they want to do it anymore, I transported all that to Slack. And then recently Slack changed their policy that says anything older than 90 days, we're just not going to let you see anymore. And since there are a lot of manuals and schematics and all this history that wasn't very useful, there's nothing left on Slack basically. So then what I did was I transferred it to something called Zulip. So the whole forum is now on Zulip. If you were a member of the Slack forum, you're automatically a member of the Zulip forum because I transferred all those accounts. But I didn't transfer the passwords because those are sort of, you don't want to do that. So one of the, the, the top one is if you were a member of Slack, you click the top button, put in your email address, and then say, I forgot my password. And it will send you a note that says, what's your new password? And then you can get into the Zulip version of Ivan. If you were never a member of Slack, Click the second one, and then you join as a fresh new member of, of the Zulip one. Some other things that are on this page is up at the top. Uh, I don't I have a little pointer, but uh, the fourth one says past workshops. So all, however many we've done, 40 plus workshops are all available on YouTube. You can go there and uh, view them. we will probably be able to view this one in a couple weeks. And then the other one that we added was the annual Ivan Founders Award, which is third one from the top. And so, you know, Ron just won it this year. Um, and we decided to make it easier to nominate someone to get one of those fancy globes. And so, again, Eric 
put this uh, little web form together. All you need to do is put your name, your email, who you want to nominate, and just a couple sentences about why this person deserves to get a nice globe from us. And uh, that's all it takes. The last thing that's not Ivan, uh, sorry, not OpenVMR, is OpenVMR.com. So sort of this is our commercial way that Chris and I try to earn some money. So over the last seven years, he and I have been working on applications that sort of layer on top of OpenVMRJ. Primarily craft developments, well, totally craft developments. Um, and this is just a, a, actually not the full list, but a summary of some of them. He likes his uh, anagrams. So I don't remember what all these stand for, MISQ and CAS. I know there's another one called Aroma, and there's another one called something else. Um, they're basically, you know, we've, we, over the seven years, we've built a very good craft toolbox. And now what we're doing is taking the tools and making them into applications that you can use, sort of just, you know, button click applications. So that's the list of most, I guess that's most of them. There might be a few more that I missed. A few more always coming. He's always changing things. Um, and then as part of this development, we, when we started this, it was all very inagilent. And we soon recognized that, well, our pool of potential customers is going to keep the shrinking. And so we said, well, we need to look at JL and Brooker. And the first, the first one we did was JL. And they actually have a version they deliver with their software, uh, a craft version with open BNMRJ. And, um, but that's like, that was how many years? That was uh, four years ago? Four years ago? Uh, so it's basically craft version one, or maybe two. We're up to craft version four. Um, and so, but as part of that, we said, okay, well, we need to support all these different vendors. And so what we wrote were com import programs to bring in all of these different uh, types of data. And it's actually pretty much separate from craft. It's a separate little package. You know, we call it invade pack. See if I know what his acronym is. Don't tell me. <laughs> invade is <laughs> import non-variant agilent data easily. Is that right? <laughs> you basically click a button and you can bring in any of these things. So these are also now um, just a separate thing. If you just need the data conversion tool, you know, you don't have to get craft, although you'd probably like it if you did. Um, so you can, you know, basically use OpenVMRJ plus these tools and process any kind of data that you want to do. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. So I'll ask any questions. Right on time. Let me uh, bring the mic over to you. Is it working? Now it is. D Dan, thank you very much. Uh, great talk. And uh, hats off to you for uh, continuing to uh, support uh, uh, Varian Agilent NMR spectrometers. Uh, you're doing a great job with it all. Thank you very much. A uh, couple of questions. Now, is uh, OVJ, OpenVNMRJ, uh, strictly for uh, processing, or are there any components for actual spectrometer uh, control? Uh, it works on, with three point, well, all of them actually, they work on any Agilent uh, variant system. So Mercury, Innova, DDR, DDR2. And, but what about the, the actual control of the yes, uh, spectrometer yeah, hardware? Yes, okay, yes, good, good. It'll work as an acquisition system. Th thank you. And uh, next question, uh, sort of uh, two-part. Uh, any feel for how many variant Agilent systems are, are still in existence, uh, part one and part two, uh, how long do you think you and Krish, uh, for example, would uh, uh, continue supporting uh, variant machines? I mean, based on the number of downloads, I get 1,200 downloads a year. That's a bit surprising to me. I don't... A lot. Um, but so it might be just people are, are downloading for the data processing. I know that some people, like Bert, he downloads it once, but he distributes to all his people in, in, in Europe. So in some sense, that count is underestimated. In terms of how many systems are really out there, I mean, I was talking, to Jesse's got six, I know. 
you got three, he's got five, <laughs> you've got two. Um, so in this room we have 15, right? So I don't really know. Um, I would guess, I would guess, um, anybody want to make a guess? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, so um, I believe that uh, uh, in total, uh, all NMR instruments, there should be, I think, around 9,000 that are active in the world, all manufacturers. Uh, now, take your pick. How many of them have left? Have been left? I would say maximum 1,000, probably more towards 500. I mean, back when we were doing um, Varian, I mean, we shipped out, you know, 20 systems a month for a number of years. So, I don't know. Well, the, 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 the average lifetime of an NMR instrument in a customer lab is around 15 years. How many years? 15. 15. Okay, you will find the industry people replace them every 10 years. The academia people will keep them, I don't know, 20, 25 years. So... Okay. There have been now eight years, nine years, that Agilent decided that NMR is not good 20, for science. 2014, so they, they exited. So, yeah, not that many left. Any other questions? Yes, Scott. Uh, um, with, so with that, I, I'm, I'm very interested in that invade thing you're talking about. I'm going to have to look into that. <laughs> um, I'm assuming, so when you're pulling in data from, you know, like they say, Brooker, stuff like that, I'm assuming you handle their version of, of non-uniform sampling and all that yeah. sorts yes. of stuff. Yes, yes. You, you essentially double-click on the files, or I guess the So it'll translate some of their parameters, like TD, into our NT, and does all those transfers. Yeah, all those now assignment. that I have a mixed, a mixed uh, <laughs> vendor lab, that's... That's an issue for some of my users, and, and I've, I've sort of cobbled together trying to bring like yeah. VNMRJ into Brooker, and it like, yeah, it's kind of iffy, beside. yeah, I'm really interested in that. There is no other additional information we could provide. Before the obviously this works in the browser, in the open in the browser, right? Just a double click, 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 something in the back, just double click. Well, we, we don't actually convert Mestra. Magritech. So you can go to openvnmr.com and request a quote, or you can talk to Chris or I, and we can help you out. Okay. More questions? Okay. Oh, one more. Oh, De we got one Dennis. More. I j you don't know how many systems are out there, and we have some, too, that you probably don't know about. That I knew you had some. Yeah, 3.1 works great. Um, uh, could you put something in the system that would ping back to you that says, hey, I have a working spectrometer here? Or is that against the... I think people... <laughs> <laughs> That's not, like not a, a good virus. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could do that. I don't know if but people would appreciate but, that. But voluntarily, <laughs> voluntarily, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, whatever it is there. Okay, so we're now up for the big moment of the $500 Visa gift card. And, and so, Dan, get things going there. I'll, I'll talk while you work there. Okay, well then, all right. And the winner is Andy Lee Wang. Wow, Andy, are you online? Oh, come on, Andy. Andy. Tick, 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 
12. Oh no, oh no, oh no. So he really only is interested in bio. <laughs> Oh, notice I didn't say tough luck for that one. <laughs> I'll, I'll say something, though. When we did this two years ago, live from Asilomar, um, I, my, my, the talk that I solicited was from my friend Lynette Zagelski, and she won the $500 gift card. So there, I just want to say there's no collusion here. <laughs> okay. Victor Tershk Tershkik Victor Victor Uh oh I should have been quicker with the uh, text message to uh, Andy <laughs> I didn't think it would happen again Tough luck, Victor. <laughs> Do it again. Ruth Stark. Ruth. <laughs> okay, you win. Alessia Tremigno, Tremigno. Oh no. Is anyone watching online? <laughs> Oops, I'm not supposed to say that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're going to keep going. Uh, we can skip the next. No, 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 no. <laughs> Ping. Oh. I, I, I'll keep away from the uh, pun. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and Iran has to take he or she out for dinner. <laughs> Was asked to unmute. Andy. Yes, Andy. Oh. Oh, Andy. It's. I'm so sad to say that you were the were, but you weren't there. The winner of the $500 gift card. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I uh, I just stepped out. Oh, no, no problems. Oh. <laughs> yes. And eel, oh, yeah, right.
Uh, do you get a special bathroom excuse? Yes, I, I actually stepped out to use the men's room. Yes, oh, but no. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> uh. Wait a minute, Victor. Oh, he showed up online, but but he's after thirty seconds. Oh boy. I guess we're too close to the restart. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so if whoever it was, I forget, comes. Hey there. I'm actually here. Yay! <laughs> awesome. Wish I could be so, there in person. Right. <laughs> Which proves that if you hang around Ivan enough, you're going to win. <laughs> Okay, so I think Deneen knows what to do to get her prize. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much, guys. Okay. Uh, okay, so I guess we move on. And our next, our next talk is from Travis. Travis Greger. And he's going to talk about industrial benchtop NMR. Is this on? There we go. A All year right. in review. There we go. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the uh, committee for the another invite. I don't know if, if Chris looked at my slides uh, ahead of time. Um, basically, it has been a year of, of Benchtop NMR, and it really kicked off uh, back in January of 2022 where, when Paul Boyer invited me to speak along with other Benchtop NMR folks at, a, at an Ivan meeting. And then, as you can see, some of the topics there uh, for this. And then a year ago, I spoke at the Ivan meeting, uh, a little bit more detail than what I'm going to go into today. But, uh, you know, really talking about this bench shop NMR in a manufacturing environment. Uh, from there, we hosted, or I hosted, uh, two different bench top NMR symposium. All right. And then uh, we're going to finish off with this one today. So hopefully it's not the end, but I got to get some more content <laughs> to be to really uh, uh, finish this. So, um, you know, I think, and, and Chris and I have talked about this quite a bit, but, you know, Bench Up NMR, it, it, it's, it's like beating a drum. You got to gotta get people to think about it, to use it, especially in the manufacturing setting. You know, they're so comfortable using their near IR probes or their, uh, you know, an XRF or, or GC for that matter. It's, it's not something, you know, NMR is not something that they think of immediately. And so what I want to do is, is really talk, go through a series uh, of examples where it's been a journey for myself, for uh, my colleague Chris, uh, who spoke right there, number, f um, uh, number four, uh, he's he's down at a, a, a factory down south for 3M, and another colleague, Eric Perkins, who was a contract worker, and we hired a bunch of contract workers who are now at 3M. So there's a very good chance that he might be here someday, talking about benchtop NMR. So as I was I was saying, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, benchtop NMR at three different locations. Uh, hopefully, I know the AFE has been approved. I don't know if it's been actually bought yet. Uh, so hopefully we'll have uh, some more very specific examples on that um, uh, in the near future. So a quick show of hands, who's seen me talk about the Bench Shop NMR talk from last year? I know I see some familiar faces, all right? So there's enough people who haven't seen it, so forgive me if I reproduce this. Um, 
at one of our factories, we, you know, 3M is very good at coding solutions on a web. All right, what they're not at the time good at is figuring out if that coding solution is actually gonna work. All right, and in this case, uh, there was a particular product where we were coding the solution on a web, and the only way it they knew if it was gonna work is if it was gonna wind up and just keep winding. If not, it was gonna wind up and just crash. All right, so they would have to ultimately um, you know, run it, hope it works. If not, they're gonna scrap that entire bundle of, of, of uh, polymer. So Tony Bush, a colleague of mine at the factory, uh, you know, he wanted to buy an NMR because he tried m so many different analytical techniques to figure out how to characterize this coding solution in order to make sure that it was going to code correctly. And it turns out that this coding solution had two components, and we're going to just call them A and B. Um, and it turns out that for IR, it was very good at detecting component A. XRF was very good at component B but you couldn't get it to work together, all right? So what he had to do is he had to figure out a way of doing that. And he's like, hey, Travis, let's do this by NMR. And so we spent a ton of time trying to figure out the nuances. And, and I talked him off the edge of buying a 400 megahertz NMR because, you know, as we all know, you know, it's not just the instrument that you need. You need someone to use it and operate it and maintain it. And I think as, as if anyone's familiar with situations in factories, that is very, very difficult to do to justify having a person work full time on a piece of equipment um, in support of a product. So what we did at the time, Tony and I worked uh, quite a bit with Paul actually, uh, when he was at Magratech. Uh This is a 60 megahertz NMR of that coding solution where you can see our, our, our solvent peaks and then down below you can see components A and B where uh, you know, we've got decent resolution. I mean, we were able to uh, get some very good integration. Uh, in comparison, you know, at 500 megahertz, nothing beats field. <laughs> nothing beats field. I think you're going to see some examples later where field is good. Uh, and, and so, you know, we were trying to figure out best way of, of integrating these peaks, making sure they're resolved. You can see a blowing up of that aliphatic region, you know, component A uh, you know, it had a bit of a shoulder that, you know, we were concerned with whether or not that integral area was going to impact um, that ratio. And ultimately, we, were gonna, we wanted a ratio between A and B, and we had a, we had a range that we, our target it was. You know, very easily at 500 megahertz, we could see it. So what we started to do is compare between those instruments. We made multiple samples that um, were able to demonstrate these different attributes for... Uh, qualifying this instrument. Now, the first instrument I qualified was a, G, a GMP facility. Now, 3M only has maybe one or two GMP facilities in the entire company, you know, unlike, you know, many of the pharmaceutical companies here, pharmaceutical uh, companies here where they're almost all GMP. You know, I installed this instrument early on and we had to, we demonstrated, we were running it. And if you want to see more of the bigger story, you can go to the Ivan NMR uh, website and, and, and check it out. But what we were very interested in was trying to develop this piece of equipment that just anybody could use. Push button operation um, and ha have it qualified in a way that if the instrument was ever, ever or the factory was ever vetted by mm, the audit authorities, I guess. <laughs> I can't think of who, who the audit authorities would be at the moment. Um, to to show that, you know, we did due, dilig due diligence because there wasn't a whole lot of, of bench shop NMR qualifications at the time to, to audit and show that the instruments are working correctly. And so we spent a lot of time going through and demonstrating these six different attributes for, um, you know, to, to demonstrate the instrument is working correctly and every time and that anybody could use the instrument uh, as best and as uniformly as possible. So, uh, you know, what we were doing was uh, taking it, and they haven't had a scrap of piece of uh, a roll of material ever since, but 
ultimately, you know, the Benchop NMR worked exceptionally, was exceptionally, exceptionally successful. They bought a second instrument, uh, which is, I guess, a requirement in a GMP facility. And now I understand why, because the power supply went out on the instrument, which was almost unheard of, but it's, they're back up and running, but this is why they do that. So, as I mentioned before, that five-ish minutes, in a nutshell, was uh, you know a previous talk from last year to talk about all the details, the nuances, the struggles to qualify that instrument in the manufacturing environment. Uh, what we're going to do here is look forward a little bit more and look at some of the um, new applications uh, since then. So you know, talking about this, you know, the second instrument that went in at 3M. Uh, this came f out directly out of one of the slides for uh, the purchase justification. You know, uh, we ran a, quite a few samples for many, many years for Chris. He'd ship them up, we'd get to them as soon as we can. All right, you know, even though, uh, you know, all of us knew Chris, he worked in St. Paul for quite some time and then moved out of state to the other 3M location. Uh, he, uh, you know, he really wanted to be able to start using this piece of equipment on site. You know, his background was ICP, so inductively coupled uh, plasma, which measures, you know, part per billion levels or lower of metals. All right, so he's not an organic chemist, he, but he still wanted, you know, an, a, a, an access to an NMR to solve problems almost real time or near real time so he wouldn't have to ship them up. So, uh, and if you, as I mentioned earlier, if you go back and see, watch Chris's talk in one of our other round tables, he talks about that journey, the thought process, the struggles to learn NMR <laughs> from, from, a, you know, from a beginner point of view. So, you know, what we have here is three different options where, you know, we, you know option one, shipping the samples to us, we'll get to it, um, you know, Option two is purchasing the benchtop NMR, and option three, purchase the high field instrument. And ultimately, you know, this was a very uh, good decision on his part and management, we gotta give management its credit, uh, to buy the instrument and, and clear the instrument has already paid for itself many times over in the short time that he has had it. Um, you know, so what we're gonna go do now is go through a bunch of examples of um, that, that Eric or that Chris worked on along with myself and Eric to show the utility of this piece of equipment. Um, you know, you look at those broad lines, all right? You look at these C-13 satellites. Um, you know, 3M is a polymer company. We look at a lot of polymers. You know, coming from grad school where I did carbohydrate chemistry, where you saw a lot of coupling constants and beautiful NMR spectrum, coming in and looking at these broad lines of polymers, even at 500 megahertz, you know, it was a little bit unnerving initially. Um, you know, now that I'm at low field or benchtop NMR again, it's, it's like old school <laughs> again, you know. And part of the things that we're struggling with right now, a little sidebar here, is remembering how insensitive these instruments are. You know, we got spoiled. You know, when I was hired, sorry, Ron. When I was hired, you know, we had three, three varying systems or three variant systems, one solid state, and they all had um, Nalarac probes, I believe, at the time. And, uh, you know, where you'd run an HMB, a single HMBC overnight. And, you know, that's just the way it was for the first few years. And then, and then, we, and then the cold probe technology started coming out. And, you know, you just, you've got more signal to noise, more data than you know what to do with. Now, with the bench top, you know, the one instrument that we have access to does not have a sample changer and it's across campus. <laughs> so, you know, we, you know having, having a sample changer with a bench top is an absolute must. So you can just, you know, it's just time. Just collect more data, you know, and, and, and we're not collecting 2Ds per se, but, you know, the more data you can get, the better. The demonstration here is, is we had these six different samples with various levels of this additive that really impacts performance of this polyester, all right? And, you know, to be able to pick and choose different lots of material for ultimate performance was key. And NMR was the absolute best way of doing this. So 
uh, we were able to clearly demonstrate uh, you know, that we could see down to roughly 200 ppm of polymer in this polyester. We were able to take it a step further and the team has been working quite a bit with Kraft lately and you know, integrating that, that, that shoulder peak accurately is, is quite, can be quite difficult. Uh, so, you know, being able to isolate that peak by itself, having baseline resolution around the peak uh, makes things that much easier. And so we're going through the process of um, optimizing and teaching other folks in the department how to use this uh, to, uh, you know, accurately measure because even at 200 ppm, um, that impacts performance of our materials surprisingly so. So it, it, you know, anything that we can do to help the manufacturing folks run as efficiently as possible, uh, anything we can do to help them is just that much better for everybody. So this is where, this is another uh, example here. Make sure I keep an eye on my time. Where resolution's everything, <laughs> or field is everything. You know, at 600 megahertz, we have this other polyester peak where, you know, we can, we can see all this very, very nice baseline resolution. Uh, you know, here in the polyol uh, region, you know, we can see all these nuances and, and individual species of diols. Um, but, you know, at the, at, the low, at the lower field, you know, we can kind of, well, maybe we can just integrate this whole area as opposed to individual peaks. And then again, you know, maybe we can integrate through here, maybe through here. And then we've also got this one uh, this uh, this peak here, where we can just integrate this area, um, you know. But you know, how do we get some very good measurements? Because what we want to do in this case, we are trying to qualify a second source, um, and there are some other these little components down here actually are really important to the performance again of our material. They control your I um, can't remember if it's this exact example, but you, you know, your crystallization temperatures, your TG, your rheological properties are all impacted by these low level additives, uh, which is not something necessarily you think about on the NMR side of things. Uh, so, you know, again, you know, we're comparing at 660 megahertz, uh, the differences uh, between all these different uh, major components. So it's four major components and, you know, at at high, you know, for the larger components, these actually, you know, between the yellow and the green, pretty decent agreement, all right? Even going from, you know, those two NMR spec, uh, uh, you know, between the two NMR. Where we start to get into trouble is this, this blue area right here, where I was subtracting, you know, integral areas to ultimately get those low level values, all right? And, you know, I think in the long term, even though they don't agree with each other, uh, we've convinced ourselves that as long as we same, follow the same procedure every single time, you know, we sh we'll start to see slight differences in the NMR values, which will, uh, you know, suggest equivalency or not. So that's, uh, that's, that's really important. Um, we've, again, we've got a, a high field instrument, high field uh, data here of another polyester. And you can see these, these peaks right here where the intensities are actually uh, rather important. You can also see the shoulder right here that is rather, uh, that, oh, this, that's what it is. So this is the, at 600 and this is at 60 megahertz where you can see these shoulders, you see the trends are the same, all right? But you just don't get the same kind of baseline resolution you do at high field. All right, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's going back to just kind of old school mentality. You know, what can I do uh, with the data that I have? Um, again, you know, comparing between uh, the, the instruments, um, the baseline resolution between everything and calculating. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, as I mentioned earlier. You know, talked about this, this component A as a function of TG, all right? It is a pretty darn good cor correlation, uh, you know, collecting that data at 60 megahertz and, and showing that, you know, that, you know, if we can accurately measure or even get a trend of that component A, we can start to predict the performance and the overall TG along with your crystallization temperature here of this other component B. All right, 
not so much on crystallization, not so linear yet, but you know, if we had maybe some more resolution, we might be able to um, take a step in that direction. So very nice correlation uh, that demonstrates how we're correlating the, the NMR data to the um, thermal properties. Uh, another one here. All right, so here again, different polyester. <laughs> So in this case, we've got it at 80 megahertz. You know, you can see these trends on the side. And, you know, just qualifying these materials to show that, you know, if we're trying to, to find a second source or a, um, you know, is this material good and bad, the Benchtop NMR is actually working very, very well. All right, even though we don't have baseline resolution. You know, we can even see differences in additives that should or should, may not may or may not supposed to be there uh, and it can be all integrated uh, very nicely uh, in this case here's a here's a raw material which at, the, at a high level looks rather good all right uh, it's you know all your major components are there but when you start looking at the baseline you can see the, you know these small materials here that were not supposed to be there in the first place uh, we had about uh, six or seven samples of this raw material that were shipped in from another 3M factory um, to Chris, where he prepped him, just collected the data, and for every sample that had these extra peaks correlated to product that was not made correctly uh, in, in the end. So, you know, just another example of the utility of using the NMR that was not able to, that could, uh, the NMR was used where other analytical techniques failed. All right. I got a little blow up there. So um, in this case, we're dealing with different isomer differences. Lots of cis and trans isomers, which co ultimately correspond to different performances in crystallization of polymers, in this case, a urethane. So um, they're able to head off any issues with um, you know, the manufacturing process by looking at the instrument, uh, by looking at uh, the NMR data. In this case, uh, I don't think any other analytical technique would have worked. NMR is the only way that this would have been done uh, by, by looking at the different isomers. Uh, very practical example, all right? Um, they were starting to uh, get some new additives um, for this. I think this is a, another polyester where our supplier had typically shipped us these little, you know, egg-shaped, uh, 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 gosh, palm pellets, polymer pellets. And in this next lot of material that came in, we saw a little a few of these cylinders, you know, just they weren't what they were supposed to be. You know, and if you took an NMR of the material, you know, we had this extra spike, which if you know, uh, you know, anything about 1.2 1, 1. ppm, you got, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> All you have to do is just see if we can correlate it. And sure enough, you're round, we're missing that peak. All right, right here. And you see it right here. All right, so 1.2 and about 29 ppm is a long chain hydrocarbon. Call up the manufacturer. Oh yeah, we had a leak of a lubricant into your lot of material, which just would have just done bad things to our lines and would have shut us down and everything. So, you know, a very practical reason of, of having the NMR spectrometer uh, at the location in the factory uh, going for there. Uh, this is actually a very interesting, we, we were, were consulted, uh, Chris collected this data, and we had some water tank rinse. And they, there's an additive that uh, we're not gonna go into, but he collected some very nice data where it clearly demonstrated that we had an additive in there and he needed to know how he needed to know how much it is but because you had such a shoulder on this you know how are we going to accurately integrate this all right and so i'm just showing you the 80 megahertz data we also uh, supplement it with the 600 but we used his data and you know this is down to about 0.2 percent of this additive in water. And this gets back to my comment earlier, you know, at 600 megahertz, you know, we probably saw this in, you know, maybe 16 scans <laughs> on a cold probe, all right? This was probably, you know, 500 scans may, you know, or more. Um, but, you know, he, with that sample changer, he sets out and walks away. 
and just keeps the whole thing running continuously. Whereas, you know, on the 3M campus, we have to walk to another building to change samples out, which just takes, you know, gets our steps in for the day, I guess. But just a very nice because the factory needed to know how high this level was in order to fill the paperwork correctly prior to disposal. So just another example of, of cause that additive does not GC. I can tell you that right now. So NMR is really the only way of doing it. So two more examples uh, in the last few minutes that I have. So we, we and this is hopefully the, uh, a new instrument in another factory where we're, we have these oils and we use them as part of our process, but over time they age. All right, and we've, here we've got about eight to 10 uh, different oils that if you look at them over time, you, you see how they going from new to old. All right, and so what we're trying to do is correlate this, you know, how can we predict the lifetime of that oil? So we're just not automatically changing it too early or too late when the performance of that final product is not where it needs to be. So what we're starting to do is take the products from these different lots of oil and, or when those oils samples were taken from this one lot of oil and correlating that to ultimate product performance. So that's where the utility again at this uh, new factory uh, is gonna be really powerful. Um, I don't know if I show this one or not. Uh, so this was another same factory where, uh, so this is a, an adhesive at 500 megahertz where the adhesive was tackified with this, with this new tackifier. And in order to stabilize that tackifier, we had to add these additives. All right, because it sits out in the sun, it oxidizes, cross-links, and then it doesn't stick anymore. Um, and so, you know, at 500 megahertz, clearly see, we take this adhesive, dissolve it up, easily seen. All right, but those same samples, not very obvious. All right, here, you know, we got, f you know, 4,000 scans, takes a long time to walk back and forth, not very practical. Uh, you know, you might be able to argue you could get some bumps in the baseline, but just not very accurate. So this gets back to just more of the practical side. You know, what can I do to the NMR sample to make sure that we get decent signal noise? What I wound up doing was prepping the sample. Now, again, we, you know, we went from 4,000 scans here to 256 scans here. Very reasonable. What I did is I just prepped the sample as, as almost a plug of, of jelly is what it looked like. And so, and you know, it's already polymer to begin with. I, the lines can't get that much broader, so, uh, even, at the low f uh, even at the low fields that we're at. And we can clearly see the additives that are supposed to be there. You know, we need to make sure that they're present there at, the at, at a specific level, because uh, for warranty purposes, we just want to make sure it's there so that if there's an issue, uh, we can point to a root cause. So what I wanted, to do today is just you know show you some applications really beat the drum i mean i think um the confidence level of chris thomas because i think he gave that talk over the summer something like that the confidence level of chris is really going up when it comes to using this spectrometer at the factory uh we they hi recently hired um uh, an application engineer at the factory whose background is a uh, phd organic chemist he heard that chris had a benchtop nmr <laughs> <laughs> so he's going to use the NMR. They're starting to use it everywhere to solve problems. All right, and that's what it is. It's another tool in the toolbox to solve problems where ha they haven't been able to been solve before. And part of our mission in St. Paul is to help him in any ways possible, whether it's software, automation, or just a little bit of confidence to make sure things are going the way they're supposed to be. So with that, I uh, just want to thank everyone, especially the folks for, at 3M, and the Ivan, and then the folks uh, with um, at Magratech. So, and thank you for your attention. So, any questions? Anything online? All right, thank you. I just, I think, uh, I don't need this. Um, you know, it, it just, I think with the bench shop, you just got a little bit more getting your hands dirty. <laughs> you know, with the low signal to noise, you got to get your hands dirty and figure out new ways of doing things. Um, and it's, um, you don't have signal to noise to burn 
or or, or, or uh, enrichment like we did er, like from the earlier talks today. So it's um, it's good. But thank you. Okay. So thank you, Travis. So we're our next prize. What? I'm sorry? Oh, okay, yeah. Our next prize is a fifty dollar Visa gift card. Rui Bang. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> Paul Oblad. Okay. George Gray. Okay, George. I'm here. Yeah, hey! <laughs> I never expected that. Congratulations, George. Well, and um, and you'll be in touch. Yeah, okay. I'll be coming down Monday, so I may be able to see you. Okay, that's great. Okay, so our next talk is from Don, and do you have, oh, it's up here. Do you know how to put it on? Okay. Uh, our next talk is from Don Bouchard, representing Q1, and he's going to spend some time telling us uh, more about Q1. Great. Thank you very much, Dave. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, you've all heard my spiels at all of the Ivan meetings, so a lot of this is going to be a little bit of rehash. Um, what we're really doing is uh, one system at a time, because we're a small player. We're not promising anything in terms of a cryoprobe, but we are making a very economical, very rugged console upgrade uh, plan from 300 to 500 megahertz. We, we offer 600 as well, but um, we're still uh, developing the 600 magnet in uh, the factory. But we are making 400s in quantity, and uh, we're making a longer hold time doer than the uh, typical AS400. Uh, the hold time is now up to uh, about 240 days, which is an improvement over 180 days. It's a little bit bigger doer. But the uh, right now we have, um, whoop, going the wrong way. We have um, five Quantum One Pluses here in the uh, US. Three of them are at commercial sites uh, one is our demo lab, and another is at the University of Mary Washington, which is our longest install uh, now. We haven't had one hardware-related failure in the last three years, so that, that's a, um, a promising indicator. The, um, for an uh, upgrade package, we can do upgrades in a uh, couple different flavors. We can do a very basic upgrade using a customer's existing shims, probe, and whatever else, uh, shim stack, with a Quantum One Plus uh, console for 150K. 
and uh, we're currently uh, waiting deliver to deliver a system to uh, a college in Baltimore where we're just reusing their Brooker probe and uh, Brooker shims and integrating it with the Quantum One Plus. For about 60K more, we can go full automation uh, with a Q1 STM probe, smart tune and match, uh, the 24 60 position auto sampler, and um, the Q1 Quantum One Plus console and uh, auto sampler and a new computer. So it has advantages over an older system where if you're just buying, say, a used system, because you're getting a brand new computer and a brand new spectrometer with a warranty and a, a reasonable uh, expectation of the lifetime. So I like to say it's excellent performance at an unbeatable price. And um, it's a uh, compact system. Uh, we, in the uh, top rack is the, all the RF generation. Middle rack is the uh, power amplifier, three channel, deuterium, proton, and uh, X channel. And then the lower rack is uh, the uh, shim power supply and uh, pneumatic control. So we all know that the probes are the key to uh, good improving performance and any system and we offer the uh, hybrid a hybrid tuning mechanism for faster tuning and unmatched reliability and this is uh, an, a patented design free from drift, drift and hysteresis with good signal and noise and good solvent suppression and it's made by our uh, Q1 team in Zurich Switzerland so the configurations um, can, can vary from just an HX and HF probe broadband detect or indirect detect. And then we also offer uh, fluorine tuning on both X and F channels as well. That platform is also available for older Varian and Brooker systems. And, um, so the, the scheme is to uh, integrate directly with uh, Topspin and uh, VNMRJ just by uh, putting, oh, that doesn't show up there. Um, the unit on the uh, lower left is just the uh, Q-Link control, and then the box on the right is a, uh, integrates with the existing uh, preamp for uh, uh, the, the tuning control. And then we've also made custom uh, probes with say four channels at 400 megahertz. The system was at uh, BMS for a few years. And we've also made uh, custom probes, a low silicon background probe at 500 megahertz for a Brooker Neo system and the, um, the performance was equivalent to the Brooker probe without the probe background. We're uh, introducing an inexpensive uh, VT accessory for uh, VT air down to minus 20C, and um, it's priced around $8,000. So if, if you're looking at upgrading your VT unit, but what I'd like to just spend most of the time is talking about the heart of the software platform, Spin Studio J, and um, how we're adding on every release. We have about two releases a year. How we're adding um, all kinds of features uh, in every release. So it's a uh, modular plug-in system, so if you have a need for either acquisition processing or uh, post-processing needs. Um, it's just a Java plugin. 
the uh, Spin Studio J is it's a visual uh, or XML programming language with a visual display of the uh, programming result. And we've got a you know a large, fairly large library of uh, pulse sequences for 1D experiments, uh, ex-nucleus experiments, selective experiments, solvent suppression, uh, instrument tests, calibration sequences, and all of uh, very popular, all the popular uh, 2D experiments and uh, different uh, variations. HS experiments as well as uh, XH experiments, J spectra. So a lot of these plugins are all built in Java for uh, capabilities like smart, tun smart tuning and matching. All the uh, automation for um, mu both multi-user security. We have a web interface for remote sample submission as well as uh, following the uh, progress of the experiments on a smartphone. 1D and uh, 3D gradient shimming for uh, easy easy use, and a uh, shape pulse experiments or shape pulse kit for uh, multiple solvent suppression as well as uh, selective excitation. And so. I think I'm going to close here. Um, what we're looking for is people that are looking for economical upgrades in a robust package. We know we're probably not going to pass the test of a lot of faculty members uh, demanding, you know, that they get the best system possible. But what we will provide is um, the same uh, service and support. Uh, for not a lot of money and um, but you still get good performance that's comparable or improving on uh, systems that have been in the field for 10 or 15 years so I'll close here and answer any questions oh. okay thank you So questions? Yes. Is I think test the mic there. Yeah. You know, it was so there we go. Yeah, I just have a question about the uh, operating system that your software runs on? Windows and Linux. Which uh, flavors of Linux? Um, I think right now it's Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Okay, thank you. You have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Don. All right, thank you. Our next prize, we're up to a $100 gift card. I have a good feeling. Bob Berno. <laughs> okay. Chad. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Come on, Chad. Somebody text message him. <laughs> Chad. 
Chad, come back to your computer. Three seconds, two, one. Oh. <laughs> Ken. Oh, okay. If he's not online, might as well. Yeah. Richard Rustandi. James Aramini. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Yay! Hello? Am I the last name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you win the one hundred dollar gift card and and Shelly will be in touch. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, so where where am I here? So our next talk will be uh, online, I believe. Is that correct? Yep, Jackie Thomas. And uh, her, her talk is going to be Craft Enabled Flooring 19 Analysis. And okay. Hello. Did I hear her? Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, Jackie, uh, go ahead and, well, she's got a... Um, should I go ahead and share my screen? Well, you, or oh, there she I is. Know. Okay. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, are you ready for her to share her screen? Okay. Oh, she might have a bad connection. Yeah. Jackie, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, so we lost your picture and there. Okay, we we can. Okay, very good. Okay. So, take All it right. away. Does this uh, look okay? Great. Yes. All right. Um, well, first off, thank you uh, for this opportunity to talk today. I really appreciate um, the uh, committee inviting me um, um, to give a little uh, snapshot into some of the NMR work that happens in the consumer goods industry. And so, yes, today I'm going to be talking about uh, craft-enabled uh, fluorine analysis um, that I did in partnership with some of my oral care analytical partners, Paul Hahn and Mary Seibel, uh, here at Procter & Gamble. And I apologize, I um, am using the PDF version of my talk because I had to use my personal computer, PNG doesn't like Zoom and all of this stuff. So, um, um, so first off, for those that don't know me, I know um, some of the NMR community uh, but for those that don't know me, my name is Jackie Thomas. I'm originally from Texas. Um, I went to Texas A&M um, at College Station, and I have a degree in um, organic chemistry, uh, physical organic chemistry. I worked for Dan Singleton, and we did a lot of C13 um, kinetic isotope effects at natural abundance. So I got really, really uh, familiar with NMR in graduate school. I love NMR. Um, um, and um, found my way back to NMR. 
um, I joined PNG in 2008 and I worked in um, upstream technology. I worked a lot with suppliers, raw materials, uh, process lines. Um, and then 2016, I, their analytical NMR group uh, had an opening and um, I jumped back in head first uh, and I've uh, been loving it ever since. Um, I'm also very active with uh, ACS. Uh, you will see me at the local Cincinnati section, national sometimes. And then I'm also an ACS career consultant uh, for any of the students that are attending that are interested in thinking about uh, careers in industry. So um, a little bit about PNG. Um, uh, hopefully most of the audience knows um, maybe not the parent company Procter & Gamble, but a lot of our brands. So. Uh, we are a company of leading brands um, to help consumers uh, make their lives easier cleaning. So we're into surfactant technology. So we have Gain, Di uh, Tide, Dawn, um, Mr. Clean, Safeguard, uh, Swiffer, Charmin, um, Always. Um, but one of the um, products that I'm going to be uh, talking about today for this this. Uh, particular talk is about Crest. So Crest is one of our dentifrice products, also aka toothpaste, right? Um, and so um, one of the important pieces about Crest is that um, we deliver a fluoride treatment um, uh, to consumers um, to impart the, the benefit that they, that they are really looking for, whether that's whiteness, uh, cavities, gingivitis, and so we have different product lines and they all contain different sources of, of fluor fluoride. Um, some are um, formulated with sodium fluoride, others are formulated with stannous fluoride. Um, and then the one in particular for today is for, uh, formulated with sodium uh, monofluorophosphate, um, which is really important because if we say we're gonna deliver a certain amount of fluoride to consumers, we really should be doing that. Um, but we're also, you know, because um, Crest is regulated by the FDA, you know, it's really important that, that we are indeed uh, delivering that amount of fluoride. And so sodium mono, uh, monofluorophosphate is really um, the molecule today. It's a very small, simple molecule. You can see it's a, a phosphate uh, group with a fluoride attached and uh, there's two sodiums to balance the charge. Um, lots of consumer goods companies use it in, in their toothpastes. So, um, okay, so uh, we also call it MFP. So for the rest of the talk, instead of saying the long name, I'll just say MFP. Um, traditionally, MFP is um, characterized using ion chromatography methods. So they have a reference standard. Um, usually um, that's uh, pretty stable. They store it under stable conditions. Um, and then the sample of interest is, is then compared against it. And so its relative intensities um, are then compared to give you the concentration. But the problem occurs is when uh, if there's an issue with the reference standard. Maybe the reference standard wasn't held at the right temperature, storage conditions. There was a decomposition that that it, their people weren't aware of. And so now that reference standard can come into question. Um, and it did most recently within the last six months. So there was suspect that there was a degradation uh, to the reference standard. And because of that, the results of the testing for our particular lot of MFP that was gonna be made into, you know, hundreds of thousands of products uh, was, it came back much higher than expected. And so people were asking, hmm, this doesn't seem right. This is, this is weird. It, it, it is definitely off. Uh, Quo, actually, my, my partner from Oral Care Analytical uh, came to me and was like, hey, Jackie, we have this issue. Um, the LC method is coming back way too high. Um, we, we don't know if it's actually decomp decomposing, if there's really MFP there, uh, because the ion chromatography method doesn't give you structural information. And so he had found this paper through a, a brief search and um, it was published. Um, and it, it, it was actually um, an extraction method. So people were extracting out uh, sodium fluoride 
and MFP from a formulated toothpaste and then doing um, fluorine NMR on it um, in a quantitative way and comparing and contrasting um, the um, quantitative method of using a calibration curve versus using an internal reference standard. Um, and so we hadn't actually tried this in our labs. Um, so Quill was kind of like, can you do this? We're, we're on a really tight deadline. All this product is, is you know, it, it's, um, it, we really need it to, to really understand the level of MFP that we have in, in, the, in this product. So sure, we could, we could do it. They had a really nice outline of the sample preparation, the internal standard they use. They made the assignments. They talked about, you know, all of the different um, parameters to set up the experiment. Um, so we were able to, to quickly, you know, do this and reapply it and, and um, um, analyze the MFP in our lab. And so you can see here, MFP, it's split into two. Uh, it's a doublet because of the coupling from the phosphorus group. We have the our internal standard, which we um, copied directly from the paper, um, sodium trichloroacetic acid. Um, we... Uh, I put sodium trifluoroacetic acid, should be sodium trifluoroacetate. Uh, so we were using the acetate, the acetic acid. I don't know if you've ever used trifluoroacetic acid, but it's very volatile. It can evaporate. And then you have issues with quantitation. So no, we were using sodium trifluoroacetate. Sorry about that. And then you can see the free fluoride as well. Um, so the spectra looks good. Everything is great, right? Until you start increasing your baseline. And so as you increase your baseline, you can see rolling effect. And then if we zoom out to our entire spectral window, you can see this, this horrendous uh, background um, that's coming through. And so um, what we use right now is we use a um, broker system equipped with a um, cryo prodigy probe. Um, this is off of our 600 instrument. And so we have this rolling baseline and we also have uh, obviously contributions to our background from the Teflon components um, that are made up of this probe. And so there were a couple of different strategies if we ever wanted to continue to do quantitative fluorine as we could buy a fluorine specific probe. We don't want to do that because we really don't want to move in and out these Prodigy probes. I don't know if you've ever had to try to change one out. Um, it's kind of um, pain squared. It's not easy to do. Um, so we like keeping our Prodigy probe in all, at all times. We can apply strong baseline corrections and, and do phasing. Um, and that's all well and good. However, um, as m probably a lot of people in this audience know that it can be biased, right? So if you have a newer person doing the analysis versus somebody who has a lot of experience, um, phasing can can definitely influence sometimes the values that you get. We've also been playing around with craft software. So we did purchase um, a license um, uh, in past years for craft and we were using it to separate um, minor peaks from um, polymer peaks. And we, during the training, one of the things that always stuck with me um, about craft was um, about the time domain processing. And so this is just a summary slide. You guys are all very familiar with craft, but when I use this presentation internally, um, you know, everybody's kind of like craft, what, what's craft? And so um, just to quickly summarize, time domain NMR uh, signal processing is really uh, what we're doing um, with, with Krisha's uh, software um separate separate out overlapping signals from ingredients and mixtures um to successfully quantitate those ingredients um and like i said one of the big things from the training with krish whenever we did purchase this was you know he talked about eliminating the issues that arise from baseline and phase and so if we think about traditional ft um um, analysis, right? You have your FID, you Fourier transform it, and now you have phase and baseline corrections as parameters because those are as a, a result of the, the Fourier transform. Um, if you're um, doing the analysis in the time domain, right? The baseline and phase don't even exist yet. 
Um, and so it's really the amplitude and, you know, whether you choose to phase your, your resulting FID, it's up to you. It's, it's really, um, you can rebuild it and visualize it and use it as a visualizing tool. Um, so that's one of the things where I was kind of like, oh, well, interesting. It, as I thought about some of the applications we use in fluorine uh, analysis and aluminum um, uh, acquisitions, we always have these contributions from, from the backgrounds, from the internals of the probe. Um, so this was a great opportunity to use this software um, in a applied way for us. And so you can see here, here is my um, the FID that's separated using craft um, for the, the, the sample that I was looking at, the MFP, the internal standard. Um, here's it's reconstructed and here's the craft output table. And you can see here are my frequencies and I'm able to assign them, copy down my amplitude since I used an internal standard, we have that as well. Um, and, you know, as if you blow it up, you know, those baseline contributions are not there because I'm really just looking in at that one frequency um, itself. And so uh, just like with integration, you can swap out amplitude for the integration. And so, you know, knowing the amount of my internal standard, using my sample weights, um, doing the um, equivalence of fluorine, I'm able to calculate the concentration of my mono, um, my MFP. And I just put this in here just to kind of highlight, you know, um, if we look at the distribution of four points, uh, four, four replicates. So we prepped it four times, ran it four times, uh, and did the craft or the analysis on them, right? We can do uh, lots of different types of processing. We can do integrations. We can do baseline corrections. And I just kind of did a couple of them. Some of them come really close, you know, to, to having a, a, a um, tight distribution of the results. Some of them, uh, if you're not careful, um, especially if you have, um, you know, people who are, are, are newer that don't really understand some of the baseline correction or phasing, it, it can cause lots of issues and lots, lots of variation within the result that you get. Um, and so why not just do a, a Whitaker baseline correction and then do some phase? Uh, when you do that, you get a pretty nice flat uh, baseline. And, but again, if we blow it up and we just do one or two clicks of phase to the right or to the left, you know, that, that could be about 1% difference of MFP. And that's a huge, you know, huge um, impact to our formulator product because I don't know if you saw, the level of MFP that we're talking about putting into this product is extremely low. So that could, could be a, a, a big factor in whether or not we're meeting the right uh, target range to deliver the product that we say that we're delivering. So um, in a nutshell, here are the results. Um, we were able to look at an older retained lot uh, of, our, of our standard. Uh, we have a new standard um, that's here. Um, so our old standard should have been about 97. And as you can see, it definitely had decomposed and now it's like 93. Um, so we have a new standard. We've been holding it um, in stability. We will be monitoring it using this NMR method uh, over the next couple of year, years, maybe a year. I forget how much they say everything in months. And it was just a lot of months to me. Um, so um, so yeah, everybody was pretty happy with the analysis. Uh, we know it's MFP. We um, have a pretty uh, good, robust method. Um, doesn't take us a lot of time, quick 10, 20 minute uh, acquisition uh, because we're doing it quantitative. And then, you know, the analysis is, is not very long at all. So uh, with that, that's kind of what I had to share today, um, practical application um, uh, for this audience. And I'd just like to acknowledge the NMR MRI team we have at PNG, um, the corporate functions analytical section um, the oral analytical team that brought this uh, problem to me to, to kind of work out internal funding, um, the Ivan NMR planning committee, 
uh, to the audience. Thank you. Really appreciate it. I wish it could have been there, but uh, had to do this virtually. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than willing to, to take questions. Okay, thank you. <laughs> questions? Yes. Thank you. That, that's an excellent yeah. presentation. My question is, the NMR spectra that you showed, is it the toothpaste itself or just the pure compound? Mm. Yeah, so um, the, the oh. spectra that I showed is just the pure raw material MFP itself. Um, the paper um, did cite that they do extractions of, of the toothpaste um, to recover the MFP. I think they pretty much just make a slurry. Um, and so we've actually been starting to do that as well because um, after products are made, that's that's one of the things that we have to look for um, is, you know, is was it made as intended? And so they've done other types of titration methods uh, that give them indirect evidence. So they were actually kind of interested in this application having demonstrated it on the raw material. More questions? I guess, okay, well, thank you. Nice. Okay, so our next, uh, we're, oh, uh, what are we up to? Up to a cutting board. <laughs> so for those that weren't here this morning, it's a beautiful Ivan, whoops, Ivan cut, cutting board, and um, which actually can be used as a cutting board, though I wouldn't want to. And so let's do our... Uh, Ann Mirich? Mm. Anna Sikos? Prashansa Agarwal? Agro, Agro, Hi, I am here. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you win the cutting board and, of course, get in touch with Shelley. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, congratulations. Okay, so we're up to Krish. And while he puts his headset on, uh, I'll introduce Krish and Krish Krishnamurthy, and he's going to talk about time domain ba analysis, back to basics. Hey, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Here I am, back again, uh, between you and the reception. Uh, let's see how long I can hold you here. <laughs> well, you have a little extra time, but there <laughs> presumably our cocktail or wine and beer or whatever. Waiting. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it always happens every year, so that's okay. That's, um, it's it's good to see that there are uh, others who probably hinted about um, craft, but I'm not really going to talk about craft per se today, even though I will interchange time domain 
analysis with Kraft because somebody told me that Kraft is a good software, so I have been using that. But fundamentally, what I'm going to talk about is generally applicable to any time domain analysis that you might be doing, time domain analysis um, of NMR data. So let's first put some um, basic definitions out of the way. Uh, I introduced uh, a new word there, um, Frank Delaglio was very excited about it, is a tabular domain. Um, so we have, we know, we all know about time domain, we all know about frequency domain and I said, okay, let's have a, have a tabular domain. Uh, the time domain is FID, it's a linear sum of frequency, amplitude, decay rate, constant and phase, a linear sum of a variety of sinusoids. Tabular domain, you think of it as the same for information in per row in a spreadsheet, yeah. A frequency domain we all know, Fourier transform, XY representation, if it's a 1D, XY representation of some kind of a height point against frequency. Yeah. So that's one definition out of the way. Next definition in my title was back to basics. So I want to talk about basics. I'm really, really going back to basics. Yeah. Um, signal to noise, line shape, we all measure line shape. I just picked it out of Google. Yeah, I just Googled it. And it came out of, these are the pictures that came out, I put it in. Resolution, I don't know how many of you have done resolution measurement with ODCB. This is really, really, op there's probably very few, uh, probably this uh, audience. Um, in, in when I was in, in USC, George Ola's lab, we actually used to have the running winner of how somebody can split this peak in ODCB and whoever, gets it done for that week, their name goes up, and so on and so forth. And then obviously, finally, there is this, uh, the newer one that a lot of people use now um, in, in testing probes and things like that is water suppression, sucrose, you measure the residual line shape of the water, so it measures all three in, in, in some form or other. So that's the basics, that's exactly what I'm going to planning, I'm, I'm hoping to talk about, but from the perspective of time domain analysis. So time and frequency domain. So when we want to talk about this, these basics in time and frequency domain, we need to understand what the properties are in time and frequency domain, yeah? So in, in time domain, it is frequency, exponential decay, um, amplitude, phase, and of course, the ubiquitous noise, yeah? And in frequency domain, it's the same four. Same four parameters, just different nomenclature, different way they are expressed, and you, ha you also have uh, uh, noise, noise in there. It, it's very convenient in this particular representation. I put the signal as a nice sinusoidal, decaying sinusoidal function, and I put the noise down there as noise. But in reality, what you are looking at is noise is on top of your signal. Yeah? Noise is not an indip some foreign material. It's just, it is a, it is a uncertainty in the signal measurement at every point. So it's, it's a part and part of your, your signal, really. So when you, when you think about signal to noise, it becomes slightly different uh, way of looking at it. So in signal to noise in, in frequency domain, we all know this, we do this all the time. We either measure the peak height or some kind of an integral, and then we measure an RMS noise, and then say, okay, this is my signal to noise ratio. In time domain, that's interesting. Signal to noise changes as your signal up continues to get detected. The signal to noise in the very front of the FED is very high. Signal to noise in the end of the FED is very low. Yeah, that's fundamentally there is a difference in the definition of signal to noise in time domain versus frequency domain. I keep putting that noise uh, definition there, it is an uncertainty in signal measurement. Right? It's not a some, something that is floating around. So how do we, so interestingly enough, in time domain, if you focus on the very front end of the FID, you are dealing with a very high signal noise. Right? If you, if, 
Whereas in, in frequency domain, it doesn't matter because it, the noise got spread out. Irrespective of where you measure, irrespective of which signal you measure, the noise is noise. Yeah? There's, a, there's, a, there's a subtle but interesting def differentiation between the two. Frequency separation permitting, meaning that if you don't have to acquire long enough, if, why acquire long, too long in time, if you are going to do time domain analysis, you can actually have a better signal noise. Um, okay. Okay. So let's, let's see if that hypothesis is, is good. So here is a simulated, I don't have a spectrometer. I can't put one in my garage because I had to move my car. So I don't have a spectrometer. I just do synthesis. So here is a, a, a craft analysis, time domain analysis of a singlet, a single peak, in a signal, and I, I just add a ra random noise into it. Right? I do the analysis so the signal gets separated out in time domain and the leftover is residual. That's my noise. Yeah? So I want to compare the entire acquisition, 1.8 second acquisition, against just using only the 0.45 acquisition. Right? So I'm, not, I'm just using the front end of the same signal, only the first one fourth, I believe, yeah, instead of the whole thing. Yeah? Here is, a, I, I just introduced the integral based answer as well. So the blue line is integral frequency domain calculation of the amplitude for, I called it 16 through 0.125, one is 50 to one signal to noise, right? our conventional signal to noise of peak height to noise measurement. So I just use that as, as my standard. 50 to 1 is standard, anything below is smaller. So this is 6.25 to 1 in the conventional signal to noise measurement. You do an FT, measure the peak height, measure the RMS, measure your, calculate your uh, yes, signal to noise. 16 would be significantly higher, 800 to 1 signal to noise, yeah? So that's what the 16 to 1.125 mean. So the blue line is the accuracy of your integral uh, of the values, yeah? I'm expecting 100 because it's a synthetic signal. I put in a value of 100 in my amplitude, right? That's your integral. Why does it go down when the noise level goes up? I don't have to talk about that. Go read the, Gennady has published a nice paper recently, last year in analytical chemistry, discussing how the noise affects integral calculation. And using some Monte, Monte Carlo methodology, um, computations and things like that. It's a beautiful paper, just go on and read that. I'm not going to talk about that. It's, here it's not a comparison of frequency domain to time domain. I'm talking about comparison of time domain analysis to time domain analysis. Yeah? So the yellow is also frequency domain, but it's a modeling approach. The red one is time domain analysis using the entire FED, 1.8 second of the FED. The orange is the same FID supplied, but I said use only first 25% of the FED. Don't use the entire FID, just use first 0.25% of the FID. And then that's your error value. So this is the value that you c it calculates, that's the error, what it's supposed to be, what it is not. If you're, th if you're looking at, that's a 1.5% error from what I'm expecting with a signal, with a data that has a signal to noise conventional signal to noise of 6.25 to 1. I think if you are doing quantitative NMR, and if I give you a, a, a data that has a 6.25 to 1 signal to noise, and say, go, give me 1.5% error in there, yeah, you'll tell me I'm crazy, right? I don't have to tell this group quanti about quantitative NMR. I, I am the, I'm probably the novice among all of you about quantitative NMR, but that's pretty impressive. Now, signal to no noise is a, is a measurement of uncertainty. The uncertainty can be how poorly it detects, or meaning the accuracy of that, or if I repeat it multiple times, how good are you, are you able to reproduce every time? So here is the data that I did. I just took generator synthetic signal and the noise of sing a singlet, right? Different noise values. All of them about signal noise about 11.3 plus minus 0.7. So I have about 11 fits like that, right? I analyze 11 fits. I want to do the same thing in all 11 of them. Noise is random, the same signal. 
Yeah. See how uh, how can you re reproduce? So this is the um, uh, value there, and so this is what I am expecting because I introduced that signal. Yeah, this is my signal. So it's the amplitude reference, and integral gives you that a lower value, but it has a spread. That's the um, craft results or a time domain analysis result using the entire fit. The value is very close to accurate that I just showed you before in the previous slide. Th there is a spread. But the moment you start to use only very early part of the fit, I don't care about the rest of the fit because I don't need to separate my signal. It's a singular for God's sake. Why do I need more than certain number of points in there? Right? Look at, look at the tightness of that error. So the reproducibility is also better. That means the measurement uncertainty in the measurement is better if in the early part of the FID. In time domain, singular noise is a different definition. Is how you analyze the data. Where, which FID, which part of the FID you are going to analyze the data with. So shorter acquisition time gives you decrease your uncertainty. Counterintuitive, but it is. Here is an example of that. So this is actually a reaction mon monitoring using F19. Yeah, that's uh, trace number one, trace number 50, trace number 100. Meaning they had some kind of a one minute kinetic time point. So this is 50 second, 50 minute later. That's 100 minute later. There are other fits in between. I'm not showing you, and they want to monitor that particular peak. So here is an expansion of that peak, real peak. Yeah. So if I do a time domain analysis of this across the timeline, kinetic timeline, that's the data I get. Looks pretty decent, if you may say, for the noise that it had. Yeah. But I'm using the entire FID. So I simply said, nope, I'm not interested because that F19 is well separated from the rest of the guys. I have no problem in frequency separation. Just use 0.05, 05 second, millisecond of that same FID. The same input. I just simply said, just use the first five, five, 50 milliseconds. Don't use anything else. Signal to noise there is very high in the same in that FID. Uncertainty between transient to transient to transient, if you want to call it, is ex is better, much better. Less, much less uncertainty in there. Uncertainty variations in there. How do I increase my signal to noise in a conventional fashion? This is a very common practice. Yeah, dates back to invention of FTNMR. Yeah, here is a, a single scan. Assume there's a single scan FID. Signal to noise of 101. Let's talk it. So if you want to increase time average, I do a second scan. Signal increases by a factor of two. Noise increases by a square root of two. You, signal noise increases square root of 2. So third scan, fourth scan, and so on and so forth. What if I have a probe at the hardware that gives me a signal, an MR signal, noiseless, violate all fundamental laws of physics and electronics? Let's say so argument sake. I have a, 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 a probe and a spectrometer that gives me no noise signal. And if I can add that signal to this signal, 101 becomes 201 because I'm not adding noise. I'm just adding signal. But that signal need not necessarily be a physical signal. What if I can describe that signal as an equation? If that signal, noiseless signal, is an equation, I can add that equation. Equation is a commercial decay function. It has a frequency, it has an amplitude, it has a decay rate, it has a phase. If I, if I can add that to the, to the same FID, yeah, I can, in other words, I'm essentially spiking that FID with a model. Right? If I add that, I don't have to, I am not limited to adding one to one. I'm lim I can add one to, na one to 100, one to 200. So I can increase my signal noise of that fed. 100 plus 100 is the original one that I had, plus n 
my multiplication factor of that frequency of that equation and add it to that. I just whoppingly increase my signal noise n times, yeah. I can do that because it is just an equation I do by, and I say add, I just say multiply that by 100 and then add. So, so the key point is I must have an equation to represent that signal. If I can have an equation to represent that signal, I can do the exactly that. This is exactly what you can do too. So let us let's see if I can do that. That is a reaction in a THF. Uh, so there is, a, there is a reactant signal, this is THF. That is an intermediate signal, some intermediate compound that is forming. I have no idea what it is. I am just interested in some, some data. That is a product. Right? As the time, as your kinetic time changes, the, pr the reactant goes away, intermediate forms and the, and the product comes, comes up. So if you look at it from time domain, this is a time domain analysis, your, your reactant goes down, your intermediate goes up and down and your product comes up. But where is the most interesting part from a kinetics point of view? most interesting important part of your kinetic study. It is in these transition positions. That is where your kinetic properties are buried in. That is how your calculations are going to be. It is useless really at this point. But this is where my uncertainty is lower because my signal noise there is very high. So my uncertainty from transition to transient to transient is lower there whereas here is where I have the worst worst thing, where the most important part of my kinetics, point of my kinetics is where I have the worst problem because my, my signal is just growing or my signal is just decaying out. How do I improve that? It is very simple to do because if I just look at this fit and then say, okay, the trace number 3, I do not take trace number 1 because maybe the reaction has not started, they have not fired it up. But I take the trace number 3 and then say model that peak and then I take trace number 25 and then say model that peak. I take this 111 and then say model that peak. So now I have those three models of a reactant, the intermediate and the product as equations. Those models are synthetic models, meaning I just fit it to an equation. I have an exponential decay function. I can simply add it to all the traces and then say go do the same analysis. I can just add five times that signal, look at that data, the same data. All I did was just instead of analyzing from trace number 1 to trace number 111, I simply said analyze 3, 25 and 111, take those models and add them all to, to everybody and then redo the analysis for the whole, whole thing. I just increased my signal noise by a factor of 5. So my uncertainty is much less. So my, my shapes of my kinetic curves are much nicer. I can probably trust that much better than something that's going jagged edge. Just to show you that it is really the real, ra real data, I just didn't represent if a function. That's the craft result. It's five times more signal than what it was. That's the craft result. I, but if I am want to be very nice to look at, I want to look at it properly. I don't like what you are showing. I don't know whether you are cheating me or not. Because I just added this model. I can subtract the same model from the final, final fit. If I subtract that, that's a craft result. Visual result. Yeah? So it is exactly the same as your input FT result. You get the craft result. But this is, your, this is the interesting thing. All of a sudden, by doing nothing, no addition of data, no collection of data, I just increase my signal noise because I have an example fed, example model, I can, I can do that. Here is another thing that you could do. What if I have, we had examples here that we heard about I have a very tiny material, I want, I want a very small signal I want to quantify. How do I do that? In, I need to increase my signal to noise whether it's bench top or high resolution NMR, whatever. When your signal is very small, you just want to somehow increase the, increase the sig signal to noise better and better. What if it is that that peak is what is interesting? So this is the, this is a trace that at a vertical scale plotted in the normal fashion. That's the same data just plotted with a blown up vertical scale and the peak of interest is this shoulder. 
I want to improve my ability to quantify that signal better. Don't ask me to go back to the spectrometer. That's the only rule. I cannot go back to the spectrometer. How do I do that? Very simple. So this is just to show that that's actually a real signal. If I have a reference standard, many, many times in our lab we have a reference standard. I have a reference standard. So here is a reference standard material that is, that's what I am trying to quantify. If I know that, I simply say, okay, give me the model of the reference standard. I just want to generate that, convert that into an equation. That peak, I want it to be as an equation. Once I have that peak as an equation, I can add that model into that big trace on the top, to the FID on the top. I don't have to just add one to one or two to one. I can now do a titration. I can say add 0 0.8, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 1.1, 1.2. I can just keep adding titrate and not just take one value, take 11 values, plot a linear, plot a one to one linear plot, which has because I know exactly what I added. I look at the amplitude and then plot it. The intercept is the quantity that was originally there. It's a basic linear equation. And we can, you can do a digital equation, e digital f uh, titration, and there is a peak which says that it is 0 with a standard deviation from the linearity that I expected because I supplied, I asked it to do multiple craft, craft analysis using the same model, using the only fit that I had in my hand. Let me show you how, how, how small that is. This, is. this particular trace is done 1x one, one vertical scale. That is 10,000x. And that's the peak we are looking for without going back to the spectrometer, without recollecting data. All I had was, I had a standard. This is very, very common in almost all laboratory practices. You, when, you are, when you don't know anything and you want to quantify something, you have a guess of what it is. Or you are looking for an API, or you are looking for an impurity. This is a very common scenario. And you have an opportunity to do that. You can do that because you are doing it in time domain, because you convert that into an equation, and you can equation that is a noiseless FID. Suddenly, you have an opportunity to change your signal to noise, something very basic. I did not do anything magic other than just convert that FID into an equation. That's it. It gives me opportunities to do things that I never thought I can do. Resolution is, is the, the second property that we are talking about, sensitivity resolution. You see, yet another confusion. Everybody talks about resolution in their own terms. This is, this is a definition galore in literature. I'm not going to define one or the other. I'm just, just pointing out there is a definition, multiple definition of what we mean by resolution. I can see include more, more terms to that resolution, the term resolution. You know, I can say resolution is ability to rip off your FID, your spectrum into multiple components. That's a resolution. Or something like this on, on this side, right? That's a resolution. Here is an example. Completely different definition of resolution. This is an antibody spectrum. And that is a spectrum from the same FED not going back to the spectrometer, not a CPMG experiment. From the same Fed, just show me only those models that has line width somewhere between 30 hertz and 6 hertz. Why did I pick 6 hertz and 30 hertz? I don't know. I just said, okay, let's pick two, two model widths and then filter only those, those models out. And that's a spectrum. I resolved a medium size. If you, if you extend this argument, I resolve a medium size molecule or medium size, medium line width models out of this mass. Just because I am able to do a time domain analysis, meaning just because I am able to convert my FID into e a set of equations. And I can filter that. I can also filter 
peaks that are very narrow, sharp peaks, impurity in small molecules in that same mixture. Glob. I just use the antibody spectrum as an example. It can be anything. It can be polymers. It can be monomers in your polymer. It can be a, 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 a monom polymeric material you are synthesizing from a glucose. I don't know. This is the kind of stuff that you could do just because I converted the FID into a set of equations. At the moment I have a set of equations, it's a spreadsheet. I can do all kinds of things that a spreadsheet sorting mechanism do, I can do it with us. It's a spreadsheet, Excel spreadsheet, nothing more. Resolution becomes an interesting concept here. This is a resolution too. I have a doublet. This is true example. This is a quercetin data that I got from Guido Pauli's lab. It's a, it's a real data. I said I have a, it's a two hertz line with two hertz coupling constant resolution, right? So these are the three doublets that we were analyzing. I could ask them to go back and then generate me data that is broad and broad, broad data. So all I did was I just took that fit and they just added a line with it. I did multiply by some exponential function, right? So these are, this is equivalent to saying that that's a spectrum of quercetin with a line width of 5 hertz because you didn't shim, right? And, and can, I un can I get 2 hertz line without a 2 hertz resolution out of that? Because the, my coupling constant is 2 hertz. The answer is, of course, yes. It doesn't matter which FID I take. The FID that has a 5 hertz decay, very fast decay, or the FID that had a very slow decay. I can take that, and the, here are the within certain limits, of course. These are all the coupling, same coupling constants. And I, that's, your, that's your in a, in a, in a sp spectral display. So the first one, I'm going to go back again. The first one is a, it's as it was, and now it's a two hertz, uh, a line with added, four hertz line with added, five hertz line with added. So the blue line is basic FT. And the two top lines are what it said. Uh, that I can fit that into two models of five hertz each. They are separated by two hertz. They are separated by less than the nine bordering function that I applied. And it says, that, that's the best way I can fit. And this is happens in every, it doesn't matter. So frequency separation permitting is a, two, is a term that I put in before in one of the definition of signal to noise. You just use some only front end of the FID. Signal to noise per, uh, separation permitting, you can do that. Here, where is the separation permitting? The, the decay of the FID is five, five hertz decay. And I have two hertz separation. You can separate that. Because it is a modeling tool. It's not a, just a mathematical Fourier transform. It's a modeling tool. It says, this is the best I can model. And it gives me, there is no precondition I apply. I don't say, I want you to separate two hertz separation. I simply say, just rip it apart and give me all the, num the equations that will fit this FID the best. And it comes back and then say, that's, what, that's how I... I can, I can analyze. So this is very common in all 2Ds that we collect, meaning all of our interferograms are truncated. We collect for many, many times 64 increments in carbon dimension. Think about your acquisition time in that dimension for 64 points. It's in less than about 2 milliseconds at the most you collect. And then you want, to, you want to do the separation, sure you can do that too. So this is a truncated FID. If I have this, so this is your input FID, output, it, output meaning craft output, that's a residual. If you do Fourier transform, you get something like that. But the interesting thing is, this guy is not just a simulation. It's not an output of that analysis. It is a simulation of the output because it is simulation of that equation. Nothing tells me to stop at this point in the simulation. I can essentially simulate it as long as I want. Right? If I now Fourier transform, look at the sharp line there. Right? You can exploit that even better. This is a 2D analysis of something would sap 309 increment on a 700 megahertz spectrometer. 
it's a wood sap extract 700 megahertz spectrometer 309 increment the orange line that you see is a conventional Fourier transform result it's a mess that's what is expected to be it's just a wood sap extracted right and the blue ones that we are you're seeing here are craft analysis simulated to present it to you it's a table represented as an e as as a, as a 2D. The bottom trace is actually a depth quality 1D spectrum, carbon, from the 309 increment data. That is, it's not a projection, it is a sum. Compare that to the, the orange line there. That is a projection of the 2D, the way you, you have been, we have been doing so many years. It is 2D pr transform project. Let's blow the vertical scale up. That's a 2D transform project. The orange line behind is a 2D transform projection. The blue line in the front is actually a full-fledged simulation of the table. Nothing is new added, nothing was taken out. I just said, here is a table, sum them all up and give me a fit. And the resolution is fantastic. Here is something else you can do because it's a spreadsheet, right? Here is what I'm doing. I simply said, take that projected or summed depth result, take only peaks that are less than 25 hertz wide, because it's a wood sap, remember? It has a lot broad resonances as well. Take only the narrow ones, and I want you to show me only peaks that are f less than 5% of the tall, that's the biggest peak there. In other words, I want to look at this impurity. I want to look at this hash in there. I don't care about the rest. All you're doing is you're taking the spreadsheet and then say, anything below this, and anything in between that. Take a table, generate a sub-table, simulate. And that's what that is doing. So this is your full spectrum. That's my filtered spectrum. All of a sudden, I am doing a filtered experiments with no spectrometer. This is a filtered experiment that we can't even think about. It's a filtered experiment of peaks that are narrower than certain window that you can supply any, num any times, any number of times and only peaks that are smaller than certain value and you can really supply any times any number of times to that table it's computational world no time expense of your spectrometer it's a cpu time period and you can i have a lot more data on, th on this one you can look at this it's like a multi-dimensional rubik's cube you look at it in whichever way you want, you rip it apart and look at it in a, in a different way you want. Now you have, a, you have an intense amount of information, intense amount of information from 309 increment HSQC on a wood sap on a 700 megahertz spectrometer. One data collection. This is what you can do. I haven't done anything differently other than just looked at the basics and then say, I. One, the moment I get it into tabular domain, I'm just applying the same basic principles. Here is an HSQC of a sugar, anomeric region. Classic, 164 uh, increments, 16 scans per increment. It's actually a quantitative HSQC, and these are your acquisition time, and the red lines are the standard Fourier transform result and the blue ones are the craft results and here are here are separations that you can see you, here is three separations you can see 64 increments and those separations in the carbon dimensions are three hertz from one another three hertz those carbons are separated and the interesting thing is some of these are separated in three hertz not only in carbon but also in proton they are even on a 2D, they are cross peaks that are that close to each other. I'm going to pause that one and come back after a few minutes. How, how, how am I doing in time? Okay. Okay. I am going to hold that door. <laughs> one more. Last one. Line shape. 
basic line shape. Yeah, we talk about that's the fun basics. That's the basic. Here is two spectra of the same sample. Look at the line shape at look, look at the line width at half height. Exactly the same. Maybe you tenth one hundredth of a hertz off from each other. But whereas the line width at 0.55, which is measured on this, I think on this line, it's measured on, this is a measured number. This is 20 hertz line width, that's 10 hertz line width. Under any practical NMR guy's point of view, the blue spectrum is the best spectrum. No questions about it, out of the two, right? No questions. Nobody will question this. You can actually put it on, put one on top of the other, and you can see this. Obviously, you can see that the blue is narrower, blue is taller. In, in, the, in the previous slide that I showed you, they are plotted in the same vertical scaling factor, and, and blah, 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 right? So, what about time domain analysis? What does it do? It analyzes either one exactly the same. So, this is your FT result. That's the sum of all the models, that's a residual. Both of them are ripped apart properly, completely, right? No questions about it. I, I, I have actually slide to blow the vertical scale. You trust me that they are all very well done. The, the, I, I'm putting this, this statement here. It's important to the goal is not to define a resonance, a resonance with a single best model. It's not like fit that singlet to a model. I simply say, fit this signal to as many models that you need to completely define. That's a rule in this, in this game, right? It's not about, I don't precondition that and then say, that's a singlet, these guys are doublets. No nothing. I have no idea what this fit is. Take as many exponential decay function as you want to fit that completely. That's the deal. That's the deal, right? Here is a ripper rip part of one of the fits. This looks like every resonance is one model. That's a ripper part of the other fit. All it did was it said, "Yeah, it's not Lorentzian. It's not a good. I have I have to use more models in order to define each one of them." I have to use more models to define each one of them. The, the complex sum of all these models gives you the f input FID that you, fit the input FID that you supplied, period. Yeah? So that's why your residual is, is zero in either, either case. So both of them got ripped apart properly, defined properly. We know one is a good fit, another one is a bad fit. The blue fit is a good fit. Red one is a bad one, except it's the opposite. It is a red one that we thought is a bad FID that ripped apart properly. The blue one, which we thought is a good FID, ripped apart is multiple. It needed more models to define that. Why? The one thing that I did not tell you is Lorentzian equation. Fundamental 0.55 is approximately 13 and a half times width at the half height. Your half height is 1.38 hertz multiplied by 13.5. If you do that, it will become to around 18 point something. In other words, the blue spectrum, sorry, the red spectrum, actually the peaks are closer to the Lorentzian. So that is better shamed. If you believe NMR signals are Lorentzian or NMR signals are exponential decay function, that's the, your end point of line shape should be. Not the best one that gave me a top high, highest peak. That's simply because we all lived in the frequency domain area. The moment you say my NMR is exponential decay function or Lorentzian, that's what you should be shimming for. That's what you should be shaming for. It's not. So I'm, I'm going to skip this slide and then ask the fundamental question. So what? <laughs> so what? 
So what's the big deal? He just gave us a BS about Laurentian, non-Laurentian, your craft ripped it apart anyway, perfectly fine. So what's it? The problem is this. Signal analysis facts of life. All data analysis involves comparison of a to a model of a data. There's no substitute for good signal to noise. Signal to noise that I just defined on the very front of this lecture about signal to noise is different in time domain versus signal to noise in frequency domain. Now it all congeals together. Yeah, these are all important. So, if I take a something like this, a singlet, and then I say rip it apart, if the goal is, I put this mantra about goal is not to define the resonance with a single best model, but to define as completely as you can with as many models as is needed. Yeah, if you do that. But what caveat is, given adequate signal to noise. Meaning, if this minor model that it needs to correct for the non laurentian line shape of your F signal is very low in signal to noise, it's going to say, ah, I have a too much uncertainty there. So signal to noise is important, but line shape is as, uh, important as well. Both are important. So that we can, so, so this, is, this is my mantra in a way. Attempt or limitation to fit a non laurentian singular. We are all doing this in the world now. Any modeling tool that we see is, is that Laurentian? No, but I'm going to fit this. Is it Gaussian? No, I don't know. I'm going to fit it to Gaussian windows. But the fundamental, this is not, this is not about NMR. The fundamental truth, this is the moment, is anything that you try to fit to an equation should be a linear combination of that equation. It can be a financial analysis, analysis in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. I don't care. If you are trying weather <laughs> prediction, I don't care. If you are trying to fit it to a model, set of models, that has to fit into that set of model. If not, you are compromising. I'm sorry. You are not getting the final, the real result. You are compromising because you don't know. But now we know. We know NMR is an exponential decay function. NMR is a La Laurentian line shape. It's a first order kinetics. NMR signals decay is first order. Other than some spin, spin, spin interactions. I won't go into that. So, Actually, I did those things by fiddle or it not to fiddle, that's, not, that's all about. I asked a question, so what? You can actually take a non Laurentian signal and convert it to Laurentian using the tool called fiddle but that was published by Gareth Morris. That's a, that's a slide I just skipped because I am running out of time. Uh, so, so what? Here is an example. This is three carbon-13 spectrum of sugars, the same sample same, uh, no, same uh, uh, master sample in three aliquots, and they ran three spectra. Yeah? So all three should give you the same data. Obviously, from an analytical spectroscopy point of view, there's going to be measurement from all three, and then finding out how what is the variation is an important criteria. Reproducibility, standard deviation, standard Statistical analysis is important. There are peaks that are here that are about 3 hertz away. This is the sugar that I, I alluded to before. P but it is poor signal to noise. It's a quantitative carbon spectrum. Poor signal to noise. Because their delay times are 200 seconds. D1 is 200 seconds. So they, they don't have enough, enough sample to run that way. That's a poor signal to noise in the conventional fashion. So, you ma I can immediately say, aha, time domain, focus on the front end of the FID. Yeah? I can do that because the peaks are separated. There are peaks that are separated by 3 to 4 hertz. So, I'm limited because I said good signal to noise in the front end of the FID, frequency separation permitting. Here, frequency separation is not permitting. That's 2 or 3 hertz from each other. So I have to use a certain minimum amount of FID. I can't just use first 10 points. If it's a singular, 
you don't even need more than a point yeah if you are quantitating this the first first point is your signal so i am limited to the to the tricks that i had in my mind yeah the last one is highly likely they are on non orientation i'm going to bet my nickel on this because we all shim it very well that's why they are non orientation we shim it to 0.6 over 6 over 12 guess what 0.6 to 6 over 6 12 is not lorentzian go go just to go do your calculation they are non lorentzian but that's a spec so i shimmed it to my spec yeah so highly likely these guys are not uh, these guys are not, not they are all non lorentzian line shape so how do i pro how do i solve this this is when the fiddle comes into picture the fiddle or taking your fed and the converting back into a not lorentzian type of line shape is very useful because if i don't fiddle the red bars are my standard errors standard deviations from the b- among the three i have only three points i agree but it's just three points red blue is if i just do a fiddle and then do it so by converting them into a l- lorentzian line shape i could still use the same rules that i have i can do better right this is the truth this is actually the plot of an expected concentration of these sugars against the concentration of the sugars from carbon spectrum plotted against each other right that's a 99 r squared value with those kind of signal to noise 10 to 1 to 45 to 1 is a ratio is a range of of the signals there now get back to the hsqc why do i not do hsqc why do i run carbon the, i can plot the hsqc result again carbon that's again 0.98 correlation coefficient so because i already the, the previous slide i had shown you expected concentration to carbon is 99 carbon to hsqc is 0.98 you can say expected concentration of hsqc to is is 9 this is still a quantitative hsqc long relaxation for proton you have to relax and you have all these pulses that you need to properly apply you need to have these trick pulses some nice shapes that uh, comes out of the in literature this is a qhs qhs qc my question is fundamentally i just said few minutes ago a lot of people we have a known compound in our hand we, we know many 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 times i'm not saying all the time many times you when you are doing a quantitative run you have a pure compound you have a, you have access to a pure or relatively pure compound that you are trying to quantify in a mixture many many times that that's a, in those scenarios why do you need to do quantitative hsq say to me it's waste of time because we all trust our nmr if i run scan number 1 and scan number 2 within the same 2d i am supposed to get exactly the same thing that's why i am able to time average properly we all believe in that we do this all the time so if i run an hsqc of a compound first and immediately follow hsqc of a mixture you can probably assume the same argument assume they are all the same they will behave the same the same compound we run run number 1 run number 2 will behave the same if you run the same same data same way if you can process the same way in tabular domain you can do that so here is an api this is a standard q on hsqc this is nothing to do with quantitative hsqc it's just a bloody crisis hsqc nothing else hsqc spectrum run standard api i call it api is a mixture here is a table here is a table that came out of the craft uh, results i can compare i can get uh, quantitative with a plot of uh, concentration if, if i know this is 20 millimolar i know that is 5 millimolar we do this all the time in proton spectrum all the time we have this kinomics so- no somebody called kinomics software they have a bunch of data that we collected at specific concentrations you compare that against some in a metabolomics mixture and then say my concentration of acetate is 2.32 millimolar because i am comparing against a, a somebody's database which has a 10 millimolar acetate spectrum we do this all the time i'm just saying why can't we do this in in 2d what's the difference 
What's the difference? You could do that in 2D. So you can compare that. You can generate your API spectrum, generate your API quantization. You can generate your impurity spectrum. It's just a subtraction. All tabular. Nothing to do with a spectrum. Spectrum is visualization. Spectrum is nothing but visualization. I can do this even more fancier. What if I do, oh my god, I did my API with normal HSQC uniformly sample. I have this mixture. I'm running 50% non-uniformly sample. How can I compare? Of course you can compare. What does that got to do with uh, uniformly sample? How do you sample your fit? Your amplitude is in point number one. Amplitude is magnetization at time zero. That's quantitative NMR. So how you collected non-uniform sample, uniformly sample, is all how to separate that, not what it is. So here is an example of 5 millimolar, 20 mill concentration difference, number of increments different, num non-uniform sampling, density difference, uh, number of scans per increment difference. You can plot against the reference any which way you want. They are all greater than 0.99 R squared. You know what? It simply tells me the spectrometer works perfectly fine. That's it. I didn't do anything. I just trusted the spectrometer. So it's, it's a spectrometer works. Reproduces what I say it should reproduce. So last slide, I'm done. We all know AS ASAP HMQC. Yeah? Uh, very nice. In nice very very clever way to speed up your 2D spectrum. I just said you don't have to do a qualitative HSQC if you want to do a qualitative NMR. If you are doing a relative, relative qualitative NMR, you don't have to do it. I just said that. And I showed you a whole bunch of results. Let's take an ASAP HMQC. Invariably, you can run it in one minute. Because it, these things are. Every increment, you just do that. Right? So that means it's one minute acquisition, maybe a minute of processing, because you are not doing the conventional Fourier transform, you're doing something silly called craft or something else. So one minute process, every two minutes. Every two minutes, it spits out a table. What table does it spits out? It spits out a table of carbon chemical shift and an amplitude. That's carbon chemical shift. It has two carbons that are separated by 0.2 hertz, 0.2 ppm. If I want to, one is a product, another one is a reactant, I can follow that. That's a two separate line in my table. One minute acquisition, one minute process. Why can't I do time course monitoring of C13 in MR and follow that amplitude? It's a sick. I haven't give, asked you for anything other than what I just said. Given all that what I said before, that till the previous slide, why can't you do that? C13, natural abundance C13 quantitative reaction monitoring. One second, one minute time course interval. I see no reason why you cannot do that. The only reason I see you cannot do that is you just don't want to do that because it's something different than what I am used to. I am just saying it's not. You can do this on bench top, for example. Here is a bench top spectrum. 128 increment bench top spectrum, 64 increment bench top spectrum. Craft result is exactly the same. In craft, the spectrum is visualization, nothing more. It's exactly the same. I can plot the amplitude of this against amplitude of that. I get a 0.95 correlation coefficient. I'm sorry. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. On a bench top, 64 increment. 64 increment, I believe, probably 8 scans. For a bench top, that's good. Why can't I do reaction monitoring bench top HSQC? And if, if many bench top these days coming up, come up with gradients, why can't I do an ASAP HMQC on a bench top reaction monitor in a factory at one minute kinetic interval. Why can't I? We have to ask that question. 
because in order to move forward, we got to let go. With that, I stop. Oh, I still have to. I still, I still hold the mic, right? <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Thinking, yes. Me too. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, oh, any questions now? Yeah, yeah. That's fine. Any questions now? That's fine. Yeah, Krish. Is Krish against Krish? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Krish, for the excellent talk. So in your antibody spectrum, you showed us a great example, and you're able to filter peaks based on a given line width. Yeah. So what would you define number of model necessary to reproduce okay, the actual spectrum of that antibody? Um, the, one, of the, one of the fundamental rules that we supply in, when we do craft is we don't, sub, we don't say how many models it needs. We simply say, Keep digging, digging in until the residual is random. So there's no rule. How many models to fit that is no rule. We simply, it's an iterative process. Keep, so imagine, imagine the Bayesian works this way. The first question to Bayesian is iteration one, given no precondition, is there a probability of finding a sinusoid? It says, yes, there is a good probability, then find me the best sinusoid that will fit. So now I have a potential model that will fit that, but there may be more, right? So then the second iteration, given this, there is a potential model there, what is the probability of finding another model? No other condition. What is the probability? That means, is there a ran is the number of, is the leftover point completely random or is there something sinusoidal sitting there. And then it says, yes, there is. Then what we say is, take both the models, iterate their amplitude frequency to best fit. And now you have two models that best fit the given FID. And then we say, given these two models, take that out first. Is there another model that's potentially possible? Then Bayesian will say, yes or no. And then you iterate. So you keep iterating until Bayesian comes back and say, no, the leftover, after given the n number of models, that n is not determined by the user, but by the Bayesian itself. After having n number of models, is there another model, potential probability of if a model, the Bayesian will say, the leftover randomness exceeds a probability of finding a sinusoid. That's when it stops. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why in the mantras, one of the first one is there is no alternative to true signal noise. It decrease your noise, there is a value to that. No question about that. There is a value to that. In fact, there are other ways we can increase, increase the probability of finding. Um, is I think about three or four years ago, I talked about this. Oh. Am I okay? Okay, three or four years ago I talked about this. It's actually not collect the data longer or no more number of scans, but actually oversample. If you oversample your data, in other words, you keep your dwell time four times, uh, one fourth, or spectral width, blow your spectral width out. From a frequency domain point of view, it's useless. From time domain point of view, it's very, very valuable. Because you take the same sinusoid, now I have, you, you have you defined it with more number of points. So the probability of finding the smaller and smaller, smaller models is higher because you have more number of points where the signal to noise is maximum, right? Ma high, right? So oversampling a FID, which I didn't bring it up today because I didn't think it was basic <laughs> principle, but oversampling is incredibly useful. We use, we do this all the time in craft oversampling. In fact, we have actually that that paper that I published actually have a trick to oversample a, a normally acquired data. You can do a Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform type of way. You can oversample. But oversampling certainly improves your dynamic range. I, I want to call it a dynamic range here, right? Because Bayesian is going to 
fit based upon the most probable model, invariably the most abundant model, or the most least slow decaying model. Yeah? Those are the two criteria. Probably will fit that condition. So it's going to go from there to the least amplitude. Oh, sorry. I keep, ah. OK. So it's, it's going to go from the most abundant to least abundant and long lasting to fast decay, right? That, in that combination, right? So having a high signal to noise certainly helps, but signal to noise doesn't mean two seconds, if you can live with half a second, collect more data. It doesn't cost you anything, right? Because, because we oversample all. Every spectrometer oversamples. I can bet you all spectrometers oversample data when they collect. All spectrometers, including bench top. You know what we do? We just immediately shoot ourselves in our foot. We say, I'm interested only in 16 ppm. Don't bother to show me the rest. Downsample it right there. Waste our time downsampling it. That oversample fit has so much information that we just shot ourselves in our foot. We do this all the time. Un unfortunate, but we do. Except I think Magritte doesn't. Magritte keep it 100 ppm, proton spectrum. Very clever. Very clever. Thank you. So thank you, Krish. And um, I think we'll move on. I'll give the uh, mic to John for some last words. So let the record show I am not holding. John is holding the rest of them from the reception. <laughs> yeah, the bar is open, and uh, I'll not take more than you know, 45, 50 minutes. <laughs> Kidding. Um, thank you very much to all of our speakers. Absolutely fantastic talks. Um, worked out great today. Is work out good for you guys? Worth your while, I hope. And uh, got ENC starting tomorrow, of course, and uh, MR Resources Q1 and Ivan will uh, be right here in uh, Oak Shelter. Uh, join us. We'll be here Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but uh, in particular, join us all three nights, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if you can, for our uh, now, dare I say, famous Ivan hours that we're uh, doing. Uh, fun, quasi-NMR-related talks, uh, that is, talks given by NMR experts, but not necessarily about NMR. We've got uh, one night on uh, Ron Crouch is going to up update us on the uh, world of astronomy. Uh, another night, uh, uh, you old-timers are going to especially like this. Uh, uh, look back at the old uh, Texas A&M uh, University NMR newsletter, and uh, the uh, one of the other talks, uh, I don't remember which night is which, but uh, will be uh, uh, a look into the world of fine art via NMR, so that uh, should be pretty cool. But uh, once again, thank you every, uh, everyone for uh, joining us today. Dave, uh, any final words? I just, my own final words are thanks for being here, and I enjoyed it, and let's head for the bar. <laughs>